What I did on my vacation. Home room 302, Mr. Boardman. What I did on my vacation by Lily Madwip. If I had to pick one word to describe the summer, it would be crazy. Three things that stood out about my summer vacation are I adopted a new pet turtle, the fireworks at the common, and my family reunion. Describe your three things in detail. Well, first, I got a new pet turtle. He's an Eastern box turtle. I named him Donatello. My mom helped me pick out a tank for him and we filled it with water and put a big rock for him to sun himself on. I made Donatello a little mask to wear out of a purple ribbon because I'm training him to be a ninja turtle. <laughs> and my dad made me take it off because he said turtles don't wear masks and he can't see. I am training Donatello to fight crime. I made him a bow staff out of a twig. Right now he can't pick it up because he's got no thumbs. Sometimes he chews on his staff. He might be able to use it with his mouth, but I think he's too young. Turtles can live from 50 to 100 years, but ninja turtles have lower life expectancy because of the dangers of crime fighting. Donatello does not like pizza like other ninja turtles. He eats little grubs and spinach. My mom says he eats better than I do. I eat pizza though, so I think I'm a better ninja turtle than Donatello is. I look forward to him growing up with me and adopting some more turtles and forming a team of crime-fighting turtles. Second, for the 4th of July, they set up a fireworks show down at the Common. That's a park in the center of town. Lots of people came. My mom, my brother Roger, and me all went and sat at the top of Garrison Hill. My dad couldn't sit with us because he plays keyboard in a band with some other people. They were keeping everybody entertained until the fireworks started. Roger saw a couple of his friends and went and sat with them, so it was just me and my mom. I would sit with my friends too, but my best friend Rachel isn't friends with me anymore. My only friend is Pasher. We sat around for hours until it got dark. We wouldn't have gone so early, but my mom wanted to be supportive for my dad and his band. It's not his band really, but he plays in it, so I call it his because I don't think they have a name. They're just the band. He always says he's going to be busy because the band has to practice. At about 8 o'clock, I told my mom I was feeling sick to my stomach. She said we should wait and see because we had all driven there together. She didn't want to drive me home and then have to come back and get Dad and Roger. And I said we should just get them both and all go. Mom refused to interrupt the band, so while she was talking to another friend, I snuck away and went to the bandstand. Dad was in the back on his keyboard. I waited until they took a break between songs and then tugged on his pants and told him I needed help finding mom because she had wandered off. He hadn't seen where we sat down, so I showed him a different part of the hill and we walked around looking for mom who was on the other side. <laughs> but thankfully, my dad went with me because there was an accident with the fireworks display. Someone working the show caught a spark in the eye and knocked over one of the other launchers. The fireworks got set off and went toward the bandstand where everybody cleared out and there was a bunch of screaming and shouting. The whole bandstand burned down and Dad's keyboard got destroyed. Mom was in a panic when we finally found her, but she was relieved to see me and Dad were alright. Roger came back later and said it was the greatest fireworks he'd ever seen. Dad was upset because he lost his keyboard. But the craziest thing I had happen this summer was at my family reunion. Every year, my dad's brother, Uncle George, invites us to join them for a week at his log cabin. The camp is by a lake. Uncle George and Aunt Harriet have a daughter, Susie, who's almost the same age as Roger. Susie and Roger usually do stuff together and leave me to draw or catch tadpoles. I also go down to the beach and dig for Jawas and Yodas. See, I used to have some Star Wars toys, but I made them sand huts on the beach and dug deep tunnels for them to hide in. And then I got called in for lunch. We had hot dogs. When I came back out, the tunnels and huts were washed flat by the waves. I never found any of my toys, but I know they're down there somewhere, so every year I dig for them. The camp has an ATV, which is like an adult-sized big wheel. Roger and Susie ride around on it all the time. Mom goes berry picking with Aunt Harriet. Dad and Uncle George drink and talk about stuff, like what life was like back when they were kids. 
I'm not allowed to sit and listen, so they just make me go draw or dig Jawa holes. This year, Uncle George borrowed a motorboat from someone down the shore and was letting Roger and Susie try out water skiing. That's like skiing skiing, except there's no snow and you wear a bathing suit instead of snow pants. I was building sandcastles on the shore and digging for Jawas and Yodas, but the waves the boat made kept melting my castles and filling my Jawa holes. <sighs> After a half hour, I realized something bad was going to happen, so I called for them to stop, but they kept going. I made up reasons to get Uncle George to come ashore, but they couldn't hear me over the sound of the motorboat. I remember Roger was sitting in an inner tube, waiting for his turn on the skis. Susie was on the skis, trying to stay upright, but her foot must have slipped or something and she bailed out. Uncle George turned the boat around and went to pick her up, but she had swam toward the boat, so instead of getting alongside her, he ran over her with the boat. There was like this loud thump and then a sound like a garbage disposal, and then there was a lot of yelling and screaming. Uncle George started yelling and Roger was screaming. Susie wasn't yelling or screaming, she was just floating there in the water, sort of getting pulled behind the boat a bit. Dad came running down from the camp. When he saw what happened, he ran back up and called for help on the phone. He dragged me along with him so I wouldn't see, but I already saw. Dad made me run to go find Mom and Aunt Harriet, who were supposed to be berry picking, but they were actually sitting in the berry bushes smoking. Aunt Harriet flipped out when she heard what happened, and so did Mom, but not quite as bad. An ambulance went by while we were running back to the camp. Aunt Harriet and Uncle George went with the ambulance and Susie to the hospital, but everybody knew she wasn't going to make it. Mom and Dad insisted on us gathering our stuff and getting over to the hospital to be with them. I had to pick up my stuff on the beach so it wouldn't wash away, and I saw the lake foam was kind of pink and one of Susie's fingers washed up on my sandcastle lump. I didn't touch it, but I told dad and he put it in an ice cooler to take with us. So my cousin Susie died on our family reunion. We went to her funeral. Everyone cried, even Roger. Susie got cremated, which means they burned her up into ashes rather than bury her. I guess it saves space. Uncle George and Aunt Harriet took the ashes back to the camp and they sprinkled them on the stump that Susie and Roger always used to like to play around when they were little. It was raining, so even the sky was crying. I wanted to say that God must be crying for Susie, but Uncle George is an atheist, which means he doesn't believe in stuff like God, so I didn't say anything. What are you looking forward to this school year? This school year... I hope to make some new friends. Pasher says friends are important. For show and tell, I'm going to bring in my turtle Donatello. He bites, so my mom says I have to make forms for people to sign if they want to try to touch him. She says I don't want to get sued. Also this year, I'm hoping to build my Ninja Turtle army. My Uncle George gave me a real valuable Pokemon card that belonged to Susie, and maybe I can sell it to buy a bigger tank and adopt three more turtles. I'm Lily Madwhip, and I'm being followed by a big black dog. Hey, do you know whose dog that is? I asked Jamal. We're sitting on the bus, and I'm looking out the window at the big black dog that's been following me since I left the house ten minutes ago. It's long and thin, with short fur and a pointy nose. Judging from how it looks, I bet it's hungry. I spotted it first parked on its butt in the tennis in its front yard staring at me, and I thought it was doing its doggy business, I'm not a fan of watching animals do their business, so I looked away. But as I rounded the corner onto Smiley Ave, I looked back and it was still there, just watching me walk away. What dog? Jamal asks. The big black dog. It's peeking out from behind the old dead tree by Mr. Lawrence's house. Lightning struck the tree four years ago and split it down the middle. Mr. Lawrence had the two halves propped up and tried to hold them together by nailing boards up it like stitches. I think he thought since the boards were made of wood and the tree was made of wood, it would kind of reabsorb the boards or something. It didn't. Half the tree was dead, and it's all rotten and dried up now. The other half is fine, though, so it looks like a weird tree with boards leading up to the branches, half of which have no leaves. Like a ladder to the lamest tree house. What big black dog? Jamal looks out the window with curiosity, but he seems to look everywhere but where the dog is. I point at the dog peeking out from behind the weird tree. 
the big black dog peeking out from behind Mr. Lawrence's weird tree. Jamal keeps looking in the wrong places. He pauses. Wait, who's Mr. Lawrence? I give up. All right, well, this has been fun, thanks. The bus drives off and the dog watches us go. I watch the dog watch us go. It's a watching party. Sixth grade has been hard to deal with. Particularly the no toys allowed rule, which means I have to leave Pasher at home every day. I can't even try to smuggle him to school in my backpack. I still see things before they happen from time to time, but without Pasher, I don't always know what's going on. I have to be on my guard all day until I get home. It's nerve-wracking. You seem tense, Simone tells me. Simone is one of my best friends. She's got orange hair, but people call it red or ginger. I don't know why they don't just call it orange. I guess it sounds too much like the color a clown's hair would be or something. We sit in the back of class during social studies because Mr. Hazen doesn't assign seating like the other teachers do. I like Mr. Hazen. He always wears a bow tie and most days it's red, but some days he likes to throw everybody for a loop and wear a black one. <laughs> Once he wore a green one and I swear Hayden Brokowski nearly had an aneurysm. I saw a dog at the bus stop. Do you not like dogs? Well, I don't think anybody else could see this one. Well, at least Jamal couldn't. Then again, maybe he was looking from the wrong angle. Of course, this all wouldn't bother me if it didn't mean something. I've learned to trust my instincts when they tell me something's not right. Simone covers her mouth in mock surprise. <gasps> maybe it was a ghost dog! You know, you joke, but you have no idea what I have to deal with sometimes. Actually, she does. I told Simone all about fixing things for the angels, my dad getting kidnapped by a magician with a grudge, meeting the angel of death, and all the awful stuff last year regarding Meredith and Felix and Officer Flowers. She listened to it all and never asked for any proof. She just took me at my word. But sometimes I think she thinks I imagine some of it, or maybe she thinks I'm a bit of a loon. There's no recess in sixth grade, but we have Jim outside on the soccer field. That's where I see the big black dog again. I'm holding Simone's feet as she tries to do a sit-up. How can you not do one full sit-up, Simone? I don't actually ask her. I just pretend that each halfway sit-up counts, and she thinks she's done ten. The big black dog walks out from around the side of the school where they keep the dumpsters. I wonder if it's a stray and happens to be wandering through town. Maybe this is a completely different dog. What are you saying, Lily? Of course it's not a completely different dog. Hey, I say to Simone as she flops back down onto the grass. There's that big black dog. She turns to look. The ghost dog? <laughs> yes, the ghost dog. Maybe I'll just call the dog Ghost from now on. It's certainly a good name for it. It kind of looks like Officer Flower's ghost, all black and charred. Only it's not charred, it's just furry. Simone sits up on her elbows and nods. Yeah, I see it. I feel a sense of relief. Really? No. Okay, wait. I hate it when she does this. Are you kidding that you see it or that you don't see it? I don't see it, Simone says. She looks at me apologetically. Sorry. <sighs> Crud. The rest of gym class, the dog and I have a staring contest. After exercises, we practice dribbling soccer balls and passing. Eventually, Mr. Betty, our gym teacher, blows the whistle to have us go in and change. I take one last glance over at the big black dog, and there's someone kneeling beside it, petting it gently. It seems happy to be petted. I can't really make out who the person is petting it, as they're all hunched over and wearing some sort of hoodie. My first thought goes to Officer Flowers once again, but I haven't seen her in almost a year, and I'd like to think she's moved on, not haunting me with some weird ghost dog. Today, we have art class with Mrs. Zimmerman. I love art class. Last month, I brought in one of my still lifes I did at home, and Mrs. Zimmerman said I have a good eye for details. Today, we're using pastels to make a zoology collage to hang in the hallway. I've been working on this herd of giraffes since last week. I want to put a crown on the king of giraffes, but that would be unprofessional, as my mom always says. Mrs. Zimmerman comes by to check our progress. She leans over and looks at Todd Gamble's drawings of piranhas and nods, but doesn't say anything. 
That's her way of politely avoiding a conversation with the principal and Todd's parents about why she made their son cry. I saw Todd's piranhas earlier, and they look like a bowl of Fruit Loops. <laughs> Very good giraffes, Lily, she says. She hovers over me so close I can smell her perfume. She wears a lot of perfume, but nobody says anything. Todd Gamble is laying on his drawing of piranhas, and I can't tell if he's trying to get in close for the real fine details of Mrs. Zimmerman's perfume knocking him flat out. Is that a panther in the background? Mrs. Zimmerman asks. What? I look at my drawing. I don't see a panther. I see one, two, three, four, five giraffes. Oh, I had drawn a six. Oh, there it is, laying on its back by the tree line. Wait, did someone change my drawing? No, I literally was just working on it and the sixth giraffe was drinking out of the pond. Why is it all covered in red pastel? Oh my god, my giraffe drawing has been murdered. Near the giraffe's corpse sits a big black... D oh, it's the dog. <laughs> of course it's the dog. The big black dog is in my drawing, I say without thinking. Mrs. Zimmerman leans back. That's a tad macabre, but very realistically rendered, Lily. Did I draw the dog without thinking? But the giraffe, how did it change? I run my thumb over the paper to confirm it's just a drawing. And I smudge the king of giraffe's neck, making it look all zigzaggy, crud. Mrs. Zimmerman makes a hmm sound and wanders off to the next table. <sighs> I lean in close and stare at the dog on my drawing. You better stop killing my giraffes, I whisper at it. To emphasize my point, I jab the dog drawing with the end of my orange pastel. It doesn't yelp or run away because it's just a drawing, and the idea that it might is of course utterly ridiculous. I take some green and try to cover the dog with it, but I can still see its dark shape underneath and now it truly looks like a ghost dog. After school, we pile into the bus home. There's a lot more kids on the bus home from middle school than there was from elementary school. If you don't get on early, you gotta hope you find a seat next to someone decent. The big kids from 8th grade claim the back every day and dispense wedgies or overturn your entire backpack if you try to move in on their territory. Jeffrey Baker learned that the hard way on our first day. I'd never seen anyone pick on Jeffrey Baker before, so it was really satisfying to watch him waddle back toward the front trying not to cry while at the same time trying not to let his underwear ride up any further. I like to sit by one of the front wheels. When the bus hits a bump in the road, kids by the wheels get launched the highest. It's kind of like jumping on a trampoline, only you're sitting on your butt the entire time. And there are a lot of bumps in the road around here. It's while I'm sitting there in the seat by the wheel looking out the window that I see an odd reflection in the building we're passing. The building side is made entirely of windows, and in them I see the bus I'm in. Only, there's faces of other people looking back. We're going by kind of fast, and the glass of the windows warps the reflection. But I can definitely see the faces. They all appear to be adults with sickly gray skin and sunken eyes, and they're all looking directly back at me like some sort of ghost tour bus visiting the land of the living. I glance around, but nobody else is even looking out the window who might also see this. They're all talking to each other or the kids in the seat behind them. Well, okay, there's one girl who's looking out her window, but she's on the other side of the bus, so that doesn't count. I look back out, but the building is passed and there's cars and a side street we're going by. Something inside me says, get off the bus. I've learned to listen when something inside me speaks. I excuse myself past Hannah Glass, who had sat next to me earlier with the clear face of disappointment that there wasn't another seat available. She gladly moves to let me out so I can creep up the aisle to the front of the bus. We're not supposed to stand up while the bus is in motion, but Ed, our driver, never pays attention to what's going on in the back unless people start getting too loud. Of course, even as I think that, I see him look up and stare at me just as I get to one of the half-empty seats right behind him. Sit down, Lily, he says sternly. I sit behind him and lean around the chair. Ed, I need to get off the bus. You shouldn't be calling me Ed, Lily. Sit back. 
Mr. Ed, I need to get off the bus, please. Ed narrows his eyes at me. I like to think he knows me well enough to know when I'm serious, because that's all the time. I can see he's going through the typical adult list of questions, number one being, is she goofing? His expression hardens. Just sit back, Lily, he says. I can't let you off before you stop. You'll be home soon. Please! He gives me one more uncertain look. Sit back. <sighs> Fine. I think about going back to my seat by the wheel, but Hannah Glass has already convinced someone else to take my spot. We exchange looks for a moment when I glance back, and then she goes back to talking to her friend. That's fine. I'll just sit here up front and be the first one off the bus if it catches fire. We go several more minutes and a couple stops dropping kids off. The seat over by the door clears, so I move to it because the boy I was sharing a seat with smells like he works at a pet store and doesn't bathe. Maybe he does work at a pet store. Pasher would know. He'd know if the boy doesn't bathe, too, but that's not really something I care about. Just the smell. The bus drives past Holyoke Cemetery, where my brother Roger is buried. My parents got a plot for him by a willow tree. In fact, the only type of trees in the cemetery are willows. I wonder why they name it Holy Oaks instead of Holy Willows. I guess Holy Oaks rolls off the tongue better. <sighs> I hold my breath as you're supposed to do when driving past a cemetery so you don't inhale a person's ghost. Several other kids who know the rule do the same. Some of the loudmouth 8th graders in the back start dramatically huffing and laughing. Oh, oh, I just soaked up someone's spirit, someone shouts. A moment later, a big kid plops down in the seat next to me. He's super tall, like maybe 5 foot 10, with long, dirty blonde hair and the start of a mustache that looks like only every other hair grew out. There's a gold loop in one of his ears, and he's wearing torn jeans and a Pantera t-shirt. When he looks down at me, his eyes are weird, kind of glossed over like someone whited them out. Lily? He says. I wait, but that's it. Yes? I nod. That's me. I try to act calm, but inside I'm praying he doesn't twist my head off. I don't even know who he is. It's me. Roger. I'm nervous and confused, but, but I managed to squeak out. It's nice to meet you. My brother's name was Roger. He frowns. No ass face, I am Roger. Roger? I look closer at him, but beyond the dirty hair and the dirty clothes and the dirt, he looks nothing like Roger. And then it hits me. Oh my god, Roger, did you get sucked up by this kid? Ed glances at us in the mirror with the same expression my mom gets when I start talking to my doll Pasher in the middle of one of her parties she hosts for work. Roger shakes his head. Or rather, the kid with Roger in him shakes his head. Roger makes the kid... Roger... Hmm. Roger makes the kid he's in shake his head. Yeah, that's it. The kid's head. Not Roger's. Y you know what I'm saying. I've got a message for you. Are you in purgatory? I ask him. Pasher told me Roger was in purgatory. That's where you lie in your body until someone comes to get you. Not anymore, he says. I took a deal. Give you this message, and I can finally get out of that hole. The bus stops, and a couple of other big kids walk by us to get off. They look at me with the kid with Roger inside and with confused and disgusted faces. I can't blame them. This is all pretty confusing and maybe a little disgusting. Where are you going to? I ask. Heaven? He smirks at me. Or rather, he makes the kid smirk. No way, squirt. They wouldn't take me. Oh no, Roger. I whisper so no one else can hear. Honestly, I should have been doing that from the start. You're not going to H-E double hockey sticks, are you? For shit's sake, Lily, you can say hell. Are you going to hell? Roger, the kid... Look, I'm just gonna call the kid Roger and you'll know what I'm saying. Roger leans back and puts his hands behind his head like he's relaxing on a beach instead of sitting in a cramped bus. Or rather, sitting in the body of some greasy 13-year-old on a cramped bus. 
Nope, I'm joining a whole new pantheon. He looks over at me. You know what a pantheon is? A marathon of pants? Roger sighs and closes his eyes. <laughs> no dumbass, it's like a different religion. Oh. I look out the window at the people on the street for a moment before turning back to him. Are you Jewish now? No. Buddhist? He sits up and waves his hands. No, look, I don't have time for this. I've got to give you this message before my stop. Before this kid's stop. You know what I mean. Okay. He leans toward me and I can smell the flavor of the gum the kid must have been chewing on his breath. It was orange gum, in case you were wondering. I bet he swallowed it when he was huffing in Roger back at the cemetery. That's not good for you. Don't swallow gum, my mom always says. It sits in your stomach for years. Two things, squirt. One, she's coming. And two, be careful. We stare at each other for a moment. Yeah, that's really vague, I tell him. He grins. I know, right? And now I get to go join this new pantheon and be done with all this Christianity bullshit. Can you believe they were going to leave me rotting in the ground until the end of time? I love you, Roger. Yeah, okay. I look past Roger just in time to see Ed the bus driver make a face in the mirror like he just saw a two-headed raccoon scooting across. The smelly kid in the opposite seat is sitting there staring at me and Roger with his mouth hanging open in the same expression as Ed. Well... There goes what little reputation I had. Roger spasms suddenly and coughs twice right in my face, and then blinks several times. When he's done, his eyes aren't all whited out anymore, and he immediately reels back like I'm the one that just covered his face with spit instead of vice versa. Ugh, so gross. What the hell? He snarls. What are you doing back here? He looked around and seems to realize that it was he who is in the wrong place, not me. Aw, oh, shit, I must have been hyperventilating or something. And with that, he gets up and walks back to where he came from at the back of the bus, followed moments later by more cussing when he realizes the stop we just made was his. When the bus finally gets to my neighborhood, I hop off with the others from my street, and who should be waiting for me but that big black dog? It sits next to a row of hydrangea bushes and watches intensely as we cross the street in front of the bus, just staring coldly at me. I think about approaching it, but you're not supposed to approach strays, and as if it reads my mind, the dog curls its lip back in a quiet snarl. Fair enough, I say to it. I was just told to be careful, after all. Close enough for me to know it's there, but far enough back to not feel threatening. Every now and then, I look back, and it stops and sits down and cocks its head at me. I'm quickly becoming not a fan of dogs. Once I get home, I go straight to Pasher and ask him about the dog and Roger. He tells me that what Roger said is true, that there are other religious pantheons. He even spells out the word so I can look it up, which is good because I thought you spelled it with an I. He says that while he's aware of other pantheons, he's limited only to what humanity knows of them. In other words, gods and angels of different religions don't usually mingle. Pasher says Roger is outside of their jurisdiction now, which I also looked up, and that means they can't judge him? So does this mean that all the big books of mythology I read are true? I ask. Probably not, Pasher says. Not even everything you read in the Bible is true. It's like a 2,000-year game of telephone. Someone said something at the dawn of time, and it got told to someone else, and someone else and each time slightly changed from the last until you get here and things are vastly different. But you would know, wouldn't you? I ask. You were there when it first got said, right? No. Oh, I scratched my head. Okay, so do you know who she is? I have no idea, Hasher admits. I don't know what Pantheon Roger joined. Take his word for it, though. And be careful. I'll be careful, but I'm sure whatever happens, I'll see it coming. I force a smile and hug Pasher. He can't hug me back because he's just a doll. The rest of the afternoon and evening goes by as it usually does. My dad lets me play drums in the garage on Roger's old drum set for a while. 
Good thing Roger's been stuck in his coffin all this time, because if he had ever found out I was using his drums, that conversation on the bus would have been a lot different, I think. He probably would have really twisted my head off. Dad makes tuna noodle casserole for dinner, which is super gross. I eat it, but I don't like it, and I have to drink some milk with every bite just to keep from gagging. At bedtime, I feed Dr. Fishy and Dr. Brown. Dr. Fishy is a Siamese fighting fish. If you have more than one, they kill each other. So Dr. Brown is a little algae eater who floats along the bottom of the tank and sucks up stones and spits them out again. Siamese fighting fish don't attack algae eaters, so the two doctors make a great team. I've had them for four months now, and they're still alive, which is probably a record for me. After I read for a bit from the book I'm doing a report on, Mom and Dad come in and kiss me goodnight and then turn out the lights. I don't tell them that I talk to Roger. Once they're gone, Pasher, who lays next to me in bed, starts reciting the lyrics to old hymns you can't find in church anymore. His voice is always so calm and soothing, and it helps me go right to sleep. It's after midnight when I wake up sweaty and confused. I was having that dream again about the summer my cousin Susan got ran over by a boat and chopped up by the rudder. I never tell anyone about the dream because they just signed me back up for therapy. Pasher's still beside me in bed and he's immediately aware that I'm awake, so he starts reciting hymns again quietly. But there's something wrong in the room. The moon outside my window is making everything blue and I can kind of see most of my stuff. In the corner by the closet door, there's a shape that's not supposed to be there. Not very tall, maybe half the size of a person, unless it's a hunched over person. Please don't be a hunched over person. As if in response, I see them, two shiny eyes reflecting light from outside, staring at me. They're not human eyes, they're doggy eyes. Like the eyes of a big, black dog that should not be in my bedroom. Pasher, the dog is in my room, I whisper. He stops reciting hymn lyrics. I can't see it, Lily, he says. This isn't good. Go away, I hiss at the dog. It responds by standing up. For a moment, I think it's going to pounce on me and tear my throat out but instead the hinges of the closet door creak as it begins to open. I know I shut it tight because closets freak me out ever since I saw the movie Poltergeist. The door opens a crack and the dog walks slowly into it, disappearing into the darkness inside. Something just opened the closet, Pasher says. Was that the dog? I don't know. Suddenly, the closet door swings wide open into the room. I frantically pull the covers up to my chin, waiting for the dog to come back out or something worse. Maybe a billion spiders. <gasps> no, what if it's neon glowing robots made out of spinning blades and shooting flames? Or zombies? Pet zombies? Zombie versions of every pet that died in this house? Oh, that's horrifying. Why am I thinking about that, stupid imagination? Maybe it's clones of my mom and dad with black holes for eyes and blood pouring out of their mouths. Stop! Stop thinking of these things! Pasher suddenly sounds scared too. Maybe it's Samuel, he says. Oh, oh crud. Someone, something in the closet is getting into our heads. It's like flipping through the Rolodex of our nightmares and trying to pluck just the right one to introduce itself to us with. Lily, Pasher says urgently, clear your mind, focus on one thing and keep it in your head. I start thinking of a brick wall, just focusing on the brick wall, bricks, lots of bricks. How tall is this wall, this brick wall? How brick is this wall? So many bricks. Pasher starts singing the hymns he was droning on earlier. He doesn't stop, and when one ends, he goes right into another one. He actually sounds really nice. I guess you could say he has the voice of an angel. Bricks, bricks, bricks. The closet door slams shut angrily. A minute later, my father comes stomping and shouting down the hallway and barges into the room, flipping on the light. I sit up and rub my eyes. What's going on in here? He demands. I have no idea, I admit. I was asleep and then something loud woke me up. It sounded like a door slamming. 
My dad eyes the closet door suspiciously. For a moment, I see him in my mind opening the door and the big black dog leaping onto him and tearing him into pieces. No, stop that, brain. Don't open the closet, Dad. Please don't open the closet. He looks at me. Go back to sleep. Then he flips the lights off and leaves the room, shutting the door quietly behind him. I do not sleep a wink of the rest of the night. Jeez, Lily, you look like a walking corpse. Thanks, Greg, I say. Jamal smacks Greg. I don't really blame Greg for thinking so, though, because I certainly feel like one. Probably because I didn't get any sleep last night, or the night before. In fact, the past three nights have been about waiting for the thing in my closet to come out and kill me. It's hard to close your eyes when there's something in your closet that might want to kill you. Saturday, I spent outside in the front yard drawing in the dirt with a stick. Fun, I know. I'd go around back and play in the woods, but my dad has some secret project he's working on in the backyard and told me I'm not allowed to go back there until it's done. I'm not even allowed to look out the windows to peek. He says if I see it, he'll just stop working on it. And I mean it. He really does mean it. He's not like one of those dads who says he's going to do something if you don't do what you're told, and then you don't do what you're told, and he just talks his way around doing the thing he said he was going to do. I know kids who have dads like that. They're all spoiled. Probably because they know that even if they do the thing they're not supposed to, they won't get in real trouble for it. <coughs> Lisa Welch. On the other hand, maybe the thing Dad is doing in the backyard isn't something I want him to do. In which case, seeing what it is and causing him to stop it could be a good thing? I don't know. He's probably building me a treehouse, judging from all the lumber he's been going out and buying. Even Pasher won't tell me what it is. I never thought Pasher would conspire with my dad. Sunday, I stared at a book and pretended to read it for a couple hours. I think I completely fooled Mom. Normally, I'd spend Sunday in my room doing a still life at my art table, but there's a thing in my closet that I think wants to kill me, so I stay out of my bedroom except at bedtime. Then I sit in bed until I hear Mom and Dad go to sleep, at which point Pasher and I hurry down to the living room and try to sleep on the couch. Except I can't sleep because I feel like even from there, the thing in my closet is reaching into my brain with long, invisible tentacles and trying to get into my nightmares. And I have to think about brick walls and oceans and the names of every pet I've ever had until the sun comes up. The worst part of all this is I think I ate a grapefruit this morning by accident. My dad put something in a bowl on my placemat at breakfast and I remember scooping it and it tasting sour, but I was in such a haze of sleep deprivation that I just ate it without thinking or looking. Dad even asked me, You don't want any sugar on that, hun? And I just said, Yes, and finished it and then gathered my backpack and lunch and walked out to the bus stop. Can you die if you don't sleep? I asked Jamal. Jamal shrugs. Maybe. Greg sticks his orange head up over the seat and blinks at me several times. I saw a Star Trek episode where they went crazy from lack of sleep. Okay, well, you can't dispute the science of Star Trek. I'm gonna lose my mind, I guess. I look out the window and I think I see a big black dog wearing a funny hat driving a little red car alongside the bus. It looks at me and cocks its head like dogs do. I blink a couple times and there's not even a car there anymore. This must be it. The beginning of my descent into madness. Lily Madness. At school, I stand at my locker and mess up the combination three times. The bell rings for people to be in class, and I'm still trying to get my locker open. Right 13, left past 13 to 42, then all the way around to 6. How am I screwing this up? P.S. Please don't memorize my combination. Finally, I get it and look around only to realize the hall is empty. Everyone's in class, and I'm just starting to put my backpack away and get the right book out. <sighs> I'm even blanking on the name of my homeroom teacher or where to go. I'm just so tired. I close my eyes for a second, kind of like blinking, only I don't follow through on the second part where you open your eyelids again. And the next thing I know, I'm tipping forward and banging my head against my locker. Maybe I'll just go see the nurse and ask to lie down. The nurse's office smells like formaldehyde. That's a liquid they use for preserving bodies. 
I smelled it at my brother Roger's wake. They had him laying in a coffin, dressed up in a suit he'd never wear when he was alive. I want to say he wouldn't be caught dead in it, but he was dead, and we caught him in it. When I went to say goodbye to him, he smelled like pickles. I thought that was really weird, like maybe the funeral home people had had pickles with their lunch and accidentally spilled some on Roger, but Pasher said I was just smelling the formaldehyde. Nurse Halifax's were stocking some of her medical supplies when I come in. She looks like she's 30 years old, going on 100. Her hair's stock white, which I think means you should be shocked to hear her real age after noticing her white hair. Honestly, she's got a baby face like some of the college kids I see sometimes at the mall, but I guess she's been alive a long time because my dad remembers her being the nurse when he went to school here. She squints at me. What are you doing here, Lillian? I felt really dizzy, so I was hoping I could lay down for a bit. Do I need to call your parents and have them come pick you up? She asks. Oh, please, no. No, I just need to rest a moment if that's okay. She checks my temperature with the back of her hand, which I don't really think is the most effective method. It's not like I'm trying to weasel my way out of school. I just need a nap. Besides, after homeroom, we have English, and I already know English good. All right, you can go lie down in room two. She waves me off and goes back to reorganizing her tongue depressors. The nurse's office has three rooms for kids to lie down in if they're sick, each with one of those padded tables like a doctor's office. I go into room two, shutting the door behind me and turning off the light. Ah, <sighs> blissful darkness. It's not pitch black, though, because of a single watt bulb over the sink. I'll leave that on for a bit of comfort. I can hear it humming as I lie down on the padded table and take a look around the room before closing my eyes. There's a chart on the wall with a detailed drawing of all the muscles and bones in the human body. It stares at me with its cartoon eyes, so I roll over to face the wall and go to sleep. I dream about standing at the top of a hill in my backyard, looking out into the woods. There are people standing among the trees, and they're all looking at me. I can't make out their faces, but I can feel their eyes on me. One of them raises their arm and points at me with a weird, gnarled finger like some witch out of a bad movie. A big black dog appears at the person's feet, flaps its mouth like it's barking, but no noise comes out and then starts dashing up the hill toward me. The sound of a door creaking wakes me up. How long was I out? I can't tell. There's no clock in the room. I sit up and look to the door, expecting to see Nurse Halifax checking in on me, probably to tell me it's time to go back to class. The door is closed. The other door, however, is opening. You know, the door that wasn't there before... It's set in the wall at the end of the padded table, and I swear I've been in one of these rooms before and there was no other door in it. It would have to open into the next room, but instead it opens into utter darkness. There's a poster hanging on the other side of the door, and I recognize it because it's my Beatles yellow submarine poster that I hung up in my closet. Why is my bedroom closet following me to school? Are you fudging kidding me? I mutter. As if in response, a thin woman steps out, walking with a strange limp, one leg thumping heavily on the floor. Her skin is so pale it almost glows. People tell me I'm pasty white, but this lady could almost be made out of paste from the way her skin looks. She's wearing tattered brown pants that are held up with an old piece of rope, and her shirt seems like it's made of mummy wrappings. Her hair is almost as white as Nurse Halifax's. Maybe she's her secret albino daughter that she keeps locked up. In my closet. That shouldn't actually be here. The pasty lady turns her head like it's locked into place on her neck and looks at me with big, bulging eyes. Her nose is pinched and almost flat on her face, and her mouth is thin and crooked. She says one word at me. Lily. And then she grins and all her teeth look like little cat fangs. It's like her head was once a jack-o'-lantern until somebody made her into a real girl. I don't say anything back because, frankly, I'm hoping I'm still dreaming and I just need to wake back up and also because don't talk to strangers, what is wrong with you? 
Why do all these creepy people just show up and have to ruin my day constantly? Do you know who I am? She asks. Her voice is soft, not like a whisper, more like that of someone you'd meet at the park who's trying to convince you to get in their van because there's a puppy in the back, but your parents are just five feet away. You're the boogeyman, I say without thinking, though I have no idea who she is. Her eyes roll back in her head for a moment, peering back around the other side. That's a good name. We've heard it before, my sister and I. I look at the door to the main section of Nurse Halifax's office. The boogie woman stands between me and it, just off to the side but close enough that she could easily grab me if I made a dash for it. The hair on my arms is prickling me and there's a sharp ringing starting in my left ear. I'm afraid to look back at her, to make contact with those weird bulging eyes and their tiny pupils. She reminds me of a shark, like a person had a baby with a shark. I don't know if the shark had the baby or the person had the baby. Maybe the person was swimming with sharks and kissed one without thinking about it. I'm not stupid. I know how babies are made. I prefer the name Onakoli, she says. She gestures back toward the darkness beyond the door she came through. I'm here to bring you to meet my mother. I shake my head. I'm not going in that closet with you. I turn toward the other door and shout as loudly as I can, Nurse Halifax, help! She can't hear you, the boogie woman says with a smirk. She runs her tongue over her little cat fang teeth. At the moment, she doesn't even remember you're here. I try to focus, to visualize the future the way Pasher taught me, to try to get some hint of how to proceed, but all I see is darkness. It's not my first time I haven't been able to see the future while I've tried to will it. Stupid gift likes to make my life difficult. Ten bucks says I wouldn't even be sitting here on this paddled table about to get eaten by a shark-human hybrid boogie woman in the nurse's office if I couldn't see things before they happen. The boogie woman holds her hand out to me. I know you have no idea what's going on, but I'm not here to take you to Hades or anything. Although, if you'd rather... My sister can come for you instead. She's been known to eat a child or two. I took my hands in my pockets. Why are there only two options? She shakes her head with amusement. I hate it when creepy people are amused. Last chance, little one. Come with me. Meet my mother. Or we'll send Lamia. Maybe she'll just bite off a finger or a hand when you fight. Do you want to see what she looks like? My sister, I can show you. Her face starts to melt, slowly at first, but quickening like someone held a blowtorch to a clay sculpture. Her body bends like it's made of taffy, stretching her mummy bandages. They don't rip or come apart at all, it's more like they're part of her body. Ugh. I want to scream as I watch every recognizable feature of her warp and twist puddling in on itself. For a second, I see a beautiful face, prettier than the one she had before she started morphing. It turns and looks at me with hollow eye sockets and opens a mouth with several rows of teeth. Remember earlier when I said she looked like a shark and a person had a baby? Well, I was wrong. Now she looks like a shark and a person had a baby. Is this what you want? The thing hisses. It's got at least three elbows on each arm and four arms sprouting out of it. I can't even tell where its legs are. It's more like a giant stalk, like it's growing out of the floor rather than standing on it. Can we have a do-over? I yell, covering my eyes. There's a sound like somebody slapping a wet towel around and smacking people with it. My brother Roger used to do that whenever we went swimming. He'd get the towel soaking wet and then snap me with it. A wet towel really hurts when you get snapped with it. I heard someone once lost an eye from getting snapped with a wet towel right in the face. Mom and Dad always told Roger not to snap me with his towel, so he just waited until they weren't looking so he could do it. I wonder where Roger is right now. When I look again, she's turned back into the gaunt, pale woman she was before, although her white hair is now a bit blonder and longer, and one of her eyes is a little off-center. It's kind of distracting, but I don't mention it because I don't want her to feel self-conscious. Shall we go? She asks. Look, I don't want to get eaten by your sister, but I can't go right now. I've got school. 
English class is looking so good right now. I wonder what Simone is doing. She's probably sitting in class wondering what I'm doing. The boogie woman shakes her head. Time works differently where we are going. Well, isn't that wildly convenient? Where exactly are we going? I ask, pointing at the door. Just right in there in the closet? We are going to the crossroads where my mother lives. Your mother lives at a crossroad? The boogie woman nods and grabs me by the hand, pulling me off the padded table. Her grip feels cold and clammy, like I'm being tugged at by a fish. I stumble to my feet. I'll explain on the way. I don't want to go, but I feel strangely compelled to let her lead me into the darkness of my closet. My closet? In the nurse's office? This doesn't make any sense. I'm dreaming. Lily, wake up. The door slams shut behind us. At the same time, the inside of the closet is lit by fire. I panic for a moment before realizing we're not actually standing in a little closet, but in a stony hallway with rough-looking sides. There are little bowls nailed into the rock walls, and each one has a little bonfire inside of it that starts to light up the whole place. The hallway goes on seemingly forever, and the flickering fires make me feel dizzy again. But not like banged my head against my locker dizzy. More like I'm losing a sense of which way is up kind of dizzy. The boogie woman holds my wrist with her fish-cold hand and walks awkwardly down the passage, one foot thumping hard across the floor with every other step. As we go, she starts talking like a tour guide. We call it the crossroad. Think of it this way. Your existence is like that door we just went through. You live on one side of the door. I run my hand along the stone wall. It feels wet and slimy, and I'd swear it just twitched when I touched it. Maybe this isn't stone at all. Oh god, please don't be inside a living thing. When you die, it's like walking through the door to the other side. You mean like the veil to the afterlife? I ask. She turns and looks at me, still clopping along. Actually, I take that back. Her head doesn't turn, but her eye moves around the side of her head to look back at me. I gag a little watching it swim around her in her skin. Yes, the veil. The crossroad is the veil, she says. What do you mean? Actually, I have more important questions like, geez, does this hallway ever end? How long are we going to be walking here? When you said time works differently, did you mean that we'd be walking down this creepy, fleshy hallway forever? Also, am I going to die? When you walk through a door, you're passing through a plane. I don't know how we got on the subject of airplanes, but okay. That plane is like another form of existence. We live on that plane. And my mother lives where your plane and our plane meet. At the crossroad. At the veil. You live on a plane? I can't even imagine trying to live on a plane. You'd just be flying everywhere constantly. I wonder if they have their own stewardesses. Maybe that's who this lady is. Her and her sister might be stewardesses. Does that mean her mother is the pilot? We are almost there. I look past her at the endless hall and the flickering fires and the wet-looking walls. I don't see any other end to it. Maybe not having both eyes looking forward is confusing her vision. But a moment later she goes, Ah, here we are at last, and reaches out into the emptiness, twisting her wrist as if she's turning a knob. The hallway moves like it's a painting on a wall and opens away from us into a deep purple glow. Pretty. The room we step into looks like one of my dreams after I had pizza for dinner. You ever have pizza for dinner and then have really weird dreams? Maybe they just drugged my pizza or something. Anyway, the purple glow comes from these shiny crystal rocks that are glued onto the ends of metal poles standing around the room. There's no corners in here, it's just one big circle. Or rather a cylinder, I guess. It's like we're in a big soup can. 
I mean a really big soup can, like a house-sized soup can. This doesn't look like an airplane, I mutter. The boogie woman lets go of my wrist finally and thumps away from me on her big heavy leg. She walks over to one of the walls, bends down and makes a motion like she's unzipping the side of a camping tent. I went camping one summer when we were visiting my Uncle George's cabin before he had finished getting an addition built onto it. Roger and my cousin Susie got to sleep on the porch, and I got put out in a little pup tent in the front yard. Roger and Susie tormented me all night by making werewolf noises from the porch until our parents came out and told them to shut up. The wall unzips just like my pup tent did, revealing an arch into another hallway. Follow me, the boogie woman says, looking back at me with her cat fang grin. Mother is waiting. Lily, you are not in Kansas anymore. I am in so much trouble right now. I don't even know where to begin. I wonder if Nurse Halifax has checked on me yet and found the room empty. Or what if what the boogie woman said is true and that she's forgotten entirely that I was even there? Or if time is frozen while I'm in here, wherever I am. What if I get back and find that a hundred years have passed? What if I don't get back? Oh, Pasher, will you wonder whatever happened to me? Can you even sense that I'm here? I follow the lady down another hallway, this one made of actual stones, not weird, fleshy, stone-looking material. It's like someone actually built this hallway rather than carved a tunnel through a meat mine. Ugh. There are other doors in the walls, no two seem to match. I wonder if this is how the boogeyman or boogie woman gets into people's bedrooms? I wonder if one of these doors leads to Lisa Welch's room. <laughs> Maybe I can talk them into eating her. We zig and zag down hallway after hallway of doors. I'm honestly lost at this point. Not that I wasn't lost before. I mean, I'm not sure I could get back home on my own even if I tried. The boogie woman doesn't seem worried that I might run away. <sighs> I imagine things work differently here than back home. Finally, we enter another large, round room. This one's even bigger than the last one, and it's got other people in it. There are huge pillars sticking up floor to ceiling, and stone chairs that seem like they grew right out of the floor. The other people sit and look at me, their eyes shining like cat eyes. A huge chandelier hangs from the ceiling in the center of the room and has at least a hundred candles in it. I wonder, who has to light all those candles? I do not want that job. In the middle of the room is a big stone chair, and there's a lady sitting on it, raven-haired with shiny eyes like the rest. She's got on a long white dress, and the big black dog that was following me on Friday sits by her side while she pets it. Everyone except the lady on the big chair stands when the boogie woman and I enter the room. There's a murmur through the lot of them, but I can't understand what they're saying. I think it's another language. Oh boy, if we're not speaking English here, I'm in trouble. Welcome, Lillian, the raven-haired woman says. It's in English. Whew. She doesn't sound like she means it, though. Welcome, that is. If anything, her tone sounds like she actually means the opposite. What's the opposite of welcome? Like, what do you say to greet someone who you don't want to be there? Hi, I stutter. The people around me sit back down with a rustle. The boogie woman walks over to stand on the other side of the woman's chair. Can I pet your dog? I ask. You may not. She pets it herself. Oh. The woman stares at me. She doesn't blink. I don't blink back, but I don't feel comfortable staring at her, so I stare at the dog instead. The dog stares back at me, too. Damn it! I stare off into space. Space can't stare back at me. My name is Hecate, Lillian. Do you know me? Heckle what? Hecate? No, I admit. Well, I know you. Oh. At this point, I feel like I'm known by way too many of the wrong people. It would be nice to have maybe someone cool, like that kid from the Goonies, know me. The one with asthma. 
Not some woman who sits in a big empty room doing nothing, surrounded by people doing nothing, all doing nothing in a big empty room together in the middle of a maze of hallways with doors to people's closets. You are the knife that cuts the veil, she says. Her words ring in my ears because I've heard them in that order before. Officer Flowers called me that, the knife that cuts the veil. I didn't understand it then, and I'm still confused by it now. I don't know what that means, I tell her. It means, the woman says, standing up and taking her hand off the big black dog, that one of us is going to have to destroy the other. I'm Lily Madwip, and things have gone terribly wrong. Destroy is a heavy word. Can you imagine being 10 years old and some random woman who surrounds herself with creepy monster people says she's going to destroy you? I mean, kill is one thing, but destroy? It reminds me of when my parents and Roger and I went to a Thanksgiving party that my mom's company was putting on and Charlie Butterman, the CEO's son, ate so much of the turkey that mom said he demolished it. The visual you may get is of a turkey stripped of all the meat, but it was even worse than that. Charlie was a wrecking ball, a turkey-consuming wrecking ball. So when Hecate tells me she's going to destroy me, all I can imagine is her jumping on me and tearing me apart like Charlie Butterman on a Thanksgiving turkey. Bones and lily bits everywhere. But I'm only 10 years old. I yell and make my eyes water a bit. It's a cheap tactic, I know, but it usually works on adults. Hecate does not look the least bit bothered by my tears. Oh, please... She says, waving her hand at me like my father does when I tell him I'm too full to eat the green beans on my plate. Do you really think crying is going to sway me? Do you know how many like you I've dealt with in my years? Jeez, she asks me a lot of questions. 38, I guess. She smirks at me. 11. Oh. For some reason, I thought it would be higher. I don't know why she'd smirk at me for her number being lower than my guess. May I eat her, mother? Hisses someone. It's a lady sitting at the foot of Hecate's chair. She's dressed in a black gown, kind of like the boogie woman's, and she wiggles around like she's uncomfortable. No, I guess the word would be writhes. She writhes around on the steps in front of Hecate, who apparently is her mom. It takes me a moment to realize that the lady's legs aren't simply weird and unnaturally curvy. They're a single leg. In fact, it's not a leg at all. It's a scaly-looking tail like a giant snake. She's got a snake butt. I almost laugh when I think that. From now on, she will be known as Snake Butt. Snake Butt is facing me, but I can't tell if she's looking at me because she's got no eyes. Just a pair of dark, empty sockets. Her mouth is hanging open, and I can see a pair of rather long, pointy fangs sticking out, and beyond them, another row of teeth. Kind of like a shark. Yikes. She is the complete package if you ordered Nightmare Babysitter from Sears. My parents always say that if you leave your mouth hanging open, a fly will go in. Uh, something about snake butt makes me think she'd enjoy that. Of course you can't eat her. Hecate smacks the woman on the top of her head. Snakebutt flinches and snarls for a second like a cornered dog. Why do you always ask if you can eat them? I know it's been over 1600 seasons since one was last before us, but the rules haven't changed. Hecate looks at me and tries to smile, but she's clearly not good at it. We are not uncivilized here at the crossroads. Uncivilized? Lady, your daughter has a snake butt. I don't want to say what that implies you did with a snake, but if someone was caught doing it at the zoo, I don't think the word civilized would come up in the police report. Why can't we just leave each other alone? I ask. I didn't want any of this. I just want to go to school, play with Simone, come home, practice drums, talk to Pasher, have dinner. I'm leaving a lot of stuff out, but none of it involves going in the closet and getting messed up with monster people. Hecate clicks her tongue at me dismissively. The prophecy states that the only- No, wait, a prophecy? There's a prophecy? I ask excitedly. Yes, now don't interrupt. 
Sorry. Oh man, I'm part of a prophecy! <laughs> the prophecy... She waits a moment, looking at me like she expects me to interrupt again, but I know better. States that the only way for my reign here at the crossroads to end is for my life to be taken by the knife that cuts the veil. Oh, that's me. Ooh. You see, long ago when my people flourished in the old country, the crossroads came to be, creating the veil that separated mortals from immortals. Some of those separated by the veil tried several times to end me. And always, they failed. Wait a second. Am I getting a history lesson? Ugh, I just came from school. I don't need this. The people around Hecate nod as she talks, except for Snakebutt who hangs her head like she's heard the story a hundred times. Or maybe even a thousand times. She seems to sense me staring and winks an empty eye socket, then licks her lips. For some reason, I can't help but wonder how snakes go to the bathroom. When they found that brute force was inadequate, they decided to use their limited wits. A hundred years went by before they had trained another to confront me. For their impudence, I cut him into little pieces and scattered them across the land. Then my darlings salted the ground where his bits were buried so he could not even fertilize the earth. That sounds a bit excessive. I look at the stone tiling on the floor. Some of the stones were polished and dark. Others are lighter but dull. Maybe this place was the inspiration for the checkerboard? I used to play checkers with my dad, but then he told me my strategy of knocking the board over and storming off when I lost wasn't allowed, so we played Pop-O-Matic Trouble instead. Are you listening? I look up. Hecate is glaring at me. The black dog at her side curls its lips back to bare its nasty teeth. I understood the part where you cut up the guy and salted his bits, but the rest of what you just said made no sense to me. I can't look her in the eyes, so I play with my fingers and look at them and pray quietly that she doesn't just walk up and tear my head off. Oh, please, Pasher, if you can hear me, save me. Oh, for the love of... The boogie woman steps down from beside her mother's seat. Look, little girl. Long before you were born, or your grandparents, or their grandparents, or anyone even closely related to you, my mother was destined to live here at the crossroads between life and afterlife. But those beings, your angels, on the one side of the veil didn't like being separated from the rest of you, so they started plotting a way to break the divide. She pauses and looks at me with her hands out in that do-you-follow-what-I'm-saying kind of way that teachers like to do after they've written a math problem up on the board and nobody raises their hand to solve it. Okay, I say. Though, really, this is only making partial sense to me. Why would the angels want to get rid of the veil? We had a neighbor once, Mr. Barkley, and he didn't have any curtains on his windows. Or shades, so everybody walking by or driving by no matter the time could just look in and see Mr. Barkley walking around his house eating his dinner and staring at the TV and doing his business. I can't imagine every day having anybody who wanted to be able to just look in and watch you eat or sit in your underwear and watch TV. Which, apparently Mr. Barkley did a lot. Like, a lot a lot. The boogie woman sighs with a little relief. I guess she's not really a boogie woman, but at this point I can't remember the name she told me when she first stepped out of my closet. It started with an O, I think. Oh no, something. Your angels have been training you to break through the veil so that they can coexist among you once again. Oh no says. And that's... bad? I ask. Would that make heaven an actual place we could go, I wonder? I heard a song once called Heaven is a Place on Earth. I didn't think it was literal, but maybe once long ago, heaven and hell were actual places you could visit. I know my dad thinks hell exists on Earth because I've heard him talk about Columbus, Ohio. Hecate stands up from her chair. Her raven hair is floating in the air like there's some sort of fan behind her blowing on her. Nobody else's hair is reacting to it. Oh my god, she has magic hair! That is so cool! I can't help but quietly go, ooh, as I watch. The crossroads is the wall separating you and them. Do you not understand? She sounds kind of angry. 
Snakebutt grins all her rows of teeth and claps her hands excitedly. I get the bad sense that the whole destroying me thing is about to go down and I once again picture Charlie Butterman demolishing an entire turkey. Here comes the wrecking ball! Woo woo! Oh, no, wait, that's a train. What sound does a wrecking ball make? Um, whoosh, I guess. When you punch a hole in the wall, you are destroying that wall. She floats down the steps from her chair and I realize her feet aren't even touching the floor. She's literally floating. When I said she floats down the steps, I meant it in just the delicate way she moves, but no, she's actually floating. With frightening speed, she crosses the room and gets right up in my face, making me flinch. Instinctively, I tense up further, expecting to get punched in the arm for it, but I don't think they play that game here. Only Roger ever seemed to play two for flinching. Hecate grabs my wrist. Her hand is really cold. I start to tell her that, but she pulls me away from the rest of the group, none of whom rise to join us. They just sit there in their stone chairs in their checkerboard room and watch us go. I guess they know not to follow. Or maybe it's pretty gruesome when she destroys people. Oh god, why did I think that? My knees feel like jelly, and I trip as she pulls me. I start to cry for real. Ugh, what on earth are you doing? Hecate asks, more with annoyance than rage. I, I sniffle. I don't want to be destroyed like a turkey. What? I don't. I grab my arm and start pulling to try to get out of her grip. <clears throat> want to get uh, destroyed. Wow, she's she's got a pretty solid hold there. Once, when I was six, or maybe it was seven, my dad took Roger and I to a water park. Roger and I had a blast, and we swam and slid down water slides for hours. We also got so cooked from the sun that I would scream whenever I was out of the water. I was afraid to go home because I knew the moment I got out of the pool it would burn. But my dad insisted because the park was going to close soon, so... He ended up physically dragging me out of the water and back to the car. I remember his grip on my arm felt like iron. Well, now I think maybe it was more like a softer metal. Maybe gold? Gold's supposed to be pretty soft, although it's also heavy. Yeah, that sounds like my dad. Soft and heavy. But Hecate, she's got an iron grip that puts my dad's to shame. Hecate continues to drag me across the stony checkered floor and out of the room, back into the twisty, turny hall of hallways that Ono and I came from originally. I try to stand again, but she's floating so fast I can't even get a foot up. My arm starts to hurt from all the weight hanging on it. I only weigh around 60 pounds, but it still feels like my arm is probably going to rip off entirely and then she's going to float on without noticing that I'm laying on the floor bleeding to death. Can we stop for a moment? I beg. Some of her long, fantastic magic hair whips me in the face, and I don't know whether to be bothered by it or honored. Who gets slapped in the face with magic hair these days? Just me. Just Lily Madwhip, that's who. I want you to see what you've done already. I haven't done anything, I yell. I just got here! This place is dark and dreary despite the torches, but the torches we pass are everything from butt-ugly metal doors you'd find in the back of a grocery store freezer to a majestic polished wood covered with bronzework and swirly patterns and leaves. I want to tug myself free and try them all. I want to see if there's a door that takes me to Australia. I bet you can tell the Australian doors from the regular doors because they're upside down. Hecate turns a corner and I get thumped against the wall as she drags me around it. She wrenches my arm and pain shoots up my shoulder. I can't believe my arm is still in its socket. Arm, when we get out of this, if we get out of this, I will give you an Oreo as a reward. Three comfort Oreos, I promise. The hallways twist again and again. How the heck does she keep track of where she's going around here? Hecate keeps talking to me as she floats along, show off. Three seasons ago, you sundered my realm. I admit I had gotten lax. It had been a long time since they tried. Maybe deep down I hoped that they were done. That they accepted the veil for what it is. And then... This. She throws me to the floor at her feet. My arm is screaming with pain, but to be honest... I was in a car accident last year and had some broken ribs, and that was a lot worse. I can handle how raw my arm feels. 
Just gotta compare how bad things are to how bad they could be. Speaking of how bad things are, the hallway ahead of me is... Well... Let's just say it looks like a Godzilla-sized Charlie Butterman thought it was a Thanksgiving turkey. The floor goes from smooth and straight to torn up and up and up. The stones almost form a staircase. Like, a staircase if the designer was drunk, maybe. There's a wooden door with a crystal knob like the ones at Nana's house, and it's floating and rotating slowly in the air as if it's drifting in outer space. Why someone would shoot a door into orbit, I don't know. There's broken rock and boards, and they're all defying gravity, which cheeses me off, since I'm the only thing here right now that isn't defying gravity, and I kind of wish I was. Beyond where the hallway looks buttermanned, there's nothing. Just nothing. It's like an empty chalkboard. Not one of the green ones. The bits of stone and some other doors are all tumbling off like I'm looking down into a pit rather than forward into a hall. And it's a little dizzying. Also, there's this howling sound. Not like a wolf or the wind, but kind of like when you're at a school concert and they have the whole chorus singing Silent Night and before anyone starts clapping at the end, the whole auditorium is humming a bit and you aren't sure if the song is over because it kind of sounds like people are still singing or maybe it's your ears ringing because you're standing next to the shrillest girl in the whole class. Guess who that is? Lisa Welch. Look what you did. Hecate says in the same tone my mother uses when she finds chewing gum stuck under the sofa cushions. I wonder if they teach classes to prospective moms on how to perfect that tone of voice. I didn't do this, is all I can think to say. To be fair, I don't understand how I could have done it. I wasn't even in this place. Hecate floats past me and hovers in the middle of the mess with her arms out. Three seasons ago... Did you not attempt to bring someone back from the other side? I have to think about that. Did I? A lot happened. How long ago is three seasons anyway? She must be talking about when I had to deal with all the angels and their mucked up destinies. I don't recall trying to bring anyone back from... wherever. There was Officer Flowers, but she was dead and stayed dead. The only other time I had anything to do with dead people was... Oh. Do you mean Roger? That's right. Samuel tried to convince me to save Roger from getting turned into mashed potatoes. He even sent me back somehow to stop the car crash from happening. But I didn't. That wasn't me, I tell her. It was you, you filthy little liar. She glares at me. And she's got a heck of a glare, I'll give her that. Her stare would probably make any other little kid wet their pants. Me? I can glare back, though, so I do. Hard. Not as hard. Because I think she's got a lot more years' experience. Samuel did that. I grit my teeth to try to look mean. And I refused to go through with it. Lies! Hecate screams. She floats at me like a horrible banshee. That's an Irish ghost. I think I've explained this before. Grabbing my arm again, I feel her lift me off my feet. She hisses in my ear. Maybe I shall teach you what it's like to see your world torn apart. And next thing I know, I'm being tossed like a doll into the nothing beyond the buttermanned hallway. Oh, God. I'm falling through space. I can see Hecate watching me go every time I spin back around. My tummy is in a huge knot. I don't even remember what I ate for breakfast. I don't remember what I ate for breakfast, but I think I'm about to get a reminder. Hecate watches silently, her face full of anger. Eventually, she turns and floats off out of sight. I keep falling, or floating. I said I wanted to float earlier, but I changed my mind. I want to go back to the hallway and talk this out. I hope Nurse Halifax remembers me soon. I wonder if they can send a search party into my closet... Like in this one movie I saw where ghosts kidnapped a little girl into their ghost dimension and her mom went after her through the closet with a rope tied to her. That was a scary movie, but Pasher told me that sort of stuff doesn't happen in real life. Oh yeah, Pasher? Oh yeah? The tumbling goes on until I can't see the light of the torches back in the hallway. Everything is dark and silent. I think about humming to myself to keep from going crazy, but I can't think of a good song to hum while falling through space forever. Maybe Crazy Train. 
Suddenly, I hit something hard. Like I hit hard and the something was hard. I still only see darkness, but a moment later I hear the sound of someone's footsteps clopping on tiled floor and then there's a jiggle of a knob and a creaking sound and... Light. Oh, I'm on the floor. And this is the nurse's room at school. And there's Nurse Halifax looking down at me on the floor. Hi, Nurse Halifax. I smile because I'm so glad to see her. Unless this is a hallucination brought on by my brain dying. I read that when you're dying, you see things like your whole life or a tunnel of light, and sometimes you just imagine things. Are you all right, Lily? She asks, bending down and offering me a hand. I... I'm not sure what to say. Had a bad dream? She helps me up and brushes me off, even though that's not necessary. My arms still work. I can brush myself off, thank you. So, what just happened? Was I really dreaming? Am I dreaming now? I pinch myself like they always say to do, and yeah, that hurts. Nurse Halifax gives me a look. All rested? Do you think you can get to class by yourself? Yeah, but... What is it, dear? My arm hurts. It does hurt. A lot. There's a burning sensation in my shoulder. I don't know if I got dragged by my arm by a woman with magic hair or if I twisted my arm when falling out of bed. Nurse Halifax takes my hand and turns my arm over. There on my wrist, the skin is red and angry looking. Once, I was helping my dad make spaghetti and I grabbed a pot off the stove without wearing oven mitts. Always wear oven mitts. Trust me. I got burned and dropped the spaghetti sauce all over the floor. Dad rinsed my hands off, but even after we put stuff on them, the skin was red and angry just like it is on my wrist. There's a pattern to the burn. Almost like I got branded. It looks like a circle with a squiggly line inside it and a pointy star in the center. What on earth is this? She asks. Did somebody do this to you? I don't know. I lie. Hecate did this. She marked me. It wasn't a dream. I try to get through the rest of school without having a panic attack. Nurse Halifax has wrapped my wrist in some bandages after putting some of the same ointment my dad used on the burn. It smells kind of like a jungle, I think. I've never been to the jungle, but it's definitely got an odor like I would imagine the jungle smells like like tigers and big wet fronds. Simone sees the bandages on my arm and asks me what happened. I tell her I burned myself at breakfast. She's impressed that I cook my own breakfast. I don't even remember what I had for breakfast. The rest of the school day goes by in a haze. I think I answered a math problem. Maybe even two. We had music class, and the teacher, Miss Patty, had us sing some pop song, but I couldn't focus, so I just mouthed the words to a different song and pretended to sing. All I keep thinking about is that Lady Hecate and her daughter Snakebutt and her other daughter Ono and all those people sitting in that empty throne room in the dark in an endless hallway full of closet doors. In my mind, their faces are all twisted and warped like Ono did with hers their eyes melting down their cheeks and their mouths splitting at weird angles and lots of little teeth inside, they're all looking at me in my mind, all grinning at me, except Hecate, who's angry and her beautiful magic hair is waving around like the little mermaids, except she's not underwater. Are they there now? Watching me? I'm on the bus home, looking out the window at imaginary people on the sidewalk whose faces are melting like wax, my arms screaming with pain from the burn. I don't know what's going on, and I need to talk to Pasher. He's waiting in my room when I get home. I don't even yell to Dad to let him know I'm here. I just run straight upstairs and pick up Pasher from the art table. He hasn't painted anything, but I know he could paint anything if he wanted. Lily, he says in my head. What happened? I sensed you at school, and then it was like you were just... gone. I saw her, Pasher, I say. The woman Roger warned me about. She lives in the Vale. That's not possible, Lily. The Vale is not a place. I went there. That's why you couldn't sense me. I was in the Vale. It's like a maze. They have doors to everywhere, I think. 
They have a lot of doors, that's for sure. A labyrinth. Yeah, like the Minotaur. I peel the bandages off my arm and show him the burn. Look, I think she marked me. I don't see anything. I look at the raised, sore red circle mark with its squiggly line and star. R right here, on my wrist. I believe you, but I can't see it, Lily. I'm sorry. Whatever it is, it's beyond me. I turn and look over my shoulder at the sound of a door creaking. It's the closet. Oh no, it might be- oh no! Quickly, I run over and pile some toys up in front of it. And Legos. Strew Legos all over the floor so she steps on them if she tries to come in here because she doesn't wear any shoes. And my bookshelf. I push my bookshelf, but it's full of books and it's heavy. Okay, no bookshelf. Uh, something else? What are you doing? My dad is standing in the doorway to my room watching me try to pull my dresser over to block the closet door. It's too heavy, though. Probably heavier than the bookshelf. Dang it. I'm trying to keep the boogeyman from coming out of my closet. I explain. Oh, okay. Dad's face takes on that expression he gets whenever I try to tell him about angels or ghosts. You know, the one that says, I had two kids and this is the one that lived? I'm used to it. Just like he's used to me doing stuff like this regularly. Well, come downstairs and get your homework done. I've got to leave for work. I put all the stuff for dinner in the microwave. You just have to heat it up when you're hungry, okay? He turns to leave. What? What do you mean you have to go to work? I ask. Dad stops and turns around. I only just now notice that he's wearing some sort of suit. It's like a dark gray sports coat and a white shirt. He's even got a black tie on. My dad never wears ties. Except at Roger's funeral. Even Roger wore a tie to that. I'll be back after you're sleeping as usual. Where are you going? What does he mean, as usual? I don't have time for games, Lily. Come do your homework and give me a hug. I'll check on you when I get home. He opens his arms for a hug. I walk up and hug him, but I'm so confused. My dad hasn't had a job since Roger was born. Not one he had to dress up for and go out at night to do anyway. His job has been taking care of us and, lately, writing dirges. And playing in the band when they have a gig, but that's usually only around holidays. Dad kisses me on top of the head, ruffles my hair, and then turns again and walks out of the room. I hear him go downstairs whistling a tune, and a minute later comes the sound of the front door shutting, his car being started, and him driving away. I'm still standing in my room, holding my doll, staring at the empty doorway. Pasher, where did my dad just go? I ask. To his job at the hotel, he says. What's wrong, Lily? Something seems off. There's a lump in my throat. When is my mom coming home? Lily, what's going on? Pasher sounds concerned. I don't like it when Pasher sounds concerned. Roger and your mother passed away in a car crash over a year ago. Do you remember the crash? Not her, I whisper. The bottom falls out of my stomach and I'm tumbling through space again. My wrist flares up with pain and I clutch it, dropping Pasher. I can hear the howling again, the one that was coming from the darkness beyond Hecate's ruined hallway. It doesn't sound like children singing, though. It sounds like laughter, like a dark, torchlit room of people with shark grins laughing as they watch their ruler destroy my life piece by piece. Not her. I'm Lily Madwhip, and when it rains, it pours. I'm standing in the rain, looking at the names on this polished gravestone in Holy Oak Cemetery. There used to be one name on the marker. Just Roger T. Madwhip, in all caps, with beloved son in cursive underneath. Now... It says Roger T, and there's another name above it, Catherine B. Our family name Madwhip is big and bold at the bottom. Somebody put flowers in a little plastic vase beside the gravestone. I wonder if my dad did that. 
Maybe I did. This new me. I should have brought an umbrella. Mama? I say to the stone. It's me, Lily. I wrote you a letter, but it got all wet in the rain. So I'm just... I'm just gonna read it, okay? Dear Mama, I miss you. I'm sorry I made you die. I promise I'll fix this. Please don't rot too much. Love, Lily. I pause. Roger, I didn't write you anything, but you're not there anymore anyway. Where did you go? Are you with Hecate somewhere? Oh, right, you can't hear me saying this. Um, love Lily. I put the wag soggy letter under the plastic vase with the flowers in it. Hey, Lily, you want my umbrella? Asked Jamal, coming up behind me. He walked with me to the cemetery, which was a really long way to go, but gave me time to tell him about the boogie woman and Hecate and the veil. I also told him that my mother hadn't died, that she survived the car crash, and that Hecate had done something to change things. I don't even remember her funeral. If you can't remember it happening, it's almost as good as if it didn't happen. I worry, though. What if I wake up one day and remember it? I don't deserve an umbrella. Jamal holds his black umbrella over my head. He's got on his yellow slicker and galoshes, so the umbrella wasn't even crucial to him staying dry anyway. You can't fight a witch queen if you've got pneumonia. I sniffle and can't help but cry quietly, making sure not to shake or nothing so Jamal can't tell I'm doing it. You sound just like her. I tell him after I've wiped my eyes. Sorry. Don't be. We walk back in the rain together. Jamal lets me hold his umbrella. I like feeling the rain on my raincoat anyway, he says. Next time you should wear a raincoat. Do I sound like your mom again? Yeah, you can stop now. At least I wore my boots. If I'd worn my sneakers, they'd be sopping wet in my socks, too. I hate the feeling of wet socks squishing inside my shoes. Some rain got in the tops of my boots, but not enough to make my socks sopping wet. They're just a little damp. Damp is okay. Squishy is not. Neither is pneumonia. As we get near the neighborhood, I see a dark shape at the corner of my street. It's dog-shaped. I feel a bit of panic at first. But as we get closer, I realize it's just a fire hydrant. I guess it wasn't really dog-shaped. Maybe my eyes are playing tricks on me. Mom would say I'm seeing what I want to see. But if that were true, I'd see her standing at the door when I get home. But I don't. I give Jamal back his umbrella once I'm on my porch. What are you going to do now? He asks, still standing in the rain. He tilts his head back to drink some rain right out of the air. I don't know yet. That's not entirely true. I have a bit of an idea. I'm just not sure how to do it. Well, if you want any help, let me know. He starts to walk away and then turns. I wish I could see the things you see. Jamal runs over to his house. He looks back at me and waves once he's there. I think he thought I was watching to make sure he got home okay, but he lives right next door and it's like 40 feet from the porch to his house, so I wasn't too concerned. I was just thinking about how I wish I couldn't see these things, and I'd gladly give it up and let him have it if I could. I wave back and head in. Inside, I finish getting out of my wet boots and jacket. I peel my socks off and toss them by the laundry room door. It's probably not where they go but I don't care right now. My dad is waiting in the kitchen with his jacket on. He's got this look on his face like I let the cat out again, but we don't have a cat and never have, so I don't know why he would be making that face. Maybe we have a cat now, and I let it out because I, I didn't know it was there. I would think there'd be food bowls and water if we had a cat. 
I'm going with no cat. I wish we had a cat. Where have you been? He asks. Um, I don't really want to tell him where I was. I was puddle jumping with Jamal. Smooth. I walked the entire neighborhood, Lily. You weren't anywhere nearby. He hands me a towel. It's purple and smells like flowers. I rub my face in it and imagine I'm covered in flowers. We don't have time for this. Get your boots back on. We have to be at the therapist's office in ten minutes and it's a twenty-minute drive. Oh, great. I have a therapist again? Lovely. Maybe it's the same one, Miss Christie, who I used to go see, only she died of an allergic reaction to something she ate. Maybe I warned her in this new reality. Wouldn't that be something? Miss Christie is alive. And my mother is dead. That makes me sad to think about. Stop thinking sad things, Lily. Can I bring Pasher? What are you talking about? He frowns. Of course not. That makes me sad again. I get my stuff back on and we hop in my dad's red VW Beetle. It's an ugly car. After my dad's old car got wrecked, he and my mom bought a minivan. I wish we still had the minivan. But I guess we don't need a minivan when it's just me and my dad. I hope when I figure out how to fix things and bring my mom back that we still have the minivan. This car looks like half an apple puttering down the road. And now that I think about it, Dad drives a lot slower than I remember. He seems almost nervous about being at the wheel. I wonder if he blames himself for Mom and Roger. He looks at me in the rearview mirror. How many times have I said not to wander off without letting me know where you'll be? I think... Eleven? Fifty-four. He states matter-of-factly. That's... That's a lot. And I thought maybe guessing 11 would be high. I don't know if he has actually said that 54 times or not. I'm surprised he's managed to keep track. I would have lost count after three, probably. I don't like you playing with Jamal, either. He encourages your make-believe too much. Make-believe? What does he mean by that? He knows it's all true. We had everything worked out after Dad almost died last year, and I basically saved his life. Nineteen minutes and thirty seconds later, we pull into the parking lot of a small brick office building. I've never been here before. Or maybe I have. I don't know anymore. That's something that worries me. I'm afraid that one day I'll wake up and remember all the times we came here, all the days between the car accident and how things have changed. And who's to say that's where the change occurred? Maybe whatever Hecate's done to me, th this new reality, maybe it, maybe it goes back to the day I was born. I don't even know what stuff I don't know anymore. It makes my brain hurt just thinking about it. My dad gets out of the ugly ladybug car and leans back in to look at me. Are you coming? Dr. Clay is waiting. Dr. Clay? We walk into a nice office. Everything looks like it's made of wood. I mean, some stuff is obviously made of wood, but then the walls of wallpaper that looks like wood. Or maybe it is wood. But from the outside, the building is brick, so I'm guessing this is fake wood. Again, I've never been here. I think I would remember this place. All the chairs are shaped to look like you're sitting on a big hand. Like giant hands are sprouting up from the carpet and you sit your bum on them. Some poor giant got his hands cut off and now kids sit and fart on them while waiting to talk to the therapist about why they wet the bed. I'm not one of those kids. Don't get the wrong idea. A little old lady with white hair and glasses sits behind a big oak desk. She seems to be typing at a computer that's twice as big as her. Her glasses are equally large. It sounds like someone took a child, aged her a hundred years, and plopped her down in adult-sized clothes in front of adult-sized equipment. When she sees me, she looks down her nose through her glasses at me. They make her eyes look ten times bigger than they actually are. Oh, hello, Lily, she says in a squeaky voice. Running late today. Dad mutters something to her that I can't make out. 
The little lady smiles at him in that way all sweet little old ladies smile at normal grumpy people. Is the rain bringing everybody's spirits down? Just as I'm about to say something about how much I like the rain, because I do, I love the rain, even when it's that slimy kind that comes down and sticks to everything, I love it. My favorite, though, are the summer showers when the sun is still peeking out and the clouds are rumbling because they're hungry. Or because God is bowling, as some have claimed. Where was I? Oh, right. Just as I'm about to say all that, who walks in out of the other office but Felix Weaselman? Uh, his hair is neatly combed and he's got on a pair of glasses that actually make him look kind of smart. But it's clearly him. He's here in front of me, with his weasel chin and weasel nose and beady little weasel eyes. Except, he seems somehow less weasel-like. I don't know, maybe the gray business suit he's wearing instead of a nasty old dirty shirt and pants is what's done it. Or the way he's clearly taken a bath and brushed his teeth. He smiles at me. I want to hiss and reply. I don't know, it's like I'm looking at a different version of Felix. Hello, John. Hello, Lily, he says. Weaselman, I yell and dash behind my dad. Dad reaches behind himself and tries to guide me back around, but I will not be the human shield here. No, sir, you shield me. You're the adult. Felix cocks his head and reaches into his coat for a moment and just looks at me like he's having a vague sense of deja vu. That's where you see or do something that you feel like you've seen or done before, but you can't remember where. I get that all the time when I see things before they happen. A moment later, though, he seems to shake it off and smile at me with amusement. Feeling playful, are we? He asks. He can't mask that nasally voice. If anything else about this made me question whether it was actually him, the voice of the man who tried to kill my best friend Meredith is unmistakable. Well, okay, she's more like my third best friend. I hold my hands up like claws. I don't know what good it'll do. Maybe I can rake out his eyes or something. My dad isn't exactly putting out much of a defense, but then again, maybe he doesn't recognize the man who kidnapped him, locked him in the trunk of his own car, and then crashed it into a tree, putting him in a coma. What are you doing here? I snap at him. Where's Dr. Clay? Felix puts a hand on his chest as if to say, Who, me? But he doesn't say that. Instead, he asks my father, Has there been some regression? I'll show you regression. I snarl and make to kick him in the privates. Rule number one, always go for the privates. Dad puts his arm out and blocks me from stepping in front of him. What's gotten into you? He says, glaring down at me. Then he turns to Felix. She's been acting out for several days now. I thought things were going well and then suddenly she came home from school and seemed confused, kind of lost. Didn't seem to remember things. Dad! I snap. This is the man who locked you in the trunk of your car last year. He kidnapped me, don't you remember? Felix shakes his head. We are back to this story, Lily? It's not a story. Well, okay, it is. But it's a story about the truth. It's nonfiction. Can we take this inside? My dad asks, looking nervously around the office. There's nobody else here except the little old lady, so I don't know who he's afraid of overhearing everything. Besides, not going into the closed room with the guy who burned down my third best friend's house twice and killed her family as well as a police officer is kind of my goal. I'm not budging from this spot. I cross my arms. I'm not going in there. So of course, Dad picks me up and carries me into Felix's new death lair. This is a nice death lair, though. I guess he has a cleaning service. He has lots of books on his shelves. They all have long titles and weird author names. And there's a photo on his desk of him at some sort of beach posing with two others. He's in swim trunks. Oh God, is he pasty. And there's a little boy with him and a lady with blonde hair and a smile on her face. The smile looks genuine. Like she's actually happy to be there next to a man who looks like a weasel. I recognize the boy. I saw him once in a locket that Felix kept on him. It's his son, who died in a fire accidentally caused by Meredith. Have a seat. Felix gestures towards one of the chairs. They don't look like giant hands. I guess they ran out of giants. No. Dad grits his teeth. Lily? 
This guy almost killed me last year. I can't believe I'm even having to say this. He should be in the electric chair. God, you see what I'm talking about? Dad says to Felix, gesturing at me like he's offering me to him as a meal. Maybe he is. Maybe he brought me here so that Felix could eat me like the big bad wolf. This is a nightmare. I'm in a room full of books with my father and the weasel-faced killer, and they're acting like buddies. Felix strokes his chin. They both sit down and then look at me as if they're waiting for me to join them, but I won't. I'm not going to let this be normal. I'm going to go stand over here by the door and wait for them to not be paying attention so I can escape. Well, like I said, she came home from school a few days ago and seemed confused. She didn't say that anything happened at school, but I don't expect her to, even if something did. Felix nods as he listens. I hate that he looks like an average person and not a greasy snake. He looks at me and smiles. Oh, yuck, don't smile at me. I scowl back at him and stare daggers. Dagger stare. Lily? Did something happen at school this week? Stare, stare, stare. <laughs> they want to know what's going on. Okay, I'll tell them. You want to know? Fine, I got attacked by a witch in her closet realm when I went to the nurse's office. Both of them raise their eyebrows and look at each other. Then they look at me again. Why didn't you tell me this before, Pumpkin? Dad asks. His face says, Of course you did, sweet Lily. You don't sound crazy at all. Here's a needle. We're going to stick it in your arm and put you in a quiet room where the walls are made out of pillows. Night-night. Because you never believe me. What was the witch's name? Felix crisscrosses his fingers and rests his head in his hands. I can see from his expression that the tone of concern in his voice is fake. Fake? He's a phony pretending to be a doctor. Hecate, I mutter. And you know what? She blames me for her hallway exploding because of you. You! Because of all that stuff last year where you tried to kill Meredith. Felix opens his mouth like he's about to say something back. Maybe he's going to say, I'm sorry. Yeah, right. Instead, he says nothing, but pinches his mouth between his fingers and leans back in his chair and nods over and over again like one of those bobble-headed dolls people put on the dashboards of their cars. I wish he was a bobblehead so I could just pull his head right off and watch the spring stick out of the top of his neck. He reaches into his coat for a moment like he did before and seems to search for something. He sees me watching him do it and for a moment I see a hint of anger. Then he pulls his hand out and scrunches up his mouth in thought. I see, he finally says. So that's how this ties into your previous fantasy. He nods at my dad. I am once again the antagonist of her story. It's not a fantasy! I run over and grab Dad's sleeve. I give him my strongest stare. On a scale of 1 to 10, this stare would be like a 9. Maybe even a 9.5. We're doing decimals in math class. I don't care if Felix pretends to be a therapist. I just need to convince my dad. Come on, Dad, please. For once in your life, believe me. He looks at me with the same sad face he always used to have. Before Hecate, we had finally bonded. We were getting along. He was teaching me drums. Now, it's like all of that has vanished. Felix pulls out a folder from one of the drawers in his desk and starts thumbing through it. He glances up at me every now and then, making sure his glasses are down his nose a bit so he can look down his nose at me. I think he's doing it on purpose. Nobody's glasses keep slipping down their noses like that unless they've got the wrong glasses on. Has she been taking her medication? He asks. Dad looks at me with concern again. I think so. You think so? Felix turns his nose to my father. Ha, Dad! Now you're getting the look instead of me. Well, my job keeps me out late. Dad shrugs sheepishly. That's a weird way to describe it, because sheep can't shrug. I don't think they even got shoulders. I can't imagine not having shoulders. How would you even indicate to someone that you don't know or care about something if you got no shoulders to shrug? I haven't even been home when she went to bed most nights. She said she was taking the pills. What pills? I'm not on any medication. Dad sighs. Oh boy, Felix says, closing the folder and leaning back in his chair again. Lily, we talked about this. 
the pills were helping you focus. I don't know what you're talking about. I look at dad, but he looks away. This isn't how things are supposed to be. Hecate changed everything. Felix clears his throat, then holds up some papers from the folder he had out. How about a brief refresher? Ahem. Lily has developed a fantasy where her mother survived a fatal car wreck. Should I be in here for this? Dad interrupts him. You should probably go, yes. No! I yell and pull Dad, trying to make him sit down again. He stands up anyway because he's an adult and I don't have the strength to hold him down. Dad, stay! He kneels down and hugs me, and then looks me in the eye and gives me his strongest stare. Mine was a 9, 9.5 if I'm being honest, but his is like a 12. I want him to teach me how to stare like that. You need to stay here and talk to Dr. Clay, Lily. Do what you're told. But Dad, do it, Lily. He uses his tone that says I will take everything you love that you have left away if you disobey me. I know that tone well. And then he gets up, looks at Felix, nods, and walks out of the room to the other room with all the wood and the little old lady. I want to be the one out there. Not in here with this new version of Felix. Felix, who tried to murder my third best friend, Meredith. Felix waits for him to shut the door, and then looks at me. Shall we continue? He starts reading from the paper again, sounding like he's droning off a shopping list. Ahem. Lily has developed a fantasy where her mother survived a fatal car wreck a year and a half ago. She imagines divine voices warn her of imminent danger to those around her, and that she has met others with similar superpowers who she- It's not a superpower, I mutter. It's a gift. You know that. You have one too. Felix looks at me quietly for a long moment, then his expression changes to that of a dog trainer watching their dog pee on the floor instead of the doggy pee pads. Apologies, he says. Others with similar gifts, who she has teamed up with to fight an overarching nemesis by the name of Samuel. Samuel. He makes a pity face at me. I can't stand seeing Felix Weaselface Clay look at me with pity. I know how this sounds, I tell him, and I'm not stupid. I know what's going on. You aren't you because you're new you. And my mom is dead now, but she wasn't before. But I've still got Pasher, which means Meredith probably still has her melted angel Barbie, whose name I forgot. Felix starts scribbling down notes on the paper he was reading from. Yes, Meredith. You've mentioned her before. So you probably still have Raziel still in your locket. Felix pauses and scrunches up his forehead. Did you say I have rice cereal in my pocket? What? No. He blinks, then shakes the confused look off his face. I thought that was a rather strange thing to declare. I said you have Raziel, Z, Raziel, in your locket, the one with the photo of your son Joey in it. Felix stops writing and slowly looks up at me. Where did you learn about my locket? I cross my arms and glare at him. You showed it to me when I was at the hospital with my mother getting my brain examined last year. He reaches into his jacket again. That's what he's been doing this whole time, touching the locket. He always keeps it on him, except when he threw it at me when we finally faced each other last year. Then Samuel took it from me to give to someone else. But that was then, and this is now. He must have it again. You still have it, don't you? I ask him. Felix pulls out the locket and holds it in his hand, looking at it, then me, then it, then me. His eyes seem to glaze over for a moment, like I get at the pet store when I'm looking at the animals I want to adopt. Then he snaps back to looking normal, but gives me an utterly confused look with a level 2 stare. I've never shown this to you. I would ask if you went through my personal items, but- But you already know, because you know things. Things people don't want to tell you. Secrets. What is this? I didn't think Felix could get paler, but he gets paler. Like, super pale. If paleness were a superpower, he'd be like the incredibly pale Hulk. He starts tracing the air with his eyes as if someone put a giant book in front of him and he's trying to read it. 
but there's nothing there. I don't understand. I could sense it when you came in the door today. We've been having these sessions for over a year, but I knew... I knew the things you told me were your imagination. And yet today... Today I know they're not. Oh god. I hate what I'm about to do. Mr. Weasel... F I mean... Dr. Clay? I need your help to stop Hecate. Felix nods and looks at me grimly. Yes. Yes, you do. I'm Lily Madwip, and I'm learning about monsters. I'm at the library, which is called Winslow Library, reading a book on mythology. Winslow Library is named after Miles Winslow, who donated books to the town after the original library burned down because Miles Winslow accidentally set it on fire. It's a long story. Short version is, Miles Winslow was a crazy fellow. After I told Felix everything about Hecate, he asked me if I knew anything about Greece, and I told him I saw the movie five times, although I didn't know what that had to do with anything. Also, I never understood why their car turned into Chitty Chitty Bang Bang at the end. It turns out, Greece is a country too, and that's where mythology comes from. Felix suggested I go to the library and brush up on the subject, because apparently Hecate was around way back when people rode chariots instead of cars and everything was dirt and olives. I already know about the Minotaur, which is a person with a cow for a head. Not the whole cow, just the head. He lives in a maze. And I also know about Medusa, who was a lady with snakes for hair. Not the whole snake, but most of it. But other than those two, I'm not a mythology know-it-all. It turns out, people from Greece were obsessed with mixing up animals. Besides the Minotaur, there's also centaurs, which is where the other half of the cow went. And then there's harpies, which are ladies with vultures for butts. <laughs> Not the whole vulture, just the butt. I didn't know those were myths, though, because I've seen commercials on TV where people admitted they had harpies and were taking medication to get rid of them. Then there's the chimera. That's like a lion, goat, scorpion thing. I don't even know where to begin. Like, where did someone think they saw this thing? Was it like they were walking along and saw a lion looking out from behind a tree, but there was also a goat behind it, and they mistook the goat's butt for the lion's butt? And where the heck did they see a scorpion big enough for its tail to look like a part of this mess? I think people in Greece just drank a lot. My Uncle George drinks a lot. At least since my cousin Susie got run over by a boat. I don't think he ever saw a lion and a goat at the same time, though, and thought they were the same animal. I have a yellow pad of paper for taking notes, but I have no idea what kind of notes to take, so I just draw in it. First I draw a chimera, because it's the weirdest animal I've ever read about. Then I try to draw a harpy, but I'm not any good at drawing people, so I just give it the body of an alligator. I call it an alligarpy. Eventually, I'm not even reading the book anymore, I'm just doodling imaginary animals combined with other animals. What are you drawing? There's another kid in the library. He's taller than me, so he's probably older. He's got crazy brown hair and freckles. Or maybe his face is just dirty. I wish I had freckles. And he's wearing old Velcro shoes. The Velcro is so old it doesn't even stick together anymore and the straps just hang loose. Still, Velcro shoes are nice. I wish I had Velcro shoes. So jealous right now. I look at my most recent piece. It's a... Uh... Pigapotamus. It's from mythology. That's not actually true, I just made this one up. The story's from long ago about superheroes and monsters. I know what mythology is. He wipes his nose with the sleeve of his hoodie. I can see the snot streak go up to his elbow. There's other older, crustier streaks up both arms. Ew. He may know what mythology is, but I bet dollars to donuts that hygiene isn't in his vocabulary. The kid keeps standing there, sniffling occasionally and wiping his runny nose. I stare at him, waiting for him to say something, but he doesn't. Can I help you? I finally ask. He's got dead eyes. I don't normally see those on other kids. Dead eyes are something you typically find on adults. There's no shine in them anymore. It's almost like they just stop reflecting light. Usually it goes with people who've given up on enjoying life and have settled for living day to day. You can tell who loves life because they got the glint in their eyes, but this boy has no glint, just 
empty dead eyes. Nobody can help me. He sniffles, still staring dead-eyed at me. He's got some sort of strange accent I can't place. I want to say he's from overseas, or maybe North Dakota. I don't know what people speak like there, but I imagine it's like me, but with a weird North Dakota accent. I look around, but there's no one else in this part of the library. One slow library isn't the preferred library to use as it is. Most people just go to the other one in Northfield. They've got a multimedia room there with movies and laser disc. My parents took Roger and I once, and I got in trouble for wandering off to the laser discs and signing out a weird movie called The Shining. There's a scene in that movie where a guy hugs and kisses a dead lady in a bathtub. People come up with strange ideas for movies. The gross boy leans forward across the table and whispers, Do you know what a mirage is? Yeah, that's where you park cars. He frowns. No, it's an illusion. I don't argue with him, but I know they're real because we have one attached to the house. He nods at my mythology book. You read about the Sphinx yet? I sure have. The Sphinx is a person with a lion for a body. Not the whole lion, just the body. Or maybe it's a lion with a person's head. It's a lion-person mishmash, basically. And it asks riddles. If you get its riddle wrong, it eats you. Yeah, I've read about the Sphinx. He wipes his nose again. It looks red and sore, probably from all the wiping. Well, I've got a riddle for you like the Sphinx. You won't eat me if I get it wrong, will you? He kind of looks like he might actually try. No. The grimy kid closes his eyes. Oh, maybe he's trying to remember how the riddle goes. It sucks when you try to tell a riddle or joke and screw it up. I have this joke about a bunch of people in a crashing airplane who don't have enough parachutes, but I always get it wrong. Where can you be somewhere and nowhere at the same time? You know what? I don't like riddles. I'm supposed to be doing research, but instead I'm letting this weird kid with his runny nose ask me nonsense questions. I pretend to think for a moment by pushing my lips out and tapping them with my finger. This is how some grown-ups switch on their brains. Finally, I stop and look at him again. I don't know, where? He presses his fingers into the table. Right here. At the library? I don't get it. He cocks his head. Are you at the library? I look around carefully. Yes? The kid stands back up straight and shakes his head. You just think you are. I know. I've been lost here forever. At the library? That would be awful. How does someone get lost at the library? Don't the librarians check to make sure no one's still inside when they lock up? The boy sighs. No, here. Here. Where we are. I am so confused. Then again, this kid doesn't seem like he's got all the cards in his deck. He acts like he bet all his marbles on a Hail Mary play and lost. It's definitely not from around here, judging by his accent. He continues to talk. Something inside him got switched on and activated the connection between his brain and his mouth, and now whatever bizarre thought passes through, one spills out the other. You lose track of time. I did. And everything you give up, you see through the mirage, and you know where you are. And that's when it stops trying to pretend to be anything other than what it is. It all just goes away. You can't see, then. There's no sun, no candles, nothing. You start to wonder if you even exist anymore. Are you breathing? Are you hearing yourself breathe, or are you imagining it? Was there ever really anything to begin with? Your mother, did she ever really exist? My mother? My mother existed. How would I have been born if she didn't exist? I miss my mom. I feel like crying now. And then suddenly there's the sun, and there's the ground, but everything's different. People are different, the world is different. It's not your world anymore, it's someone else's. Someone else has come along after so long you don't even remember what it's like to exist anymore. And they believe in the illusion, so it changes to suit them and all you can do is... is... I don't know. I don't know what to do because I want the dream to continue. But I know it's just a dream. Are you sure you're okay? I ask. 
His dead eyes have gotten a spark of life in them now, but they've got a bit of crazy look in them too. I wouldn't be surprised if he started grinning and clacking his teeth together and his eyes bugged out like one of those creepy wind-up monkeys. The boy is panting. He's been talking so fast at me. He sounds kind of ragged, like he gargled some asphalt and washed it down with salt water. I'm okay. I'm okay now. Because you're here. But here is somewhere, I say sarcastically. Yes! Now he claps happily, which makes a cloud of flaky grossness come off of his filthy shirt sleeves. You understand. But don't make it go away. Don't let the sun go away. Maybe together we, we can find a way out. I'd say this kid already found a way out if you know what I mean. I pull my yellow pad of paper close to my chest and stick my pencil behind my ear. I keep a close eye on this wacko kid as I close the mythology book. Look, I gotta go talk to someone else, but this has been fun. Maybe I'll see you here again, here being nowhere. I tuck the book onto a nearby shelf. That's not where I got it from and I'm not supposed to do that, but I just really want to get out of here and away from the fruitcake and the crusty hoodie. As I walk backward down the aisle toward where the reference desk and the card catalogs are, the boy watches me quietly and his smile uncurls back into a straight line. If you get out without me, tell Pasture that Ambrose says hello. Ambrose Vickers. You tell him I didn't run away. He starts wiping at his eyes with his crusty sleeve. Tell him I'm still here, but please, please don't go without me. Once I'm far enough away, I turn and sprint to the checkout desk. There's a librarian there, Sean. We know each other. I like books about earthquakes, and he likes nose rings and red striped shirts that make him look like Waldo. What's the rush, Lily? He asks me. Did you find what you were looking for? Can I have a day without weird stuff happening? Just one day, please? I lean against the counter to catch my breath. The weird kid is nowhere to be seen. I think there's a teenage hobo living in your history section. Sean pushes his glasses back into place and looks in the direction I came from. Did somebody give you trouble? No, just wanted to make sure you knew there's someone else in the library besides me. You know, in case you close up early or something. I don't know if they could even do that, close up early. I think they're required to be open at certain times. Does it matter? There's a snot-covered boy hiding by the 201 books, and he may not be all there. And he knew Pasher. It takes me an hour to get home, because I was halfway there when I realized I left my backpack at the library and had to go back and get it. No sign of the weird boy, arm bone or whatever. Thank goodness. Also, I stopped by the bridge over the Dog River and played poo sticks. That's where you toss a stick in the river on one side of the bridge, and then watch for it to come out the other side. You're supposed to play it with other people, so I just tossed in a bunch of sticks and placed bets with myself on which one I thought would appear first. And wouldn't you know it, I won. Once I'm finally home, I walk in the door and Pasher is sitting in the dining room table with a note from Dad about dinner. This has become the new normal, as they say. That means it wasn't normal before, but now you treat it like it is, even though it isn't. I hate the new normal. I would like to go back to the old normal. Old normal didn't have weird, smelly kids coming up to me at the library and babbling about... Ugh, I don't even know what. Pasher asks me about what happened at the library. He can tell by my expression that I've got something I need to talk about. There is this gross boy at the library. I stare at Pasher and try to read his expression, but I don't know why I'm bothering because his face is made of plastic and it never changes. He said to tell you hello. You told him about me? Pasher asks. No, he knew you. Not like Felix, who knew of you because of his angel Raziel. This boy knew you like he knew knew you. He said his name was Angelo something. Or Andrew. Am Amber Victor? Ambrose? Pasher's voice sounds uneasy. Not scared like when he talks about Samuel, just sort of like he's wary about saying the name. Ambrose Vickers? That sounds right. I drop my backpack and get out my yellow pad of paper to check to see if I wrote it down. There's nothing but doodles on it. I'm not sure if this is a successful visit to the library or not. Felix will probably look at my notes and make me go back and read more. 
I can't believe I'm taking notes on mythology for the weasel. Old normal, where are you? Ambrose Vickers can't be alive. Well, what can I tell you? I shrug. This is the new normal, remember? Oh, wait, that's right. You don't remember. This is the old normal to you. No, Lily, this is not normal in any way. But maybe it makes sense if the things you say are happening to you really are happening. Ambrose Vickers disappeared over 400 years ago. He did not die. He simply vanished. You know, looking at it in better light, this is a really good pigopotamus. I should make a book full of imaginary animals. I wonder if I could create my own mythology. Lily, focus. Hasher sounds annoyed. Sorry, I put the pad of paper down. Oh, that is a good pigopotamus. I blush. It's nice that he noticed. Pasher continues what he was talking about. Ambrose was the youngest person we'd ever... recruited, you could say, before you. It was a really difficult time back then. What was that, Pilgrim Days? I ask. Did they even have plastic dolls back in Pilgrim Days? My totem was made out of a corn husk. Pasher chuckles. I visualize Pasher with a corn cob head and I laugh. <laughs> it feels good to laugh. I don't think I've laughed since I found out my mom was suddenly dead. Oh, I shouldn't have thought about that. Why did I do that? I stop laughing and look at my feet. They remind me of standing in front of her grave, so I cry a little. Just a little. Sorry, Lily, Pasher says. Listen, Ambrose and his mother and almost everyone they knew, they simply vanished without a trace. No death, though disease and other bad things happened a lot back then. We would have known if they died. They didn't. They just ceased to exist. One moment he was there, the next he wasn't, and then she wasn't, and then they weren't. We never found out what happened. Believe me, we investigated. Several of us even crossed the veil to look into things firsthand. You mean you were there? On Earth? In the flesh? I wonder what Pasher looks like. Does he look human? Maybe he looks like a cricket with a top hat like the one in Pinocchio. Yes. Because Ambrose was my connection, I came over, as did Duma, because, of course, if they were dead, he would know. With us was Zafkio and Metatron, neither of whom you've met. They were mostly there to observe and report. Observe and report what? The Lost Colony. Over a hundred people gone without a trace. You say you saw Ambrose at the library? Yeah, he was wearing a hoodie covered with snot and had Velcro sneakers. Did they have Velcro and snot 400 years ago? I become suddenly very aware of my own habit of wiping my nose on my arm when it's runny. I should stop doing that. Pasher puts on his bossy voice. Take me to the library. But it's almost dinner time and I haven't even read this note that my dad left. Lily, Pasher interrupts. If Ambrose is truly here, we need to know where he's been all this time. And more importantly, is he here as a harbinger of another vanishing? I don't know what that means, but it sounds bad. I grab Hasher and stuff him in my backpack so his head is sticking out. He likes to see as we go. When I was little, I didn't listen as well and I just stick him in my backpack and he always complained when I got where I was going and pulled him out. There's little snack bags of pretzels in the cupboard, so I grab one to munch on along the way. I wish they had more salt. A pretzel's not a pretzel if you don't salt it. Also, a pretzel's not a pretzel if you don't nod it. Just as I turn to go, there's a knock at the door. Why didn't they just use the doorbell? I like the doorbell, it sounds jingly. Knocking on the door is startling. I peek out the mailbox slot, but all I see are someone's legs in brown pants. Well, that's no help. Lily? Oh, it's Felix. He must have come by to find out what I learned at the library. I unlock the door and open it. Felix is standing on the porch in regular clothes. I'm still blown away at him with combed hair and glasses and dressed like he's a professional with a job and not some weirdo stalker guy you'd expect to see crouching behind a garbage can in a dark alley. Of course, I don't say that because it would be rude. 
Pasha knows I'm thinking it though, which means uh, Felix probably knows I'm thinking it too, since that's his thing. Sorry, Dr. Clay, I tell him, figuring he knows what I was just thinking. He ignores it. Lily, I hope you don't mind me coming by. Is your father home? Yeah, I lie, because you should never admit that you're home alone, especially to a weasel who tries to murder people. But this isn't that person, this is a therapist. This is my therapist. I don't know if it's wrong to lie to him. You're lying, he says matter-of-factly. Oh, right, he can just see that. I look at the porch floor. We got a squeaky board with a loose nail, and I always step on it without thinking. Felix steps back, giving me a bit of breathing room. It doesn't matter. I'm not here to see him. I need to show you something important. Have you done your research that I suggested yet? Yeah, I was actually on my way back to the library because I stop. Do I want to tell him about Ambrose? Oh, right, it doesn't matter because if I don't tell him, it's a secret and he knows it anyway. As if to emphasize the point, Felix stares through me for a second and then simply says, You've met someone. Yeah, um, I've got to go find him. It's kind of important. Okay, we'll go together. I can give you a ride. He pulls out his car keys and jangles them in front of me. He's actually got a lot of keys on his keychain. Car, office, house, I assume. Maybe an apartment. What are all the other keys for? Adults keep lots of keys. When I grow up, I'm going to have just two keys. That's all I think I'll need. We should just walk there, says Pasher. But Felix takes my backpack and tosses it in the open window to the passenger seat. Well, I guess that's decided then. My legs are tired of walking anyway. I've already walked there, then halfway back, then back back, and then all the way back home again. Felix's car is black and shiny. He must get it cleaned regularly because it smells like it just got picked up from the dealership. I climb in the back because I'm not old enough to ride in the front seat yet. Felix seems baffled by this at first. He looks around before getting in the car like he's not sure where I went. I wave at him so he'll see me, but he doesn't wave back. He just gets in, buckles his seatbelt, as you always should, and starts the car and drives off. I think I see a silhouette in the window of Jamal's house. I wonder if he was watching. I hope I don't worry him, getting in some stranger's car and letting them drive me away. Getting a ride to the library should cut my travel time down to just minutes. That is, if we're going in the right direction. We are going the wrong way, Dr. Clay. I see him look back at me in the rearview mirror. I know, honey, but I need you to meet my son, Joseph. Joseph? The boy from Felix's locket. The one Meredith accidentally killed in a fire, which set off the whole disaster last year. But that was, of course, in the old normal, not this new normal where Felix isn't a magician and a nut job. Why do I need to meet Joseph? I ask. Felix sits there, driving quietly. I can hear other cars rush by. I don't know where we are anymore. I've never been to this area. I don't think we're even in the same town. It didn't occur to me that Felix might not live nearby. In the old normal, I'd say that was a good thing. Maybe he lives near Meredith. I wonder if there even is a Meredith in this new normal. Several minutes go by. Dr. Clay, why am I meeting Joseph? I repeat. Because I need you to understand why I can't let you face Hecate. What? But you said you were going to help me. Dang it, why did I get in the car with the weasel? I am so, so stupid. I should have just walked like Pasher suggested. I am going to help you, Lily. He says with that same awful voice that tormented me last year. I realize now that it was always there. I just ignored it because he was clean cut and dressed nice and didn't look like a greasy strangler. I'm going to help you understand that things now are better this way. His hands are shaking on the steering wheel. Maybe he's got tremors. That's a thing my nana had. Her hands used to shake so bad she couldn't hold a teacup without wearing it. He starts sounding more manic and frustrated. I've seen the reality you knew. I've seen what I am there. I know what you think of me. But more importantly, I know what happens to my Joseph. Your mother is gone, Lily. She's not coming back. But my Joseph is here. He's alive. And if I help you, he won't be. He'll die horribly. Would you really let that happen to him, knowing you could do nothing and save him? I'm sorry, Dr. Clay, but... 
Maybe there's a way I can get Hecate to make it so my mom's alive and so is Joseph. He stares at me with his weasel eyes from the rearview mirror. I can't risk that. Well, introducing me to Joseph isn't going to change my mind. He turns the car off the road we're on and onto one that's not as well paved. The ride turns bumpy and I'm getting tossed up and down, kind of like when I'm riding the bus. I want to throw my hands up and yell, Wee! But I'm just not feeling the wee full at the moment. I thought that might be the case, Felix says. He isn't looking at me anymore. He's staring straight ahead and focused on the road. Or maybe he can't look at me. That's why I rented this car. Pasher looks at me from the backpack in the front seat. Lily, he says. When the car slows down, pull the handle and run. As if he can hear him, Felix turns and looks at the doll. Of course he can't hear him, but the moment Pasher tells me what to do, Felix knows what I'm planning. I hate his gift of knowing people's secrets so much. Stupid, stupid angel gift. Felix grabs Pasher and stares at him for a moment. He probably looks like I do when I'm having a conversation with... You can go now, Pasher. He snarls, then throws Pasher out the open window. I'm Lily Madwhip, and I've been here before. Not here, here, but like this... What's the word? Scenario. Where I'm sitting in the back seat of a car that Felix is behind the wheel of, looking at me from the rearview mirror. This time, he's got on glasses, but they don't hide his weasel eyes. The last time I was here, I made Felix crash the car into a tree. That wasn't fun. I don't like Felix, so making him crash into a tree doesn't sound half bad, but I'd prefer not being in the car for once when it crashes. Why am I always in car crashes? I check my seatbelt. You know, I say to Felix, we've been here before. His expression doesn't change. Does he know what I can do? He must. That's his thing, knowing stuff I don't tell him. It's kind of a pain. Because Felix has Raziel's totem, he knows anything I try to keep secret. Of course, the only way to prevent him knowing what it is is to not make it a secret. But then he knows it then, too. Ugh, I just can't win. What I can do is make things happen just by saying that they're going to happen. I can't normally do that. Pasher gives me the ability to see things before they happen, but it requires being near someone else with a totem to be able to make things happen. It's like a signal boost I get from having another totem nearby. That's how I made Felix crash last time. And I guess that's how I'm gonna have to make him crash this time. Dr. Clay? You don't want to do this, Lily. He's right. I don't want to do this. I'd really rather not be in another car accident. Last time, I broke some ribs and thought I was going to die. I ended up lying on the floor in a burning house. That reminds me. When I get out of this, I should buy myself some glow-in-the-dark stickers to put on my bedroom ceiling. I can't believe I forgot to get some. I keep wasting my allowance on art stuff. Not that it's a waste. I just really want some glow-in-the-dark stickers. What was I about to say? Oh, I was going to make him crash. Only, I don't want to now. Don't you remember, Lily? Felix asks as he looks back out the front of the car. We're on some back road I've never seen before. There's woods all around. I bet it would smell like pine if I rolled down my window. Felix continues. You were so miserable before. Was I? That sounds right. My life before was pretty lousy. Do you know what a louse is? That's like a lonely lice. Lice is actually plural. Louse is one. I imagine when someone is lousy, that means they got a lonely little louse in their hair. Or maybe it's that they're lonely, like a single louse. I felt kind of lonely. Like a little sad louse living in a head full of hair. You don't want my son Joseph to die. That's not the kind of person you are. I don't want anyone to die, of course. Not Joseph, not my mother. But my mother... She lived her life. You know that's only fair. And your father seems happier. Dad does seem happier. 
You used to be so miserable when it was just Roger dead. Wait. That's not right. Hey, you're doing that thing! Just like I can make things happen just by saying it when I'm near someone else with a totem, Weaselface Felix can make people believe things just by saying them when he's in close proximity. He's just messing with my thoughts, that rat. Lily, come on, don't be silly. He looks at me in the rearview mirror again. His eyes look black, like all black. I'm not doing anything but talking to you. Remember, Joseph deserves to live, and there's nothing to be afraid of. I wasn't really going to hurt you. Well, that's a relief. I was honestly fearful for my life. Heck, I was going to do something stupid and make him crash the car. Not that I wanted to. We both could die. I don't want anyone to die, especially not me. I mean, especially not Joseph. I want Joseph to live. Wait, wh what? Dang it, he's still doing it. I cover my ears and hum to myself to keep Felix's voice out of my brain. I gotta get my own thoughts back. Um, lollipop, lollipop, ooh, lolly, lollipop. Felix is saying something, but I can't hear him. He starts shouting it. It sounds something like, you don't want to cover ears. I can't hear you, Dr. Clay, I yell. I gotta think quick. Oh, by the way, be careful. Your rental car engine is going to explode. Smooth. And just like that, the front of the car turns into a fireball. Felix screams and shakes his steering wheel like he's trying to strangle it. We weave back and forth on the road, and for a moment, I think we're going to crash again after all. Instead, Felix slams on the brakes, throwing him forward and banging his head on the top of the steering wheel. I feel the seatbelt cut off the air to my lungs, but nothing cracks, thank goodness. I glance out the window. We've ended up sideways in the middle of the road. Felix is laying on the steering wheel, making the horn go. I need a moment to get my breath back. But just when I feel a bit of calm, the hood of the car crashes back down from the sky. I didn't even realize it was blown completely off. Holy cow. Unbuckling fast, I peek around the driver's seat. Felix is still laying on the horn like it's a pillow. There's blood coming out of his nose. I hope it got broke. I knew a kid once, Tommy Jacobs, who tried to do a trick on his skateboard and ended up taking a nosedive across the school parking lot. He broke his nose and swallowed two of his teeth. I wonder how the Tooth Fairy got those. I think if I were the Tooth Fairy and some kid swallowed teeth, I'd be like, nope, those are gone. Even if they eventually came back out, I wouldn't want them. I get out of the car. We're in the middle of the woods and the sun is almost set. The smart thing to do would be to head back the way we came, pick up pasture along the way, and keep going until I find another road or person to help me. I look over at the burning car with Felix still laying slumped in the front seat. Part of me says I should try to get him out, but you know what? I'm just going to ignore that part of me, because that's how people die in horror movies. Instead, I start running down the road hoping I'm going the right way. The car did spin around after all. Eventually, I have to catch my breath. When I look back, the car's right there, like maybe a couple hundred yards away, still burning. <laughs> I really need to get longer legs. Normally, I can run pretty good, but the seatbelt knocked the air out of my lungs. Suddenly, the driver's side door opens up with a loud creak and Felix flops out. He still seems disoriented, but I don't think that's going to last. I can't be out here on the road. He's an adult and has longer legs, and he's also really skinny, so he probably does a lot of running. The woods are dark. This is good, because it means I can hide from him pretty easily. It's also bad because... I'm scared of dark woods. I'm pretty sure dark woods are where clowns are born. On the other hand, I'm more scared of a bloody-faced weasel man with mind powers and a desire to kill me. Before Felix gets up, I scramble into the bushes. They're itchy and there's prickers on them. Something snags on my shirt and I feel it rip and dig into my arm. I don't cry. I just pull on it till it comes loose. But I think there's a thorn sticking in my skin. Maybe I can loop around and come out further down the road. Maybe I can stick close to the road and let Felix pass by and then reach the main road after him and let him stay ahead of me. Maybe. <gasps> the bushes rustle. Lily? Oh, crap. Felix is in the woods. 
I drop to the ground and crawl between two trees. It smells probably like spiders. I've never smelled spiders before, but I wager that there's probably hundreds of spiders crawling around here that I can't see and it probably smells like them. Oh, dang it, why did I think that? I cover my mouth with my hand to keep from saying anything by accident. I tend to do that when I'm panicking. Felix calls out to me. Lily, I know you're in here. It's amazing, really, this gift. It's almost like a radar. More like a sonar, I guess. I knew you were in the forest because you didn't want me to know. Just like how I know you're staying low because you don't want me to know it. From out of the darkness, his arms reach down, fingers wrap around my neck. He starts squeezing, closing off my windpipe. My head feels stuffy and swollen like it's full of blood and I can't breathe. He's choking me. He's killing me. He's... not there. I'm alone between my two trees and I gasp for air. It was something that didn't happen yet. My vision is still red from the feeling of all my blood getting trapped in my head. But I can breathe at least, and I can speak. Felix, you're going to trip and hit your head on a rock, I whisper. I hear him stumble and sputter, followed by a crash of branches and a sharp thwack like someone banging a cement duck against a porch stoop. My Aunt Hazel had a cement duck that she used for a doorstop, and I remember when I was little playing with it and trying to make it fly. It fell and broke on the front porch stoop. Felix's head makes the same sound when it hits the rock. He yells out a swear jar word I won't even say here. I'm too shaken up to really care because he was seriously close and would have strangled me in just a few seconds. I wonder if he's dead. Did I just kill him? He answers my question with a groan. Oh, you little bridge. I don't know why he calls me a bridge. He says it like it's an insult. Rather than wait for him to come to his senses, I scurry away. My best bet is to kind of move in a nonsense pattern. I guess it's not really a pattern at all. Okay, move randomly. But away. Not so random that I wind up running into Felix like a dummy. So a not-so-random nonsense pattern that's not a pattern. Actually, I've spent so much time thinking about how I'm being random that I've completely lost track of where I am. The sun is gone, and the woods are dark. Somewhere off a ways, I hear Felix crunching leaves, probably sitting up from hitting his head. Maybe I gave him a concussion. That would be awesome. You want to know something, Lily? He calls out. No, I don't want to know something. I just want to go home, you walnut. He keeps talking. There's a secret here. A big one. One you don't even realize. You were told. I think about how grown-ups like to talk in riddles when they can just stop beating around bushes and tell people things. Speaking of beating around bushes, I shove my way through the thick bushes and nearly poke my eye out on a tree branch. The last thing I need now is to lose an eye. Well, one of the last things. There are other things I'd rather lose last. Like my life. Felix calls out again, farther away this time. I'm relieved to realize I'm getting away. But he'll realize I'm getting farther away now, too. He calls out louder. You don't want to know the secret that you were already told? The secret so massive that you can run through these woods all night and all day tomorrow, and all the next and the one after that, and you'll still not get away from it? Don't say nothing, Lily. Don't say nothing. Just remind yourself you don't care. He's a wacko. Wrestling in the darkness spooks me. I shriek, but try to catch it in my mouth with my hands. It gets out anyway. It's just a squirrel or something, though. If it had been slightly bigger, I might have peed a little. Just a little. The shriek that escaped must have reached Felix's ears because I hear crunching of needles and leaves from his shoes as he moves in my direction. I hug the ground again. It probably thinks I'm real touchy-feely by now. Mom always said Dad wasn't really touchy-feely because he doesn't hug all that much. I wish the ground was my dad. I still haven't seen any clowns, so it must not be mating season. 
I never thought I was capable of doing something like this, you know. Felix is close again. I think he's on the other side of that row of bushes I shoved through. I've never hurt anyone. It has always been my life's mission to help people, but you... You showed me what it feels like to lose something precious to you. In the same instant you told me about what it was like to lose your mother, I felt the pain of losing Joseph. To a fire, Lily. Can you imagine what it would be like to witness that? Because I can, thanks to you. I've dreamed it the past several nights. Why did I ever think that talking to the weasel was a good idea? Maybe I really am crazy. Or just stupid. I'd rather be crazy. Stupid people can be sane, but still do stupid things. Crazy people can be smart, and they could still do smart things, even if they do it because they're crazy and it seems stupid. Felix laughs. <laughs> Your brain is such a jumbled mess. It almost hurts to try to root through a second's worth of your thoughts, you know that? I'm lying on the forest floor, hugging the leaves in the dirt, listening to this loony tune insult my brain when he's the one calling people bridges for some reason. I flip over and look up towards the sky, but there's nothing to see but treetops. I think that's called a canopy. We learned that word last year in fifth grade. It was on a spelling test. C-A-N-O-P-Y. Canopy. There's lights coming through the canopy. Stars, maybe? No, they're, they're getting brighter. Oh, crap. Is it a falling airplane? Am I about to get crushed out of nowhere by a jet out of the sky? The lights are getting brighter, flooding my vision. No, there are car's headlights. W what's a car doing up there in the forest canopy? The lights vanish, leaving a reminder of them burned into my eyes. It takes a minute to be able to see anything again. Everything's kind of red and hazy. It was another thing that hasn't happened yet. What was it? Was I staring down the headlights of a car? Felix has not stopped talking this entire time. I zoned out and wasn't listening, but I can hear him closer now. It's funny, I'm... I'm actually looking forward to something. I can't remember the last time I ever had something to look forward to. I've lived this life, I think, and always did things because they made sense. But I never looked forward to anything, really. Or maybe that's the nature of this new world. Maybe I don't remember feeling that way because I didn't exist like this before. Yep, he's still nuts. On the other hand, maybe he's trying to talk me to death. I don't know, is that possible? All the crazy nonsense he's spewing, I don't understand any of it. Maybe that's the idea. Maybe my eyes are supposed to roll so far back in my head that I can look down my own brain and just die. Do you want to know what it is I'm looking forward to, Lily? Branches crack as he moves toward me. I sit up and scramble in the other direction. There's a hint of moonlight reflecting off something through the bushes ahead, and I realize I found the road again. At the same time, Felix's footsteps shuffle like he's maneuvering around a tree and starts coming towards me fast and with determination. Oh crud, I think he sees the road too. His voice is right behind me. I turn and look and he's right there. I'm looking forward to watching those lovely brown eyes of yours as I choke the life out of you. He hisses like a snake, even sticking his tongue out a little bit. Time to get up and sprint, Lily. I'm not a fast runner, but I got what my P.E. teacher calls a lot of stamina. That means I can run for a long time. But it's only good if I run slow. This is not a slow run. This is a sprint run. This is a terror run. This is a... There's a man behind me with broken glasses and blood running down his forehead, and he's going to kill me run. After my rest on the ground, I got my lungs back, and they're ready for a good breathing session. But they're still not going to last for more than a couple minutes. Felix is no slouch, either. He's wobbly from hitting his head on the rock, but he's got longer legs and he's a grown-up. Just trotting after me at an easy pace, he's catching up. I scream in the hopes that someone might hear me. The road is empty and dark except for the moon. The forest is emptier and darker. All I hear is my own breathing, my shoes on the road, 
and Felix is panting and shoes clopping as he catches up. I'm sorry, Lily, he yells. No, you're not! I have to do this for Joseph! He's just seconds behind me. I don't look back because that's when you trip and then the person behind you is on top of you. I can't think. I scream again. If, if you don't stop, you're going to get killed. The light appears again, faster than when I was laying on the forest floor. It quickly fills my vision and all I see is a yellowish white blinding light. It's a car coming fast around a curve. I duck into a little ball, curling up, putting my hands on my head so I look like a pill bug. Pill bugs know what they're doing. It's funny how pill bugs are kind of gross when they're out on their own. But when they curl up into a little ball, they're adorable. I wonder if I look adorable curled up in a pill bug ball on the car's headlights in the middle of the dark road. The answer must be yes, because I hear the car's tires screech as it tries to avoid hitting me. Or its brakes. I guess it's the screeching of the car's brakes on the tires. Anyways, they're screeching and I feel the wind of the car as it blows past me, probably by inches. Like if you took a ruler and tried to measure how close the car was to hitting me? Well, you'd probably die because you'd be in the way of the car. But I wouldn't because the car was inches away. Felix is in the way of the car. I don't see it because I'm curled up in my pill bug ball, but I hear the loud metal bang as the car meets Felix. He makes a sound like whoop! And then goes silent, and a moment later I hear something land in the bushes just off the side of the road. I peek out of my pill bug ball. The car has spun completely around and is facing back the way it came from. Felix is nowhere in sight. Oh no wait, there's his leg sticking up from a bush like something out of a cartoon. Felix? I call out to him. Are you dead? He doesn't respond. That could be a yes. Jeez, I think I just killed him. He totally deserved it. But it makes my tummy gurgle unhappily to think that I did it again. I killed Felix just like I killed... Roger? What? That's who steps out of the car. My dead brother, Roger. He doesn't look dead, though. He's got on a sleeveless t-shirt that says Grave Digger and has a purple cartoon skull on it. And pants with so many rips and holes in them that they're more like 30% pants. His hair has gotten longer, I think. And good lord, has he grown a beard? More like a puff of a beard. It's clearly him, though. By Crom, you have royally screwed the pooch here, Lily. He says as if we're at home and I'd spilled cereal and milk all over the kitchen floor. Roger! I want to run and hug him, so I do. He holds me back at arm's length. He smells like peppercorn and dryer sheets. How are you not dead? I thought you were still dead. This is my new gig, ass face. Same old Roger. You drive cars down empty forest roads at night? He snorts. <laughs> no, I'm keeping tabs on you for Hecate until the end. I told you I switched pantheons. I remember. He was dead and talking to me through a kid he'd possessed on the school bus at the time. But you don't really forget stuff like that. But why? She's trying to tear my life apart. She changed the past, killed mom, started all of this. No, she didn't, dummy. Roger glances over at Felix's legs sticking out of the bushes. You made all this. I stare at him, because I'm really hoping he explains what the hell is going on around here. It would be nice to not play Scooby-Doo Mysteries trying to figure out who to trust, what to do, how to fight Hecate, why there's a weird boy living in the library who knows Pasher. Obviously, I can't tell you everything because I don't know everything. I'm not some mystical to beaten monk now with infinite knowledge, but here's what I can tell you. And can I just say that it's hilarious that I'm having to explain it to you, of all people, because mom and dad always thought you were the smart one? Can you tell me in the car? I ask. I don't want to be here with Felix dead in the bushes over there. What if he comes back to life and bites into our fleshy heads to get our brains? I've seen movies. This is what always happens. The bad guy is never fully dead. Or if he is, he comes back anyway. Roger looks over at dead Felix's legs again and shrugs. 
Hop in, squirt. I climb in the back of Roger's car. The inside of it smells like Roger's room used to smell. Like barbecue potato chips that got left laying out with the bag open and overcooked steakums. Some things never change. I wonder if the inside of Roger's coffin smells like this, too. Roger climbs in, starts the car, and backs up carefully. Who knew he could drive? You're honestly really lucky I came after you when I did. He says, not looking at me. I had been rather enjoying the view of Destiny Winter's bedroom from the treehouse Dad is building in the backyard, and then I got summoned in to go in and get you out of this fix. There's no treehouse in the backyard, I tell him. I don't see what's so special about seeing in someone else's bedroom either. This is the real world, moron. You knew Dad was working on something back there. I blink. Roger gives me another smirk before turning back around and driving away from Felix's lovely new home in the woods. This is what I'm talking about, Lily. You screw in the pooch. Hecate throws you into the void to test you, and what do you do? You make the shitty version of reality where you're even more miserable and then we're just about to get yourself killed. I'm still in the veil? I feel someone's pulled a chain in the dark depths of my brain and there's a light bulb flickering to life. It takes me a moment to realize we're not going anywhere. Roger has pulled the car over to the side of the road. He's looking in the rearview mirror at me. And I feel a bit of similarity to just a half hour ago or so when it was Felix looking at me from a different rearview mirror. I'm still churning this new information through my brain. Why have we stopped? I ask. He gestures out the window. I see a familiar looking doll laying in the high grass just off the embankment. Pasher! Pasher doesn't respond. Pasher? I say his name again. He remains quiet. You're starting to understand. He leans across the front and opens the glove compartment, pulling out a tube of lip balm. Nice, wild cherry. Roger always used to get chap lips because he was always licking them. Mom said he had some sort of dry mouth disorder. They probably spent more money on lip balm than on ripped shirts and jeans. Roger holds the tube up. You see, Squirt, in the void, you control the horizontal and the vertical. It's like one of your artsy-fartsy painting canvases. You make what you want. I want a wild cherry lip moisturizer and voila! There it is. Your friendly neighborhood psycho Felix was practically spelling it out for you. I'm, s I'm still in the veil? My brain feels tumble-dried. Roger sighs heavily. <sighs> You're denser than a bag of bricks. So, when Hecate threw me into the nothing, she expected this? Of course she did. This was your test, to see if you're worthy. I stare at Pasher lying quietly out in the grass. I think his name again. Nothing. Worthy of what? Succession. I don't know what a suck session is. Sounds kind of gross. Roger nods towards the window. Are you going to grab the doll or not? I look at Pasher. Is it the real Pasher? Now you're getting it. Roger smiles at me with a genuine looking smile for the first time in forever. He turns back toward the front of the car, shifts it into D and starts going down the road again. Succession means you take over. Hecate is waiting for you to prove you have what it takes to take the wheel. Think of it like this. Hecate is holding the reins to a horse called the Veil, and is waiting for you to prove you know how to ride before she hands them over to you. Get it? I don't get it. Sure. I lie. So let's get you home. He says as the car finally reached the main road again. There are no other cars out. Maybe I stopped making them exist. And then you've got one more chance to make this place somewhere you want to live. Stop killing mom and dad. Stop torturing yourself with people wanting to murder or hurt you. Hecate's not going to give the veil to someone who makes it into something out of Hellraiser. I don't want to live in the veil. I want to go home. Real home. I feel like crying for real, but I don't do it because that always just made Roger angry. I think he could tell by looking at me that I'm keeping my tears in because he glares at me in the mirror. Listen, ass face. 
I took the steel to get you set on the right path and to keep me out of that lousy pine box stuck in my rotting corpse shell until who knows when. Don't blow this for me. Pasher, are you out there? Can you hear me through the walls of the veil? If I haven't been with you all this time, do you know that I'm missing? Ono said that time works different here. What if I find a way out only to discover that decades have gone by, and my parents have given me up as a runaway or kidnapped? Will the angels give ownership of my totem to someone else like they must have done to Ambrose? How long has he been trapped here that all those centuries have gone by out in the real world? I need to get out of here. Hey, Dad? It's me, Lily. I've come home. You call? Nobody responds. I guess technically I'm not really home. It looks like home, sort of. Definitely smells like home in that I bought 50 air fresheners to mask the odor of dead people we stashed in the basement kind of way. But it's not real. None of it. I'm still in the veil. I should have known I never left it. I came in through a tunnel in the nurse's closet, as weird as it is to say that. He didn't go out that way. So stupid. Dad, I'm home and I brought Roger. Still nothing. I cut my hands over my mouth like a megaphone. Dad, Roger ran over my therapist, your son Roger, who died. Technically, he bounced off the side of the car, Roger says. Like, it really makes a difference whether Felix went under the wheels or into the woods. The house seems to be empty. Not even Pasher is here, as weird as it feels to think that. I left him in the road because it wasn't really him. He's still on the other side of the closet door, probably wondering why I haven't come back from school in several days. I go in the kitchen to get a snack, because almost being murdered by Felix made me hungry. He wasn't really Felix, though. I'm still trying to understand it all, but from what Roger told me, I made this version of Felix in my brain in order to play a role in my imaginary life here. I wonder if my brain is secretly out to get me if that's the kind of stuff it pulls without me even thinking about it. The kitchen doesn't smell like the rest of the house. It smells more like food, usually. Except now. Now it smells like a dog. Probably because there's a black dog sitting in the kitchen. It's staring at me with big black eyes. I know this dog. It's the one that was following me in the real world before everything started. The dog stares at me. I know how to play this game. I stare back at it. You don't try to pet strange dogs, especially magic dogs, and I'm pretty sure this is a magic dog. Good doggy, I tell it. I put out my hand for it to sniff. But the dog doesn't sniff my hand. Instead, it reaches out with its paw and slaps my hand away. Is she ready? The dog asks in a woman's voice. Not for a bit, Roger says. He's standing in the kitchen doorway behind me, leaning against it and picking his teeth with a toothpick. The dog lifts up onto its hind legs and stretches its front paws upward. For a moment, I think it's going to turn into a werewolf. Instead, it shakes itself like one does after it's gotten a bath. I don't know how dogs dry themselves by shaking like that. I tried it when I was little, but afterward I was still wet and the bathroom had water everywhere. It really annoyed Mom. And it made me kind of dizzy. The dog doesn't spray water everywhere because it's not wet. Instead, it sprays the fur right off itself like a porcupine with its quills. The fur goes everywhere. I even breathe in some of it and end up coughing and spitting. Stupid dog just tried to choke me on its fur bomb. Bad doggy! I snap at it. I wave my arms to try to fan the cloud of fur away. The dog isn't there anymore, though. Instead, there's a pale lady in mummy wrappings and a rope belt standing in my kitchen. I recognize her immediately. Oh no. That's right. Ono says. She's still got the black eyes the dog had. I was fine having a staring contest with the dog, but the same eyes on her is too creepy, so I just look around the kitchen instead. Look at this! You got dog hair everywhere! 
Ono grabs me by the arm and twists it around painfully. She seems to be examining the burn mark I got from when Hecate dragged me through the halls of her maze. Hmm. <sighs> well, she'll have to do. Are you going to eat me? I ask. She looks hungry, always licking her lips. When she was a dog, I would have fed her a can of dog food. But I suspect as a human, she'd rather eat a hamburger or something. Not a lily burger, I hope. She ignores my question. You've learned nothing all this time? I have to think. I, I did learn some stuff. I was at the library for hours. I learned about harpies. I bet she's got harpies. She seems like the type of person who'd have harpies. Oh no, sputters. I don't care about harpies. Haven't you learned anything about yourself in this place? What did I learn about myself? I guess I learned what Rogers only just shared with me on the drive home after he ran over Felix. I look at Roger, and he nods at me. I think he thinks I'm thinking what he's thinking, but I'm pretty sure I'm not. I nod back, then look at Ono and puff up my chest. I control the horse's uncle. Ono blinks. I beg your pardon? And the vertigo. Roger smacks me in the back of my head. That's horizontal and vertical, stupid. Ono looks at Roger, then at me. Her mouth just kind of hangs open slightly. I don't know what that means. Neither do I. I admit. I look at Roger and nod again, but he doesn't nod back. He just puts his face in his hands. Ono scowls. She points a finger at Roger, then makes a dismissive wave. Leave us. Roger looks somewhat shocked, and then annoyed. He opens his mouth like he's about to say something, probably something rude, but then clamps it shut, turns and walks out to the living room where he stands there by the coffee table with all the books my parents never read, crosses his arms and stares at us. Ono shakes her head at him. Go outside, pleb. I've never seen my brother act like a whip dog before. Roger twitches like he just got slapped across the face, scowls at Ono, then at me, then at the world around him as he marches stiffly out the sliding glass door onto the back patio. He slams it shut behind him, turns to stare at us again briefly, and then walks out of sight. Ono turns her attention back to me. She takes a single step back and then seems to grow in size by about a foot. Maybe two feet. It's hard to measure things like that when you're small. She gets bigger, okay? Her body swells up and her eyes turn from black orms into black slits. She raises her hands toward me threateningly and each hand now has six fingers on it and the fingers are claws like on a bird's foot. Make a weapon, she hisses. Make a what? A weapon. Make a spear, a sword, anything. I want to see you do it. Otherwise... Maybe I'll pluck out one of your lovely little eyes. <clears throat> I cover my eyes and crouch down into a ball. It's my go-to defensive strategy. I study the art of the armadillo. Maybe I can grab one of the kitchen knives and the wooden block on the counter, even though Dad said I should never play with them. This isn't play though, right, Dad? This is self-defense. What are you doing? Ono towers over me. Just make something! I don't know how! Just think of it! Reaching out with one hand but keeping my eyes clenched shut so Ono can't pluck one out, I think as hard as I can. I don't want to be here. I don't want to be making swords or spears. I want to be at home, playing in my new treehouse that apparently Dad was building for me. I wish I had one here. I'd run outside and hide in my treehouse. I just need wood and nails and a hammer. Suddenly... I feel the weight of something in my hand. I risk a peek and gasp. <gasps> I made a hammer! I look up with a proud smile. But Ono looks angrier than ever. Couldn't you have made something bigger? She snarls. Her teeth have gotten longer like snake fangs, and they stick out of the sides of her mouth. A sword or spear would be too heavy for me. I guess I could make a dagger. Roger has a whole collection of daggers he bought online. Had a collection, I mean. Mom and Dad sold it after he died. The collection was worth a lot. I wonder if it annoyed him to lose them. 
He always carried one on him that was called a switchblade. It looked like just a handle, but if you press a button, the dagger part pops out. Suddenly, Ono lunges. Her mouth tears open at the seams and another row of fangs comes jabbing out of her gums. I shriek and swing the hammer like her head is a nail and end up smacking her right above the nose between her eye slits. Her head snaps forward and she goes down on her hands and knees. When she looks up again, there's a deep red mark in the middle of her face now. Oh gosh, I'm sorry, I tell her. I, I, I thought you were going to eat me. One of Ono's hands comes up fast and grabs my hammer-wielding arm by the wrist. She shakes it hard until I lose my grip and the hammer falls on the floor with a clatter. Her other hand reaches out and grabs my other wrist. Then a third arm pops out with a ripping sound from under her right one and a fourth one from under the left, and she's standing up slowly, pulling my arms up over my head. Do you think this is a game, little girl? Do you know what my mother is going to do to you? Let me go? It's a guess, but also a request. Ono clenches her fists on the two new arms. She's going to tear you apart. Don't you want that? I stutter. I mean, she's the freaking boogie woman. She brought me here to die because I broke the place, right? It feels right now like she's about to do just that. She's pulling just enough to make it hurt, but not enough to tear my arms right off. She probably could, though. But she doesn't rip my arms off. Ono lets go of them and turns away, shaking all four of her six-fingered talon fists in the air. No! She cries. I want to be rid of her! I hate her! You hate your mommy? I can't imagine hating my mom, and mine makes me eat spinach. Does she make you eat spinach? I ask. Ono seems to melt. She's taking on a different form. I hope it's the doggy again, because she was a lot less scary as a dog. She doesn't become a dog. Instead, she becomes smaller, smaller, almost as small as me. When she's done, she looks a lot younger. She looks younger by a lot. If she weren't wearing mummy wrappings and a rope belt, I might mistake her for one of the high school kids that ride the bus with me. Her face looks somewhat older, with lots of worry wrinkles, as my mom calls them. There's also a big, long scar running from her right ear to the corner of her mouth that almost makes it look like she's smiling. Except her eyes say she's sad. She's not my real mother. Ono says. I was just the first. The first one after her who was like you. I came here by accident, and she tested me like she's testing you. Like she tests them all. I was the first she tested. And the first who failed. I suddenly feel bad for her. She may have almost pulled my arms out, but... No, that that's pretty awful. The feeling bad for her goes away again. I wonder if this is what she actually looks like, or another illusion. It's probably rude to ask. Same for asking her age, but I think she's about 16 going on a thousand. After me was Lamia, who became my sister. She tears each of us down and then remakes us in whatever way amuses her. There are tears in her eyes. She probably could use a hug. I doubt anybody's hugged her since before I was born. Hell, since before my mom was born, or my mom's mom, Nana. But that's another thing you don't just do to strangers. Besides, it might be a trap. It seems like you're able to remake yourself. I say, waving at her new form. Why don't you just leave? You're able to leave. I can't leave. Ono says sadly. Not permanently. I've been here so long that... It's like a tether. The void pulls me back. You'll see what I mean once you've been here long enough. I hope not! I don't actually say that, but I think it's so loud I have a hard time telling if I think it or say it. I have no plans on staying here. I have a mommy and daddy of my own to get back to. Why don't you and your sister just team up and fight her? Ono pulls out one of the chairs at the kitchen table and sits down at it. She pulls her feet up and hugs them to her chest. Lamia is completely devoted to mother. To her. And she can't change herself like I can. She's stuck. 
she stuck in the form she gave her. I can't imagine having a snake for a butt. If I did, I'd probably go crazy too. And at least snake butt, as ugly as she is, didn't almost tear my arms out. So for snake butt, I will continue to feel bad. How am I supposed to fight her like this? I ask. I can't even beat you. I'm only ten years old. And this is stupid. You have the gift of foresight. Ona waves her hand at me like my dad does when I try to show him one of my paintings and he's too busy working on a dirge to look at it. With that, your strength of will, and the power of this place, you should be nigh unbeatable. I'm not Superman, I'm ten years old! Why doesn't anybody get this? You tore a hole in the veil bigger than any I've ever seen. She sticks her hands out like she's trying to show me the size of the hole, but her arms aren't long enough. I saw the hole, and she'd have to grow arms five times as long as her body to really show how big it was. That wasn't me! I bend over and pick up the hammer off the floor. I wave it at Ono in a stern manner, just like my fifth grade teacher Mrs. Carter Dogbill always used to do with pieces of chalk when kids weren't listening. That was Samuel. He's an angel who apparently doesn't care about rules. He's like doctors without borders if the doctors were evil and the borders were the universe. Ono doesn't say anything. She just sits and looks at me and my dangerous hammer. People keep telling me I'm a knife who cuts the veil, but that's nonsense. I just see things before they happen, and the only reason I can do that is because of Pasher. And he's not here. And the longer I stay here, the more likely he's going to leave and go find someone new, just like the angels did with Ambrose Vickers. Suddenly, I get a glimpse of an idea. I look out toward the living room. Roger's still outside and hasn't come back. I hope he didn't sneak around to the garage and come in through there. At this point, I don't know if I can trust him. He saved my life, but seems to be devoted to Hecate. Ono, on the other hand, isn't. And she doesn't want Roger to know that she isn't. You know what? I ask Ono. I do have something she doesn't. I tap my chin, but not with the hand holding the hammer, because then I'd be bashing myself in the face. You got doors in that maze that go everywhere? It takes Ono a moment to understand the question. She shrugs. The labyrinth that grants me access to almost any place. Muth Hecate has been building it piece by piece for centuries. Any enclosed space with a door, like your bedroom closet or a basement with no windows, it's connected to. And can anyone come in if you open the way? What do you mean? I mean, like, was I only able to come here because of my gift, or can any normal person come through? Please say yes, I cross my fingers. Ono nods and licks her lips. It's weird to see the same tick she had in grown-up form on this young girl. Of course. We've taken people here since as far back as I can remember. She doesn't say it, but I suspect that the rest of that sentence was to eat them. I bite my lip. Then I think I got an idea, but I need you to do something for me. I've already done more than I should have. Mother would split me from top to bottom and spread my entrails out across the entirety of the labyrinth if she knew even a fraction of what I've told you. That's awful. Thank you for sharing that. She shrugs. If you want her gone, I just need one little... Okay, one big favor... Ono stands up and brushes the wrinkles out of her mummy wrappings. It doesn't really do much. I think she just does it out of habit. She tosses her hair back and puts her hands on her hips. Is she trying to look dramatic? This, this isn't a dramatic moment. You better know what you're doing. I don't. I take a deep breath. And if this gets other people killed, I'm going to feel really bad about it, but... I think it might work... It's got to count for something. We spend several minutes talking about my plan. I don't give Ono the specifics of how everything falls into place, because for one thing, if Scooby-Doo taught me two things, one is that the monsters are just people wearing masks, and the other is that plans never go the way you want them to. Also, dogs will brave anything for a biscuit. I still don't fully trust her either, 
She's been at this for so long that she may very well have the whole I'm your ally, oops, I stab you in the back, tee hee, thing down pat. All I tell Ono is what I want her to do and how she's going to be able to do it. We gotta hurry before Roger comes back, I say when we finish. She nods and then closes her eyes and starts to melt. Her shape grows slightly smaller and thinner, twists over itself, then back like some human flapjack trying to eat itself. After another minute, I find myself looking at my mirror reflection, except it's not my mirror reflection because that's reversed. And this isn't reversed. It's a little weird to feel like you're looking into a mirror, but everything is the opposite from what it should be. You're gonna want to get some clothes from my bedroom, I tell my new clone. Ono as me looks down at her mummy wrappings and rope belt. You don't think these will do? She asks in her own voice. She's being sarcastic, of course. Maybe she and Roger will get married someday. You won't fool anyone, I say shaking my head. And maybe you ought to work on my voice or stick to whispering or something because you don't sound like me at all. Ono shrugs, then peers over my shoulder. Over my actual shoulder, not her as me's shoulder. You know what I'm saying. She looks past me. I look over my own shoulder. Me, my shoulder, not Ono's shoulder. There's a shadow in the backyard that's approaching the sliding glass door. It's probably Roger. Go, quick, before Roger sees you, I tell her. And of course, watch out for anybody else. What'll you do? She asks. I have to return some library books. I'm Lily Madwhip, mother of monsters. I take Jamal's bicycle without asking and ride back downtown to the library. I don't think Jamal would mind, and besides, he's not really Jamal. I think telling him that would kind of offend him too, and I don't want to offend Jamal, even if he's not real. Who knows how this all works? The real Jamal might feel some sort of ripple of being offended. Roger follows me in his car. At one point, he rolls down the window and grins at me. Going to get that loser from Roanoke? He sneers, sneering as Roger's default expression. Maybe. Not a bad idea. Two of you's better than one, right? I don't mention that I'm planning on getting Ambrose and me both out of the veil. Roger would not be keen on that idea. He likes not being stuck in his dead body anymore. Maybe if I leave, he can stay and do... whatever it is people do here besides kidnapping children and torturing them. I honestly don't know what the purpose of this place is besides being a wall between life and death. But I guess being a wall is a purpose enough, right? Nobody complains that walls don't also do other things. Roger spots the town liquor store. It's called Benny's Beers, Bullets, and Banjos because they sell alcohol, guns, and musical instruments. I'm not even kidding. That's all they sell. And even if you just want to go in and buy a set of drumsticks, you can't go in without a parent because of the booze and firearms. And I don't think the owner's name is Benny either. I'm going to grab some brewskis for the big show, Roger says, and then veers off with a screech of tires into the liquor store parking lot. If I knew how to control it better, I'd make that stupid store disappear with him in it. Instead, I keep pedaling towards the library. At one point, an ambulance speeds by with its lights and siren on. It spooks me, reminding me of my similar moment from last year that led to a run-in with Felix. I wonder if my subconscious made that ambulance go by just to scare me. After all, sometimes I scare myself for no good reason. I wish I had better control of my subconscious. Sean the librarian is standing outside of the library building, just looking in through the windows like someone does when they're window shopping down at the strip mall. He's even got his face pressed up against the glass, just like me when I'm visiting the pet shop. Of course, the last time I visited the pet shop at the mall, all the poor little animals died. But that wasn't my fault. I just don't go visiting the pet shop anymore because of it. It looks like it's dark inside the library. I walk up to him and stand next to him for a while, also looking into the dark library. 
Why aren't you in the library? I finally ask. Sean screeches and jumps away, clutching his chest. Jeez, Lily, don't do that. All I did was ask him a question. I think it's a fair question, too, since he's a librarian. He's supposed to be inside the library. It's the middle of the day and the library's supposed to be open. He might be a bit confused, though, because it was technically going on nightfall about a half an hour ago, but I realized that the library would be closed at night, so I made it daytime. I didn't really think about whether that would muck with anyone's sleep. Hm, at least Sean got the memo. Is the library closed or on fire? I ask. It doesn't look like it's on fire. I breathe on the glass and draw a smiley face. Sean puts his hand on his forehead to look in through the glass. There's something weird going on inside, he says. I've already called the police. I look in through the glass, too. There's lots of shelves full of books. That's not really weird. I guess the trees that have grown up through the floor and made some of the shelves tip over and spill all their books is weird, though. I don't know. I'm not a tree scientist. Hmm, are you growing something? I ask Sean. Sean looks at me like I grew another head. I check. Whew, I have not grown another head. Trees don't just up and grow overnight. Someone must have broke in and planted them somehow. But I can't figure out how because the door was still locked when I got here and there's no sign of forced entry. I mean, besides this, is just impossible. It's impossible. Can I go in? I need to see if Ambrose is still in there. Last I saw him was at the library, so it seemed like as good a place as any to start looking. Mom always said if you lose something, start with the last place you remember seeing it. I didn't lose Ambrose. I just went home and as far as I know, he stayed at the library. On the other hand, that was a day ago. Maybe two, now that I made it become day again. I don't really know what day it is anymore. I wouldn't if I were you, Sean says, pressing his nose up against the glass real close. I heard something that sounded like a mountain lion inside. I got out immediately and phoned the cops. Also, you may not have noticed, but there seems to be a forest sprouted up overnight. I don't even know what to make of this. Some sort of colossal prank? I don't know. Technically, he didn't say no. So I open the door and head inside. Sean immediately starts beating on the window and yelling my name. Lily, I told you not to go in there! No, you didn't. He says something else. Probably, Lily, don't go in there, but the door swings shut behind me and I can't hear him, so it doesn't count. The inside of the library is quiet. I don't hear a mountain lion, but maybe it's in stock mode and will pounce on me any second. The trees are all crooked and twisted. Not like regular trees, but like trees out of a cartoon brought to life. I half expect them to start throwing apples at me like they did to Dorothy in The Wizard of Oz. Or maybe they just aren't used to being indoors. Some of them even seem like they have faces. Maybe I'm just imagining things. Oh, maybe I'm just imagining things. I tend to do that. I can also hear birds chirping somewhere. Probably building nests out of the book pages or whatever it is birds do. I'm not a bird scientist either. I look back at Sean, who's still thumping on the window, and give him a wave. He doesn't wave back. The further I wander into the library, the less it looks like a library. Grass and roots have torn up through some of the carpeting. There's vines or something hanging down from the ceiling. The cleaning people are going to be so pissed. I stop at the card catalog, which appears to be growing out of the side of one of the trees like a tumor. I open the M drawer and look up Mad Whip like I always do, but there's still no books named after me. Yet. Something rustles in the bushes and it reminds me of the other night when Felix was stalking me. There better not be any psycho killers in here, I declare loudly. Sometimes I say that at bedtime in case there's one in my closet who doesn't know he's not wanted. I don't know if that actually drives them away, but it's worked so far, so why stop? The rustling stops. One less psycho killer in the library. Just past the rooms where they have microfish, which are fish so small you have to use a giant projector to look at them apparently, 
I noticed some light coming through the trees. It's not fluorescent light like the flickering lights they have here that's kind of a barf yellow and makes everything look like old people's skin. No, it's bright sunbeams like the sun makes. Maybe the roof collapsed up ahead. I should be careful. Come to think of it, I should always be careful, really. I step past a pile of books about American history and I'm not standing in the library anymore. Or maybe I am, technically, but... It's been changed. There are no walls here. No carpet except grass. I'm outside on the edge of a forest. It's pretty open past here, and I can see what looks like a big campsite surrounded with a wall of long pointy sticks. Nobody would probably complain about that wall being just a wall. The houses are made out of sticks. Just like the first piggy made that the big bad wolf blew down. And people! There's people down here, like, wandering around doing things. Grown-ups in poofy clothes and funny hats laying stuff out on the ground like they never heard of tables. They look like they're performing one of those Shakespeare plays like Romeo and Hamlet. Maybe they're like the actors at the colonial village my parents took Roger and me to once. They had to stay in character, which meant acting like they're from the times when people used cows for all the food needs like milk, butter, cheese, hamburgers, steak, and pork chops. I slip down towards the village quietly. I'm not sure who the people are or where they came from or what they're doing setting up a village in the library. Just as I near the pointy wall of sticks, I notice a little boy picking up rocks just a stone's throw away. The last place you want to be from someone carrying stones is a stone's throw away. There's a field of corn nearby, and I sneak into it, hoping the boy didn't notice me. Mother, I heard him call. There's a strange girl in the corn. Okay, so he does not Okay, so he noticed me. What girl, Robert? I peek out and see a lady standing near the boy, who is standing in my direction. From this distance, I can see them both better. And I realize that their faces look weird. They look like people from far away, but up close, their eyes and noses and mouths are all kind of skewed. Like when you take a square and stretch it into a trapezoid. Their skin is a grayish color, and they've got hair that seems to wave on their heads even though there's no wind. Just like the trees, they're like cartoon people made real. The woman spots me. Oh my, is all she says, but the strange thing is that she sounds just like her son. Her voice is like a little boy's. I get up off the dirt and walk sheepishly out of their corn. I don't know why people call it sheepish. I've seen sheep, and they never seem to be embarrassed or shy about anything. Hi. I say, waving nervously, unlike a sheep. They stare at me with crooked eyes that have no pupils. Oh, it's you. Ambrose comes over from one of the stick houses, looking weird and dirty as ever. Okay, he looks a little cleaner, just a bit. And he's wearing funny clothes now, like the rest of the people here. Though his seem to fit less comfortably. It's like he cut up a paper bag and drew buttons on it and stuck his head through. I wonder where he left those nice velcro shoes. It's me, I agree. I came to get you. You know, to take you home. Ambrose looks around at the gray people who watch me quietly. I am home. This is the library, I point out. I turn to the gray people doing their farming stuff. A bird sings as it flies by overhead, and they watch it go past the field and disappear into their forest before turning back to me. Y'all are living in the library. They shake their heads and go back to their butter churning and cow milking and hamburger making, ignoring me. Not anymore, Ambrose says. You inspired me. After you left, I thought about home. About my family. And I decided to bring everyone I knew back. I look around at the stick village and the weird Pablo Picasso people. They keep glancing at me, and I can't tell if their expressions are angry or not because their eyebrows don't ever move. There's a lady in a brown dress milking a cow, and at least the cow looks like a normal cow. 
Well, except it's got one big black circular spot on its back. Is this what people looked like where you're from? I ask Ambrose. The question seems to annoy him. He grits his teeth and clenches his fists like I used to do when I was a little kid, and I thought I could hold my breath until Mom bought me that watercolor set from the art store. Well, I, I don't remember what they look like exactly. It's been so long. I, I looked up some pictures in the books, but... Somebody grabs my arm. I turn to face a Picasso man with a scribbled-on mustache. His mouth is just a line in his face. You need to leave now. Ambrose's voice comes out of his mouth. Ambrose's voice coming out of his mouth. It's weird to hear a kid's voice coming out of the mouth of an adult, let alone an adult whose face is all messed up. I pull my arm away. Some of the man's gray skin comes off on my sleeve. I, I, I wipe at it quickly and try to get it off, but it, it just smears. Yuck! I hold my arm out to Ambrose. Look, see? This isn't real. This is even less real than the world I thought was real. The one through the trees outside the library. This is more like a nightmare. A gray, smudgy nightmare. Ambrose scowls. When he does, all the others scrunch up their faces, too. Why are you bothering us? You don't need me. Nobody needs me. I need you, says the Picasso man in Ambrose's voice. He walks over and puts his hand on Ambrose's shoulder, squeezing it and leaving a smear. We all need you here. We love you, Ambrose. You know we love you. Do you hear yourself? I ask. You, you realize that's you talking to yourself? No. This is my father. Ambrose's father nods. I put my hands on my hips and glare at them both. Oh yeah? Then what's his name? What's your name, Mr. Vickers? My name is Ambrose. The man tips his hat at me. A bunch of dust falls off the brim and pours into a pile at his feet. See? I say. He's just another you. And look! I point at the pile of dust. He's falling apart! Ambrose crosses his arms defiantly. His eye twitches a little. My father's name is also Ambrose. And he's been working the fire all day. That's just Ash. You don't know what you're talking about. Just leave me here and go away. There's a thing called reverse psychology. I've seen Bugs Bunny do it, but adults do it too. That's where you tell someone who's being argumentative the opposite of what you want so that they'll argue against it and do the actual thing that you want. My parents have pulled this crap on me way too many times, and the worst part is I fall for it every time. But I've also learned how it works. So I decide to try it on Ambrose. Fine. I don't want to deal with all this craziness. I thought I was doing you a favor. <sighs> but I'll just tell you I'm going to fight Hecate and get out of the veil to the real world. You can just stay here and live in your little imaginary village with your imaginary people. Ambrose explodes. Not literally explodes, but like the angry kind of explosion like Roger used to do when he was alive. I guess he probably still explodes with anger as a dead person. I don't know. Anyway, it's that type of explosion where a person goes from normal to red-faced and their eyes are bugging out a bit and all the words that come out of your mouth are surfing on waves of spit. Don't call them imaginary! He shouts at me. A huge flock of birds squawks out of the forest in surprise because he's so loud. The ground shakes, too. And several of the gray people, the imaginary gray people, grasp and grab whatever's close by for support. An arm snakes around my neck. Not to insult snakes, but they do tend to go for necks. The arm belongs to Ambrose Sr., who uses it to put me in a chokehold just like my dad's favorite wrestler, Rowdy Roddy Piper. I didn't even think they knew how to do the chokehold back in whenever it was the Ambroses are from. I want to say as much, but I can't speak because his arm is big and he's tightening it around my neck. I try to tap out instead, but Ambrose Sr. apparently doesn't know that one. My son told you to go. 
Mr. Ambrose Vickers says through his teeth in Ambrose Jr.'s voice. You should have done what he said. I grab his arm with both hands and try to pull it off my neck, but I can't. The other people in the village move closer, some picking up tools like a hammer and one of those crop thingies that tills soil. I can never remember what they're called. Ambrose watches his father lift me off the ground so I'm dangling from his arms, fighting to breathe. He looks slightly upset, and I'm not sure if it's at me or at the violence of it all, or if it's just the prospect of having to bury me later. If they dig too deep, they'll probably hit the library basement. <sighs> Please don't kill me, Ambrose. I wasn't trying to start anything. I, I came to bring you home. Please make your dad let me go. You can control him. I want to say these things, but I think I'm just going to pass out instead. The ground shakes again, and there's a loud cracking along with it. Like branches snapping, only the branches might be logs instead. More birds fly by overhead in a panic, just black blurs in my vision. I claw again at Ambrose Sr.'s arm and his gray skin just comes off in my fingernails like I'm digging into a tube of clay. Somebody screams, but since everybody sounds like Ambrose, I can't tell if it's Ambrose screaming or Ambrose or someone else. Other people start shouting, all in Ambrose. It sounds like echoes. Like Ambrose was standing by the Grand Canyon and shouting into it. Ambrose's all the way down. The arm around my neck loosens just enough for me to get a big gulp of air. I feel lightheaded, dizzy, and my neck hurts like I took a soccer ball to it. Somewhere close by, there comes a loud whoomp, and I catch a glimpse of something human-sized landing on one of the gray Picasso people. They crumble under it like they're made out of Play-Doh, but it's not over yet. The thing that landed on them raises its arms, and I see that they weren't arms, but wings, covered in feathers. It picks up the person and starts to carry them off. More come thudding down around the camp. Angels! I croak out, pulling frantically on Ambrose Sr.'s arm. Angels must have found their way into the veil. They finally come to rescue me! But as my vision clears, I see it's not angels after all. Angels, as I imagine them, wear white robes and have arms as well as wings, and they're beautiful. These are dirty, crooked-looking women with wings instead of arms and big bird legs. Not like the Muppet Big Bird, but like the real bird legs. They screech like seagulls and are trying to drag the villagers away. Harpies. The villagers are fighting back with the tools they picked up to use on me. Everybody's yelling. Ambrose looks around confused and frightened, and though I can't see him because he's behind me actively trying to strangle me to death, I imagine Ambrose Sr. is looking much the same. I use the opportunity to pull his arm out just enough to get my mouth on it and bite in. Oh, yuck, he tastes like dirt. Ugh, I feel him tense up, but he doesn't yell in pain or let me go. It just reminds him of what he was doing before the harpies, and he starts pulling back with his arm and squeezing my neck again. I don't want this! I manage to yell at Ambrose before his imaginary dad cuts off my words again. Ambrose looks at me as the harpies and the villagers claw and hammer at each other. For a moment, I think he's just going to watch me get murdered by his dad. But finally, he speaks. Let her go. Ambrose Sr. does not let me go. I kick my legs back, trying to take his knees out or something, but I'm not very good at fighting backward. Even my harpies aren't very good at fighting, it seems, as I watched one get gouged in the chest with a pointy stick someone pulled up from the bunch around the village. I said, let her go, father. Ambrose glares past me. Ambrose Sr. does not let me go. Instead, he tightens his grip and clutches his arms with his other hand to really put the squeeze down on my neck. I slap at it weakly. Father! Ambrose yells and points past us. And then off in the distance, I hear a crash from the forest and something massive come barreling out of it. I don't see it because I'm watching the harpies lose to a bunch of farmers, but I hear the thunder of the trees crashing down. And the roar, or whatever it is, that's coming down across the fields and straight toward us. It sounds like an elephant made babies with a blue whale and a Tyrannosaurus Rex. I can feel every heavy, lumbering step. And boy, are they heavy and lumbering. And fast. It's coming down fast. Whatever it is, it might very well run us all over and leave nothing but pancakes. 
One of the villagers who just finished stabbing a harpy to death looks up and his weird, uneven eyes bulge out of their sockets. He shouts incoherently. Others look up. One lady crosses herself and falls to her knees in prayer. Ambrose Sr. drops me and turns to look, finally speaking. Mother of God. I lay in the dirt and look up. My throat is raw. My whole face feels like it's pulsing. I can only just see the dump truck-sized gray monster that's charging right toward us. I recognize it instantly. What new demon is this? Ambrose Sr. whispers in Ambrose Jr.'s voice. I cough and hold my neck. It's a pigopotamus, assholes! The Ambroses flee. Not like the bugs, which are spelled F-L-E-A. I, uh, I got that wrong once on a um, spelling test. Ambrose Sr. picks up Ambrose Jr. in his arms, one of which is shredded by my fingernails and teeth, and they dash for the other side of the camp. The rest of the villagers run in all directions, some for their pathetic little stick homes, others just willy-nilly, which means all over the place. Some of them lay on the ground and don't run anywhere. Victims of the harpies. The pigopotamus opens its mighty jaws, roaring like a hundred angry boars, and smashes into the village wall with so much force that the pointy sticks spray out around it like porcupine quills. One of her neighbors had a dog that had a run-in with a porcupine once. It got a load of quills in its face. I remember being there when they found the dog hiding in the bushes by their front porch, so I saw what it looked like. One of the quills had pierced its eye, and it was leaking eye juice all over the place. Oh, poor doggy. These aren't porcupine quills, though. They're long, stabby wooden stakes. I feel the air of one passing right over my head. If I had been standing up, I'd probably be a lily kebab. Other people aren't so lucky, catching the sharp parts in their sides and backs like dartboards. Even the pigopotamus itself doesn't escape unharmed. It gets about a dozen of the pokey parts stuck in its head in front. That doesn't stop it or even slow it down, though. The monster has a mission, and that appears to be to trample everything in the area flat. I don't wait around to see if it's got a soft spot for me. I did what I came to do, but Ambrose didn't want any of it. I'm not going to force him to come with me, and I didn't want to terrorize his friends and family or destroy his town. I'm not going to force him to come with me, and I didn't want to terrorize his friends and family or destroy his town. If I get far enough away, maybe the pigopotamus will disappear? I can only hope. The forest is ahead, and it's all uprooted and smashed. Trees are knocked over, roots sticking up like tentacles. I hope there aren't any other beasts about as I run in the direction I remember being the front of the library. Behind me, I hear the awful roar of the pigopotamus. I wonder if it's found Ambrose. I wonder if they'll be safe in one of those stick houses, or if it just has to huff and puff and blow their house down. And I wonder if they knew how to make bricks back in Ambrose's day. Eventually, I trip over a pile of history books. Oh, good! I remember these books! The trees and forest are dark and silent. The lights are barf-colored and fluorescent again. Everything is back to... Well, okay, not normal. Nothing is normal. I don't even know what normal is anymore. Sean sees me stumbling past the checkout desk and braves the five feet I left behind by coming in and grabbing me by the arm. Jeez, Lily, are you okay? What happened in there? I gasp for breath. I can't. He looks at the bruising on my neck. D did someone attack you? I wave my hand at him dismissively. You've got a, a small village in the back. And some harpies. And other things. It's a, a long story. You might want to find a new job. Sean goes back to the window as I sit on the stone wall that surrounds the library. After a moment, I decide to lie down and rest for a bit. The police never show up. No emergency services arrive. I don't want them to. I just want to lie here and wait for Roger to get back from buying his brewskis. I hope Ono managed to pull off her part of my plan. 
because I totally bungled mine. I'm Lily Madwhip, and this is my Odyssey. I'm still laying on the steps to the library. There's a cloud up in the sky that looks like a walrus. Or maybe it's a banana. I never realized how much walruses look like bananas until now, seeing a cloud that looks like both of them at the same time. I don't think they look quite the same in real life, just their outlines. Sean the librarian is looking through the windows into the dark, foresty guts of the library. He's watching in case cartoon pilgrims come charging out to kill us. I feel bad for him because librarianing is his life, and now a bunch of lost settlers have run him out. I hope the forest doesn't spread to outside the library. A shiny red car pulls up, blasting heavy metal music. The window rolls down slowly, and my brother Roger pokes his head out, drinking something I think is probably alcoholic. Even if he weren't dead, he wouldn't be old enough to drink. But I don't say anything because it's not real alcohol anyway. There's a breeze blowing. Do you know how I know? Because I can smell Roger and his booze from all the way over here on the steps. Roger looks at me laying on the library steps, burps loudly, then clears his throat. Lily, is that you? What are you doing on the ground? Did you find your weird friend? He looks at Sean the librarian. Is that your weird friend? I beg your pardon? Says Sean. I can't tell if he's offended at being called weird or my friend. This is Sean the librarian, I say. It occurs to me that I don't know Sean's last name. Maybe it actually is the librarian. Sean nods and goes back to looking in the library window. And who's the old lady? Roger asks, pointing with his chin. What old lady? I look around. Oh, there's an old lady with fluffy white hair and wearing a blue flowery dress sitting on a bench nearby. She's got her head down reading a book with a library sticker on it. But at the mention of old lady, she looks up. I'm Mary, she says with a smile. I shrug. She's probably just another imaginary person I made up. Mary looks sad and goes back to reading her book. I thought you came to get that weird kid, Amherst. Roger disappears back into his shiny red car and reappears a moment later with a can of beer in his hand. I wonder if dead people can get drunk. Probably not in Roger's case since it requires a brain. Now I get here, and you're lying on the ground with Sean, the loser, and Mary the prune. What gives? Sean and Mary both stop what they're doing momentarily to glare at Roger. I think I better get him out of here before he picks a fight with one of them. I'd hate to see Roger beating up an old woman, and I figure Sean probably knows a dozen different martial arts since he reads so much. I've got no reason to stay here anymore anyway. Ambrose isn't coming out of his new village, assuming the pigopotamus didn't kill him. I was really counting on him helping me too, so I just have to hope that Ono follows through on her part or I'm going to be dealing with Hecate all by myself. Roger looks at me and gives his, well, shrug. Well? It's a long story that involves mutant colonists and imaginary monsters. Let's just get out of here. I get up, brush myself off because I'm dirty, and then run over and climb in the passenger side of the shiny red car. The floor is covered in beer cans. Some feel like they're still full. It smells really gross in here too, like maybe Roger vomited at some point. Whether he did or not, someone is about to. I roll down the window quickly to get fresh air inside. The wind in my face smells like heaven compared to in here. Where to? Roger shifts the car from not driving to driving and pulls away, leaving Sean the librarian and Mary the old lady I've never met before in a cloud of dust. I guess... let's go see Hecate. I say. I don't really have anything else to do here. Anything I need, I can make. Sort of. Ambrose was the only person I know of who's real, and he's not coming. So that just leaves me, Ono, and my surprise. 
I look at the library in the rearview mirror. I'm sorry you gave up on me, Ambrose. I can only take you as far as the doorway, Roger says. He sounds far too pleased with himself and also a little drunk. He may be just imagining he's drunk, though. There's a word for it when something is all in someone's head. Mom used to use the word a lot when I tell her that Pasha was talking to me. Um, psycho something. What door? The one out of your dumbass world and into hers. I thought this was all one place, the veil. Of course, I don't know exactly how it all works, but I just assumed that Hecate's maze of doors was off somewhere that we could just drive to. After all, she tossed me into the void and I woke up in the nurse's station at school, so how did I get from one place to the other? I look at Roger driving the car. He's trying to act like he's all grown up, but he's still just a teenager. In fact, he'll always be a teenager now. <laughs> he's like Peter Pan. I don't say that, though, because Roger would probably get pissed off. We saw a performance of Peter Pan at the high school once, and the kid who played Peter kind of looked like a girl. He sounded like a girl, too, and was named Jessica. I remember because I thought it was interesting that his parents gave him a girl's name. We don't drive for long. I'm glad because the smell of Roger burping and all the open beer cans is starting to challenge my normally strong desire to not barf. He smashes his foot on the brake pedal, tossing me forward along with the clattering of empty cans, but my seatbelt keeps me from kissing the glove box. I don't understand why it's called a glove box. It should be called an owner's manual and flashlight and ice scraper box, because that's all that's ever in it. All right, Swerp. Get out. I look out the window. Hey, this is my school. Wow, you're right, Roger says. He ugh, picks his nose, checks his finger, and then crosses his eyes at me. Get out. I open the car door and start climbing out. Some of the empty cans stumble out ahead of me like they also can't take another moment in the car. I'm only halfway out when I feel Roger's foot on my behind and he shoves me the rest of the way. I fall on the scattered beer cans and scrape the palm of my right hand on the sidewalk. Roger cackles. I quickly get back up and pick the little bits of dirt out of my scrape and kiss the boo-boo. Roger leans across the car and slams the door shut. Aren't you coming with me? I ask him. I thought you'd want to see me get my butt kicked. I literally just saw you get your butt kicked. He smirks. No, I'm going somewhere else. I can't tell you about it. It's Y-D-N-T-N. You don't need to know. I have a vision of Roger. He's sitting in a recliner chair with his feet up and several of those beer cans around him. Oh, it's our living room. I didn't recognize it with all the nasty trash all over the place. There's pizza boxes and cans and Roger and... You're going to hang out at our house with Skeeter and Dustin, I say. Skeeter and Dustin are Roger's friends, who he hasn't seen since he died. They all used to wear shirts without sleeves and play their instruments together in the garage until Dad would yell at them to stop. They weren't really good at making music, but they were extra good at making headaches. Roger doesn't say anything, but he moves his mouth around like he's trying to stir a few words in it and spit them out at me. Usually when people do that, it means whatever you said to them was right. Sometimes it means they were chewing when you asked. Ugh, you're such a Sinta Supremus. He snarls and then drives off before I can ask him what that means. This time, I'm the one left in a great big walrus-shaped cloud of dust. Roger and his shiny red car speed off down the street, jump the sidewalk at the corner, take out the hedge of a bush, and nearly hit a black pickup truck that honks its horn at him angrily. The school is closed. All the lights are out inside, except for the one in the vice principal's office. Our vice principal this year is Mrs. Kennedy. She's not related to the guy who was president a long time ago. Apparently, Kennedy is just a really common name. Not like Madwip. Chances are, if you meet somebody whose last name is Madwip, they're related to me somehow. I think there's like 12 or 20 of us in the entire world. I might be counting Roger and my cousin Susie, though. They're both dead. The front door's locked. There's an intercom thingy with a button you press to talk to people inside to get in. 
But I don't want to push it because I'm not really supposed to be here. Mrs. Kennedy would probably just tell me to go home. And then she'd also be on the lookout for me from that point on and it'd be even harder to get inside. I walk around in the school to see if there are any entrances. Maybe an open window or a door. Sure enough, there's a window that's partially open into one of the art rooms. They probably left it open because some of the art supplies smell really strong and can make you dizzy if you breathe them in. I heard a rumor once that one boy, Freddy something, locked himself in the art supply closet where the teacher kept paint remover and stuff, and when they got it unlocked, he'd passed out. <clears throat> I can't reach the window. Stupid legs. There are trash cans by the playground, so I grab one and drag it over, tipping it over to let all the trash fall out and climb on top of the bottom like a step stool. Thankfully, I'm small enough to squeeze through the opening in the window. Unthankfully, I fall in headfirst with a crash and mash a whole bunch of paper mache masks that had been drying on the floor. A smushed Godzilla face is stuck to my pants and some of it comes off on me. What the? What are you doing in here? Oh, crap. There's a giant man in blue overalls standing in the doorway to the hall. He's got a big brown beard and a pair of tinted glasses so I can't even see his eyes. In his hands, he's holding a mop like Donatello the Ninja Turtle's bow staff. I, uh, wanted my mask. I look at the masks around me and grab one quickly. I think it's a lion, but whoever made it didn't really care if it looked like one or not. I wave the semi-lion mask at the janitor. At least I think he's a janitor. He's got a name tag on his overalls, but it just says P. Henderson. Mr. P. Henderson doesn't care about the semi-lion mask. You don't belong here, he says. Did you come in through that window? Who are you? His voice sounds gruff and annoyed. Me? I'm... nobody. I hold the semi-lion mask over my face sheepishly. He shakes his head at me and then points with one meaty finger. You come with me. You're in big trouble. <sighs> you have no idea. He steps back and motions with the mop for me to march out into the hallway. I start to do as he says, but just when I get within arm's reach, his arms, not mine. He's got big, long adult arms, and I got tiny ten-year-old's arms. My vision blurs, and suddenly I'm inside the vice principal's office. I'm already there, even though I haven't walked there yet. Mrs. Kennedy is hovering over her desk, and Mr. Henderson, the janitor, is next to her. They've got blood on their mouths. They're both chewing, and I don't think it's gum. I, I see myself draped over the desk like a doll, and I'm dead, staring back at myself. My chest is all covered in red. They totally ruined my fourth favorite t-shirt! And I think some of my ribs are sticking out. There's blood and gross bits everywhere. It's so awful I want to look away, but I can't because I'm not there. I'm seeing it in my head. Why are Mrs. Kennedy and Mr. Henderson eating me? I try to scream, Why are you eating me? at them, but no words come out. Oh my god. I'm gonna die. I'm back in the art room, with an adult arm's reach of Mr. Henderson. I feel like I've got a burp stuck in my throat, but it might be throw up. I don't want to find out which it is. Mr. Henderson is staring at me through his tinted glasses as I just stand there with an adult arm's reach, carrying my semi-lion mask someone else made and probably looking like I just saw a ghost walk by. What the hell was that? Is all I can think to say in the moment. Mr. Henderson lets go of his mop with one hand and grabs me by the arm. What's your problem, girl? His teeth look bigger from this angle. I feel like maybe he grew another foot, too. And he was already a pretty big man. A am I doing this? I is this me messing with myself? I control this world, don't I? Let go of me! I yell, trying to pull my arm away. Mr. Henderson tightens his grip. His fingers dig into my wrist. It really hurts. Why does my imagination keep trying to kill me? With my free arm, I grab the handle of his mop. He looks down at my little hand just above where his other beefy hand is. I don't hesitate. I jab the mop handle up before he can react. He 
punches through the lenses of his dark tinted glasses and pokes him right in the eye. He howls in pain and immediately pulls the mop away, but tries to throw me out into the hallway by my wrist before letting go of everything and clutching his face. There's blood running through his fingers and down his arm. His glasses fall to the floor in front of me, one side shattered. Damn you! He shouts. If he wasn't going to tear me to pieces with Mrs. Kennedy, the vice principal, earlier, I think now he's not even going to wait to get into her office before doing it. I don't stick around to find out if I blinded him or not. I scramble to my feet and sprint down the hall toward the nurse's office. It just happens to be in the same direction as the vice principal's office. And lo and behold, who should step out and see what the screaming is all about but Vice Principal Kennedy. She's dressed in her typical vice principal's mean business suit, and she's got her hair pinned up in a bun. I thought for sure she'd wear it down on a weekend. But I guess she's always busy, just like my mom. What is going on out here? She says sternly. I bet she and my mom are best friends in the real world. I swear, they're like twinsies if you could be twins with someone ten years older than you and born to different parents. Mr. Henderson, the now one-eyed janitor, crawls out of the art room behind me, calling me that nasty word for girl doggies and shouting how I blinded him. That's not a completely true statement, though, since... I only poked out one of his eyes. Unless he was blind in the other eye already. I charge at Vice Principal Kennedy! Lillian? Is all she has time to say before I crash headlong into her knees and send her reeling and screaming back into her office where she goes backward over her desk, the same desk that I just saw moments ago with my dead body laid on it like a one-course lily meal. I get back up in time to see her legs sticking up from the other side of the desk dining table, and then mutter a quick sorry before rushing down the side of the hall to the nurse's office. God, I hope the real Mrs. Kennedy and Mr. Henderson aren't cannibals. I'm not going to be able to handle going back to school after this until I can be certain that the teachers and the administrators and other staff aren't secretly thinking about eating the students. Of course it is. Why did I think it wouldn't be? All the medicines and bandages and gauze and little cotton swabs and stethoscopes and whatnot are inside and they're probably pretty valuable and likely to be stolen by students if the room was left open all the time. I shake the handle frantically, just in case it's not locked but is really just hard to turn. Nope, it's locked. I'm lunch meat. Down the hall, I can still hear Mr. Henderson yelling. Mrs. Kennedy has gone quiet, though. And I wonder if maybe she broke her neck falling over her desk, is just out cold, or laying there thinking about what kind of spices to add when she eats me. I drop this semi-lion mask and try the next door and the next door. A door to a classroom, then a door to a supply closet. The supply closet is unlocked, so I quickly slip through before anyone can see me go in. Inside the closet, there's a small radio playing some oldies tune. It's one I've heard before in the car. I'm not surprised, since if I had never heard it before, how would my imagination make it play now? Of course, I never listened to the lyrics, so there aren't any. Just the instruments. This must be where Mr. Henderson keeps his cleaning stuff. He was probably in here getting the mop and the bucket and such. That means he's likely to come back here. Even if he gives up on finding me, which I don't think he will, because now he's pretty intent on murdering me. There's a bunch of metal shelves loaded with stinky cleaning products. None of them are labeled, just yellow and red and brown stickers on them with no writing. I'm just a couple of rooms over from the nurse's office where I first started in all this. And if I can get back in there, I can make it back to Hecate's place. At least, that's the way Roger made it sound. The shelves are climbable, and I'm a pretty good climber, so... I climb them up until I can reach the ceiling tiles. They've always seemed very light in the past. I've seen other kids move them just by throwing a basketball at the ceiling. Adults have to move them all the time to get to the wires and the air ducts and stuff. I figure I can just move a tile and climb into the ceiling and then come out in the nurse's office. And if that doesn't work, and I live to get out of this, I'll have to come up with something really desperate. Desperate like stabbing the janitor in the eye with his mop handle and then breaking the vice principal's neck. Yes, Lily, like that. You murdering fiend. I have to push with my back to get the tile out of the way. But it works, and soon I'm climbing over pipes and bundles of wires and sucking up heaps of dust and who knows what else. The inside of the ceiling is dark, 
but there's tons of slivers of light all over the place coming up through the cracks or places where the tiles have slipped out of their spots lately. I try to avoid those, because the last thing I want to do is fall through the ceiling and break my own neck. The only problem is knowing exactly how far to go until I'm over at the nurse's office. Once again, I get lucky. I'm trying to get my shoelace off some sort of hook when I hear Mr. Henderson's angry shouts just below me. I panic for a second, thinking he knows I'm above him in the ceiling. But it turns out he's not directly under me, for one thing. And for another, there's a door between us down below. I found her mask, he bellows. I hear Mrs. Kennedy as well. I guess she didn't break her neck. She must be trying to get into the nurse's office, she says. Her voice sounds cold, like Cruella de Vil in 101 Dalmatians. I can totally see her skinning puppies. Or little girls named Lily. I've got a key back in my office. Oh, well, that would have been handy earlier. I hear Mr. Henderson jiggling the door handle. It's now or never, Lily. I try to pry up the tile underneath me, but it's too heavy. It takes me a couple of seconds to come up with the brilliant idea to get off the tile before trying to lift it. Then it comes up easy. Sure enough, I'm looking down into the nurse's office. There's her stool with the wheels she likes to roll around on. And there's the bed for kids to sit on and get their temperature or blood pressure checked. And somewhere just out of sight are the doors to the rooms where we can lie down. That's where the doorway is. That's where I need to go. I just need to drop like half a mile down and not break both my legs. I try to lower myself down as best as I can, but my elbow slips and I give out a whoops! I don't fall, thankfully. Unthankfully, the angry one-eyed janitor out in the hallway hears my whoops and starts shouting. She's in there! I can hear her! He starts pounding on the door with his fists. Or maybe his head. I can't tell what he's pounding on the door with because I'm only on the other side of it. But it's something big and heavy. Hell, maybe he's throwing his whole body against it. Hurry up with those keys! He shouts before pressing close and whispering into the room. When I get my hands on you, you little... I'm gonna tear both your eyes out and feed them to you! I drop to the ground with a thump. Oh, I guess it wasn't half a mile. Because neither legs break, but they do give out under me and I crumple to the floor. It's okay though, because I get right back up and start fumbling through the dimly lit room in the direction of the sleep rooms. Why aren't there any windows in here? A bit of sunlight would be nice. Just as I find the knob for the door, I hear the jangling sound of keys coming from across the room behind me. Vice Principal Kennedy declares loudly, Here it is! Followed by the sound of the lock on the door clicking. The door bursts open, angry one-eyed Henderson charging in and swiveling his head straight in my direction like a robot. I shriek and turn my own knob, pulling open the door to the even darker room with the lay-down bed for really sick kids, and dash inside as the two angry, bloodthirsty grown-ups charge towards me. I don't even stop to shut and lock the door behind me, which probably would be a smart thing to do, but if I did that, I'd have trouble seeing where the closet was, and right now, I can see it. That's all I need. Just gotta get in the closet and I'm free. I quickly throw the closet door open, remembering the last time I went in here, following Ono into the veil. Except I'm already in the veil, and this is me just going to another part of the same place, I guess. I don't know how it all works. I'm not even going to think on it right now, because if I did, I just got a headache. The door shuts behind me. I'm standing in a candlelit hallway, shaking. They call it adrenaline when you get all shaky from stuff scaring you. Even my toes are shaking in my shoes. I feel like I either just ran a marathon or watched the movie Poltergeist again. That's a pretty scary movie. I saw it when I was really little and got so scared, I wouldn't get up at night to go to the bathroom for several weeks, and had to lay there in the dark and hold my pee in until morning each time. Sometimes I failed. I just about failed again just a moment ago, and I didn't even really need to pee. The door behind me is set into the wall with the hall going in either direction away from it. It's not like my first time with the tunnel and the door being at the end. I don't recognize the specific location I'm in, but the hallway definitely looks like the maze one Hecate lives in. <sighs> I breathe a sigh of relief and wait a moment for my trembling to stop. Finding my way into the maze is just half of the trip. The other half is finding my way through the maze. I wonder if I could just take one of these doors and be home again? 
back in the real world, out of the veil, away from all these horrors. Maybe I'll try just one. I'm Lily Madwip, and I'm here for Hecate. There once was a little girl named Lillian, who was blessed by the angels and could see things before they happened. But because she was so little and told people she heard angels, almost nobody listened. They didn't listen, and her cousin got run over by a boat. They didn't listen, and her brother got mashed by a truck. They didn't listen, and her third best friend burned her house down. She got real tired of people not listening. Then one day, she saw this black dog following her. It turned out to be the boogeyman. The boogeyman was actually a girl and took her to meet the queen of witches who lived in a maze of closet doors. This maze. Stupid maze. I sit and look at my companion, which is a skeleton. It's a naked skeleton. I wonder if it had clothes on once, or if it died here naked. I'm glad I got clothes on. When I die, I'm going to die in this shirt with a penguin on it and my stretchy jeans that look like they got pockets, but they're fake pockets. A big black spider with long, hairy legs crawls out of the skeleton's nose hole. Nope, that's my cue to get back to walking in this stupid maze. You'd think that being able to see things before they happen would help when you were lost, right? Like, should I go around this corner? No, because that way leads to a dead end. But I've been stuck in this stupid maze for hours, maybe days. It feels like forever. Just halls full of doors to people's closets. How many stupid closets are there in the world? I want to burn all the closets down now. Seriously, stop making closets, people. You're killing me. I know they're closets. I've looked in them. Every door I open leads to a closet. Maybe some are real closets in the real world, but I can't be sure. Maybe they're all fake closets. Imaginary closets. Why do we even have closets? They're just little rooms attached to other rooms to put stuff in so you don't see it. Make the other room bigger and get a chest or a box or something. Maybe get rid of stuff if you don't want to see it. You make a closet, you're just asking for monsters to hide in it. I always knew monsters were real because my mom used to say that her nana had skeletons in her closet. And they had to have come from somewhere. Maybe that was one of them I just left. It makes me dizzy seeing these endless halls of doors. Also, the flickering torches make my head hurt behind my eyes. I take to looking at my feet most of the time, only looking up to make sure I'm not going to run into a wall or something. Probably another ten minutes go by of turning down more hallways. And then I notice something. There's a red piece of string coming out from under one of the doors and it seems to go off down the hall ahead of me. The door's made of stone, or at least made to look like it is. It looks like polished marble. There's gold bits around the edges. It's really fancy. I'm almost tempted to open it, but I think the string is more interesting. It must lead somewhere. Either someone unwound it leading to this door, or going from it. Either way, it ends somewhere, and it's not a skeleton with a spider in its head, and it's not a stupid closet door, so I'm going to follow it. Another amount of time goes by following this string, and I start to wonder if the person who left it here was a prankster or just as lost as I am, because this thing is going nowhere. But then I turn another corner, because that's all there is to do these days, turn corners, and there's a big room in front of me. Yay, right? But it's not Hecate's throne room, it's more like Hecate's dungeon. That's like a jail, but if you're ever in a dungeon, you'd much rather be in jail. The whole room is made of stone blocks, but not nice stone blocks, more like wet, uneven blocks. 
And there's a smell like I smelled once at a public bathroom at the mall on a really hot day when the water was out. There's cages with rusty bars all over the place, some even hanging from the ceiling on chains like big bird cages. By which I mean bird cages that are human sized, not a cage for big bird. Some even have people in them. Only, they're not totally people. There's a man slouched over in a tiny cell and his arms are octopus arms. He looks really unhealthy, probably because he can't pick up food with his tentacles. There's a stone bowl by his feet and I can't tell if what's in it is supposed to be a meal before or after he ate it. It makes me feel barfy just looking at it. The man doesn't even look up when I come in the room. Hello? Someone whispers. They sound hoarse. Not like a horse. Horses don't say hello. Horse is hoarse like they're thirsty and their throat is dry. I look around. There's maybe three other people sitting up in cages. One is a lady with half her head missing. I can see her brain, I think. She stares off into space and draws in the air with her finger. I'm just going to pretend I don't see her because she frightens me. There's a man in some sort of big glass tank filled with nasty green water. He's got a giant mouth where his belly button should be, and it's suctioned to the side of the tank like a leech. There's all these little teeth in the tummy mouth, and they make munchy motions. There's no eyes in his eye sockets. But there's a big green eye in his face mouth, and it's staring at me. I nervously approach the weird man in the tank. Are you talking to me, Mr. Suck Tummy? The voice comes from behind me. The voice comes from behind me. Behind you. I turn around. There's nobody there. Are you playing tricks on me? Who is this? Look up. I look up. There's a man hanging upside down. At first I think he's floating, but then I see he's got chains on his legs. He's wearing some sort of weird brown cape that seems to hug his body even though he's upside down. It's hard to describe his features because he's upside down and it makes his face look weird, but there's something off about him beyond that. Please, he says. He sounds out of breath, but I doubt he's been running. Please let down. I look at the chain above him. How do I do that? The upside down man wiggles a bit, trying to gesture with his chin. Over. By, by messy Kim, there's a lever. Stay away from, from mess. He goes quiet and his eyes roll up into his head, which I guess is down into his head because he's upside down. I don't know what he means by Mazza what's it. I look in the direction he wiggled his chin, but there's just an empty cage. Just past it is a wooden lever like something out of a video game. It's just set into the wall, not attached to anything. It looks heavy. First off, I say, holding up one finger dramatically, that lever isn't by anything. Second, I'm not letting you down unless you promise not to eat me. Third... I mean it about the second thing. Don't eat me. The man nods excitedly. I know no harm you. Pinky promise? I stick my hand up to him. He's close enough that he can probably reach. He looks confused. Pink. Pinky? I wiggle my pinky finger at him. Pinky finger promise you won't eat me. I... Don't have. He looks sad, I think. But he's upside down, so maybe he's smiling? Maybe he doesn't have pinkies. I wouldn't smile if I didn't have pinkies. Pinkies are the second best finger after the index fingers. At least I think so. Roger has a different opinion on favorite fingers. Okay, well, 
I'll just pretend we pinky promised and you better not break it. Because if you do, I'm a really powerful person. Do you know what a pigopotamus is? No. I nod. It's better that way. They're pretty mean. Anyway, I'll let you down. The man shudders. I can't see his arms, probably because they're tied up under the brown robe he's wearing. And maybe that's why he can't pinky promise. Or maybe he's got octopus arms like that other guy in the little cell. Then again, maybe he's got spider arms like the black hairy ones on the one that came out of the skeleton's nose. Oh god, why did I think that? I walk over to the lever, but just as I'm passing the empty cage, the man yells to me, Too close, too close to magic him. In the same instant, I hear a snuffling sound to my left. No, my right. I always get them mixed up. I hear a sound on my right, and then something roars from inside the empty cage. I shriek and jump left, away from the cage. But I feel needles in my arms and hear a ripping sound. When I look down, my awesome penguin shirt is shredded on the right sleeve, and there's blood running down my arm. It doesn't hurt at first, but a second later, my arm starts to throb. Hey, ow! I yell and clutch my injured arm. I warned you. Stay from Mazikim. Mr. Hanging Helper seems to pass out again. I don't know what that is, I shout back. I look at the empty cage and can see the blood sort of floating in the air in the shape of some thin, curved claws. Then something makes a gurgling noise that sounds a bit like laughter, and a slurpy noise later. The blood isn't there anymore. Oh, great, you could have told me it was an invisible Freddy Krueger. His eyes flutter open. I know no what... what Krueger is. Fair enough. They probably don't watch too many movies here in the dungeon. I take a moment to tear the rest of my sleeves off and wrap it around my boo-boo. Poor penguin shirt is gonna have to go in the trash when I get home. Maybe I could get my mom to cut the penguin off the front and sew it onto another shirt. She's good at stuff like that. I miss her. The lever is really heavy. I pull on it as hard as I can and it doesn't seem to budge. Eventually, I try just hanging from it like a monkey bar and it creaks like an old door and slides down, making me fall off. There's a jangling of metal behind me and a big thud. The man in the brown robe is flopped onto the floor under a pile of chains. He lays there a while, and I start to wonder if maybe I broke his neck dropping him on his head like that. But then he moves, struggling to get up, and I'm about to come over to help him untie his arms when the robe opens and reveals that they're not robes, but a big pair of brown leathery wings. His arms end at little claw-like hands. He wasn't kidding about not having pinky fingers. I realize that the reason his face seems so weird upside down is because his nose is bent upward and he's got one of those cleft lip things like a doggy or a cat's got. Oh my god, I whisper. You're Batman. Well, a Batman. The man bat guy stretches, arching his wings. For a second, I think he's going to break his pinky promise and eat me. But he doesn't, obviously, because I'm alive to tell you about it. Hippasus, he says, touching one of his little claw hands to his chest. I thank you. He blinks big, black eyeballs. I'm Lily Madwhip, and I'm here for Hecate. Which queen... Hipsauce touches his claw hands to his face gently. Forgive, ugly, witch queen cursed, cursed us all. I shrug. I've seen worse. Heck, I got little webs between my big toe and the next one. I think I must be part duck. I don't want to downplay his feelings, though, by trying to one-up him on gross features. Hecate hurt you? I'm here to kill her. Sort of. 
This is her playroom. Y you need go audience ch chamber. Well, this place is kind of a maze. I look over at the woman with half her head missing. She's staring at her hands. I wonder if she wants out of her cage as well. It would be cruel to not free the other people, but then where would they go? Out into the real world? They'd be shot by some hunters, probably, or end up in a circus with the dog-faced boy. I wonder if the dog-faced boy came from here. I've never actually been to the circus, except the one with just elephants and clowns. I've never been to the kind of circus where you can go see dog-faced people and contortionists. Labyrinth is endless. Hipsaw strokes his chin. But their order to it, Dzur's added on to end of serpent's tail. Oldest doors are closets to mouth of beast. Okay. I don't know when we got started on talking about snakes. So how does that help us? Go in direction of older doorways. Hipsos flexes his wing arms and looks at them the same way Roger used to look at my paintings I do in my room all the time. I'd say it's two parts amusement and three parts disgust. Roger never liked my paintings, probably because I painted stuff I saw, which was things like my fish rotting and floating in its tank, or my poor, poor ninja turtle Donatello. Now all I have of Donatello is his shell that got run through the dishwasher and a stick I made look like a bow staff. Do you think we should let the rest out? I ask. The man with the leech mouth in his tummy thumps against the side of his tank. I can't tell if he's excited about the idea of getting out. I'm not sure if letting him out won't kill him. It kind of looks like he needs to live in the water now. His eye in his face mouth looks at me and a big cloud of purple ink squirts out from behind him. I scrunch up my nose. Yeah, he can stay in his tank. I look back at hip sauce, but the room is suddenly all red. The other people are lying in their cages with their eyes and mouths open and there's blood running out of them. I look back. The tank of water with the tummy mouth man is just a big, cloudy tank of blood. Only the lady with the half a face seems to still be alive, but considering half her head is gone, I wonder if anything can kill her. Hip sauce is in the center of the room, kind of all over the place because something has torn all his parts off. His head is pressed up against the bars of the cage with the half-faced woman in it. His tongue is hanging out slightly, and she's just staring calmly down at him. There's all this nasty, gross stuff splattered around where his parts are. I don't understand. I don't know what happened. They're all dead, and... The room is normal again. Well, normal for a stinky dungeon with cages full of people mixed with animals. Hipsauce is saying something but I can't really hear him because my ears are ringing. I was seeing things before they happen again. This whole room is going to get slaughtered. I have to let them out. Something bad is about to happen, I tell Hipsauce. He cocks his head like a dog and his ears move on their own. I look around for more levers to pull, but there doesn't seem to be any. Someone's going to kill everybody in here. Who? Hipsos cocks his head. How? Oh. I don't know. I just know that you're going to get ripped to pieces if we don't do something. Hipsos looks past me at the empty cage. Mazi Kim. He whispers. It, it is fury. Don't let out. I shake my head. I wasn't planning on it. But look, maybe it gets out somehow anyway. I've seen it. We we need to get everyone else out. Keys. Keys. My new bat friend gestures towards one of the archways leading out of the dungeon. Maybe in there. I dash through the big arch. I didn't realize there was a room connected to the other room. It looks like somebody's office. There's a big desk and a drafting table like what my Uncle George has in his house. 
It's like a regular table, but it's tilted and your plate and glass slide off of it and your cookies and milk fall on the floor. And then Uncle George tells you to use the regular table for eating and Roger looks at you like you're a dummy. There's drawings of people on the walls. Some of them look normal, but they're naked. They're holding spears and shields and wielding helmets. Okay, so not naked. They got helmets and poking at snakes with seven or eight heads and lions and big water snakes. And there's a guy riding a pegasus. They're all flat and no effort was put into them. I'm a better artist than whoever drew these drawings. Not to brag. The table is covered with better drawings. I think maybe someone else did these because they're really detailed. They show how the arm connects to the body and how the leg connects to the body and all the muscles and bones in them. And then there's other drawings under those that have similar drawings of people, but show how a tentacle attaches to the body or how a mouth on someone's tummy connects to their stomach and guts. There's even one with a really good drawing of the half-faced lady. It shows her with a full face, but there's a dotted line that seems to match up with exactly how much of her head is missing. There's a quicker, looser sketch of a man's head with the same dotted line, and the other side of his face shaded out. Between them are arrows pointing away from two different heads toward each other. I think this is a plan. Whoever did this is going to stitch half a man's head to the half-faced woman. Under the sloppy drawing of the male head, somebody wrote in cursive. Fortunately, I can read cursive. It says, Subject to RTM. Did Hecate do this? Has she been cutting people apart and stitching them together like dolls with other things? Why would she do that? I thought she was magic. I look back through the archway. Hip Sauce is playing with the chains wrapped around his ankles. Maybe they're tied in one of those sailor knots they teach you how to do in the scouts. I was never good at those. I probably shouldn't stand here and watch him struggle when any second the invisible Freddy Krueger monster thing could get loose somehow and murder everybody in the room. Oh hey, there's a set of keys hanging right there on the wall by the arch. I must have passed them on the way in. They're really high up, so I grab the stool by the slanted drafting table and carry it over to reach them. There's about seven or eight old looking keys on the key ring. I hop down off the stool and run back into the nasty dungeon full of cages, about the same time that Hip Sauce manages to get one foot free from the chain. I've got the keys, I announce. Hip Sauce looks up. The man with the tentacle arms looks up in his cage. Even the lady with half a face who's going to be getting a face otomy looks up. Ew, no, no, look back down, look back down. I can see inside your head. The tummy man in the water tank blurbles and squirts more ink. Oh god, okay, I don't know what to do about him. What is going on in here? Snakebutt enters the room. All the people in the cages start wailing and banging on their bars. Hip Sauce makes a horrible, ear-splitting shriek and flaps his arm wings. Witch Queen! He screams. Wait, that's not the Witch Queen, that's Snake Butt. I clench the ring of keys tight so a couple of the keys poke through between my fingers. Maybe I can weaponize these keys. Oh, who am I kidding? She's adult-sized, even though she's got a snake butt. I can't beat an adult. How dare you? Snake Butt hisses. Ha! She even hisses like a snake. Oh, ooh, I pissed her off. She reaches to her hip where she keeps some sort of knife dagger thing in a, what's it called, a sheath? A scabbard? I don't know what the difference is between the two. Anyway, she's got this really sharp, shiny, stabby thingy in her hand and murder eyes in her face. I've got a set of keys poking through my little fingers and I'm already bleeding from my good arm. I'm so hosed. Snakebutt slithers across the room on her snake butt, whipping her tail back and forth and moving fast. I was not expecting someone with a snake fur about to be able to move quite as fast as she does. I swing my fist at her, trying to maybe tear her guts open like a velociraptor, but I miss wide and she slaps the key ring out of my hand, letting it fly across the room somewhere. Welp, she grabs me by the neck with the same hand and slams me up against the wall. Oh god, this is it. She's going to carve me like a Thanksgiving turkey. Or any turkey, really. 
Nobody carves live turkeys. That'd be kind of crazy. She's kind of crazy, though, so maybe she'd do that. Snakebutt leans in close, and I can smell something so nasty and rotten on her breath. I bet for all their magic, they've never created magic toothbrushes. Oh god, it stinks so bad in her mouth that I really hope she kills me before eating me just so I don't have to have that smell be the last thing in my senses when I go. Maybe I'll get to see Pasher when it happens. That'll be nice. You don't deserve your gift, she hisses angrily. I'm the true witch queen. No, you're not. You're just a snake-butted wannabe. Stop calling me that. Snake butt! I shout. She screams in my face, getting all her spit in my eyes. Yuck. I'm going to show Mother how worthy I am. I hold onto her wrist as she lifts me off my feet. If I let go, it's going to start choking me. So go kill her yourself and let me go home! I feel her grip tighten around my throat. Little fool. You think I would be here making these pathetic imitations of her pets if I had an ounce of magic in me? I... I don't know. I'm just a little girl. I kick my legs at her feebly. And that's all you'll ever be. She grits her teeth and squeezes harder. But I'm not just a little girl, am I? I'm the knife that cuts the veil, damn it. I'm supposed to be someone great and powerful, apparently. So important that Hecate herself sent her goon squad into my world to fetch me. I need to go home. I need to see my mom again. I need to... Snakebutt suddenly reels back, screaming. Blood splatters across my face and I tumble to the ground. I'm, I'm blinded by it for a moment and, and wipe my eyes. When I can see again, Snakebutt is writhing on the floor and there's a set of big, nasty gashes in her side, leaking steamy blood onto the rocks. Behind her, hip sauce is perched on top of the empty cage that has the invisible Freddy Krueger thing in it. The door to the cage is wide open, and the key ring is hanging from the lock with the key stuck in it. Snakebutt slashes the air with her stabby knife. A moment later, another huge gash appears in her arm and she screams again, dropping her weapon. She reaches up and seems to get her hand on something that I can't see. Whatever it is, it struggles against her grip, and she swats it with the back of her tail, causing it to tumble off of her. Filthy demon! She curses, sitting up quickly and clutching at her torn arm. The invisible whatever it's called growls. I wish I could see what it looks like, because I bet it looks kind of like a dog, and I love dogs. Not this demon dog, because it tried to kill me, but dogs in general are very nice. If you have a dog, give it a good petting. Run! Hipsaw shouts to me. I can't run. If I run, I know exactly what's going to happen. I've seen it. I've seen Hipsaw's torn to pieces, blood all over the place. Everything in this room dies. I've got to do something. I know. There's something missing from all this. It's not a labyrinth without a minotaur. Something bellows loudly from the hallway, making the entire room shake. Everything stops. Snakebutt freezes in her tracks, holding her little dagger with her other hand, and looks up in confusion. Hipsos blinks his big black eyes and looks around trying to figure out where the noise came from. Even the invisible dog demon doesn't seem to be moving, I think. It stops growling, at least. And then, an enormous man with a bull for a head, just the head of the bull, not the whole bull, marches into the room, so large that he has to duck under the archway. He's giant and muscular and wearing huge metal pants. In his hand is a big battle axe like I see dwarves in movies holding. He's perfect. My Minotaur champion. He says nothing. I don't even know if he can since he's got a bull for a head, but he stares at Snakebutt and snorts angrily. Really? Snakebutt makes one of those half smiles at me. A Minotaur? You think I can't handle... And then the Minotaur's axe cuts her stupid head clean off. The blade keeps going, swinging across the room like a giant saw blade. I'm thankfully out of the way, over by the wall where Snakebutt dropped me. But the axe shears right through the metal bars of one of the cages, too. Cutting halfway through the poor, tentacled man. 
who doesn't shout or scream, just sort of accepts death quietly. Snakebutt's body flops onto the ground and her head bounces over toward the empty cage Hip Sauce is perched on. He looks at it with surprise and his mouth is a big O. Oh. I can see into the next stump of Snakebutt's body, and I'm gonna have that image burned in my brain forever now. My Minotaur grunts with satisfaction. He tries to dislodge his big axe from the cage in the dead tentacle man, but it seems to be kind of stuck. I don't care at this point because Snakebutt is dead, so mission accomplished. I'm sorry, Mr. Tentacle Arms, that you were also taken out. I'll try to convince myself that you were happy to be freed. I wonder what your name was. I wonder if you had a family who will never know what happened to you. I wonder where the invisible demon dog went. Hey, I shout. Hipsos, do you see the invisible demon thingy? Hipsos cocks his head like a doggy again and stares at me with big black eyes. The master key or whatever it's called. Mazikin? He says. No, I... No. He shrugs. That could be bad. The slashes on my arm are already starting to burn. I need to find some soap and water and wash it or else it could get infected. And I don't want to think about what kind of infection you could get from an invisible demon. I hurry over to the cage hip sauce is perched on. He sits there silently and watches me as I grab the keys he used to let the demon out. I hold them up to him. Let everybody else out. I say. Leave the guy who sprays ink out of his butt, though. The guy in the water tank with the mouth in his tummy blurbles. Yeah, that guy. I'm Lily Madwhip, and I've got an army now. You hear that, Hecate? You hear me coming for you? I guess it's not really an army so much as a squad. Maybe a small group. Okay, so it's like a book club. My mom goes to a book club. They like to read books about men who wear shirts they can't button up, and then they sit around and eat crackers with spinach and talk about the books. I had a book club. Just me and Pasher. He's read everything, so he always comes prepared. We read books about people who can button their shirts. You hear that, Hecate? Me and my book club are coming to kick your bony... Miss Lily, wait. We fall behind. Hipsauce calls. That's not really his name. I'm not very good with names. It took me months to get used to saying Pasher's name. I was five then. I called him Baxter at first, like Baxter Stockman. He's a giant bug man. Hipsauce is a giant bat man, like he's a man with actual bat wings. It's kind of freaky, but I try not to judge people on their appearances. Freaky looking people gotta try harder to seem normal. If anything, normal people are more likely to be freaky on the inside. Hipsauce is hobbling behind me, helping the woman with half a face walk. She seems really weak. I thought maybe everyone was starved from being in a cage, so before we left the dungeon, I made a table covered in Oreos appear, but trying to eat an Oreo with half your head missing is tricky. Hipsaw snacked on them eagerly, but they kept falling out of the half face lady's half of a face. It was really kind of gross to watch. It was really kind of gross to watch? She's like a picture in the book we got for health class that shows all the parts inside your head. Past them are the others, like a dozen or so tired-looking puzzle people in a giant minotaur. I guess that would make him a maxotar? Minotaurs are probably midget-sized tars. There might also be an invisible dog thing somewhere nearby called Magic Bean or something like that. Like I said, I'm not good with all these weird names. Why couldn't people in ancient times just name things Invisible Dog Beast or just Gary? Watch out for the Gary! That Gary better have its rabies shot. I can't believe the neighbors let their Gary poop on my lawn. I wonder if an invisible dog makes invisible poop. Oh my god, I could be walking through piles of it right now. You guys need more Oreos? I ask. No, please, no more Oreos. Someone in the back shouts. I wish I could see who it was. I don't trust someone who doesn't want Oreos. I've been following this trail of string. It led me to the dungeon first, but just kept going out the other side. 
I know it sounds weird to follow a string, but it was left here by a guy long ago, and apparently it leads to the middle of the maze, which is where Hecate hangs out. I've read all this before. It's part of Greek mythology, like what I read in the library before Ambrose turned it into his personal village. I can't remember if it was Perseus or Thurseus or Jason or Hercules. Whichever one wasn't in Clash of the Titans or the one with the astronauts, I think. I love that everybody has weird names except Jason. <laughs> I wonder if he got made fun of for his normal name back then. <laughs> anyway, we get to a four-way intersection and the string goes around a corner. It's not the first time. I've been following it around corners for what seems like forever. But this time I turn the corner and Hecate's standing there. She's just sitting on her big stone chair in the middle of the hall. No, wait. I look around. I'm in her living room, or throne room, whatever it's called. The room with the pillars and the chandelier with all those candles. That's seriously a lot of candles. All her followers are standing around talking to each other. Some lady laughs. I think I just missed hearing a funny joke, and I feel a little disappointed. <sighs> it's going to eat at me now. I want to know what the joke was. Lillian? Hecate hisses. Everyone in the room suddenly goes quiet and turns to look at her. Nobody looks at me. Wait, how did I get here? I look around. Maybe I was confused about where I was? Nope, this is the room with the pillars. The turn in the hallway I was just at is gone. Hypsos and Maxotar and all the others in my book club are also gone. Come to me. Hecate says in a low voice as she pets her big black dog. I feel a moment of panic at the sight of the dog because I think it's Ono and that she's betrayed me. But then it occurs to me that this is not the same big black dog that was actually Ono. I saw this dog the first time I was here, and Ono was with me. I wonder if this dog has a name, or if it's another person like Ono, only it likes to stay in doggy form. I just gotta remember that Ono is actually out in my world fetching the surprise. <laughs> Fetch. <laughs> like a dog. <laughs> mm. I take a step forward to say something to Hecate, and I bang my head on an invisible wall. Ow. It hurts, and I stumble back, holding my head. Somebody puts their hand on my shoulder. I turn to look. It's hip sauce. Why are you hitting yourself? He asks. He sounds just like my brother Roger when we'd sit beside each other in the car and he'd take my hand and slap me across the face with it. Why are you hitting yourself, ass face? He'd always ask. Oh, Roger. I turn back to Hecate, but I'm staring at a stone wall. I'm in the hallway again. Only now my head hurts. Stupid visions. I think Hecate knows we're coming, I say, rubbing my noggin. Also, watch out for that wall. The book club murmurs. I look at them. Somebody in the back flops over, leans against the wall, and slowly slides down it. I can't tell if he's copying me or just dead. Stop acting all surprised, I say sternly. I try to sound like my mother when she's talking to me about emptying the dishwasher. We're wandering in this maze of closet doors Hecate made with her mind. She can change anything to whatever she wants just by thinking about it. You think she's not going to see us coming a mile away? I hope it's not a mile away. My legs are getting tired. Someone in the back shouts, If she can change anything, how can we fight her? I recognize the voice. It's the guy who didn't want more Oreos. Everyone moves out of the way so I can see him. He's a normal-looking guy in some sort of dirty cloth diaper thing. He's so thin and all his bones are visible under his skin. I wonder what Snakebud did to him for a moment. But then something moves under his skin. Like tentacles wrapping around his bones. Ugh, I shudder as I watch them squirm. When they stop moving, he looks normal again. But I can still tell they're there. You probably can't, I admit. I think only I can. 
She might even think you out of existence or back into your cages. I don't know. Most of you aren't real anyway, though, so... I shrug. I'm no good at pep talks. I'm real. Diaper Man thumps his fist against his chest. We're all real. He thumps it again. I think he thinks that thumping his chest proves a point. Shouting and hitting yourself don't prove points unless the points you're trying to make is that you might be crazy. Some of the tentacles inside him wiggle angrily and then go still. Ooh. Everyone else watches me and I realize they expect me to say something. Look, I don't want to argue with you, Mr. Diaper Man. He beats his chest again and snorts, interrupting me. My name is Astyanex. Of course it is. I don't want to argue with you, Mr. Nasty Lonax. You say you're real, so you're real. He steps closer and stares down at me. When he opens his mouth to speak, I can see that some of his teeth are missing. There's also something far back in his throat that seems to be wiggling around like a bunch of worms. Ooh, maybe it's worms inside him, not tentacles. I hope he doesn't barf worms on me. Why should we follow a girl, child? I could tear you into pieces with my fingers. Because I just saved your lives? He reaches toward me with one hand and I pull back. I can see things under his skin squirming about. Look at you, he whispers. You reek of fear. It's true. I'm trying to act brave, but inside, I'm ready to pee my pants. I don't want to see Hecate. If I could, I'd sneak past her, find the door home, and never look back. But the way things have been going, I know that wouldn't work. I have to be brave, not just act it. Maybe those are the same thing. Maybe nobody is brave, they just act brave. Mr. Lonax touches my hair. I flinch. More murmuring passes through the rest of the book club. I follow Miss Lily, Hipsaw says. He's leaning the half-faced woman against a wall and steps between Mr. Lonax and me. She freed me, killed Lamia. No, she didn't. That thing did. Nasty Lonax jabs at the air with his fingers like it's a donut and he's trying to poke through the donut hole. But actually, he's pointing at my Maxitar. Everyone looks at Maxitar and some more murmuring starts going through the book club. Maxitar puts his hands up in the classic don't drag me into this gesture. Whenever I'm at school and I sense that something's going to happen before it does, I try to warn people. They ignore me. It happens. And then they accuse me of causing it. I have to make that gesture all the time. Having hip sauce between us gives me a small surge of confidence. I made that Maxitar! I stamp my foot. My shoes kick up a cloud of dust. Somebody really needs to sweep in here. And I can make a hundred more! Nasty Lonax crosses his arms. Then you don't need us. No. No, I don't need them. I could make a hundred Maxitars instead. Then again, I could make an entire army of Maxitars, and they'd be just as useless against Hecate as my book club. She could probably think any of them out of existence. Or is it that we can't affect things the other creates? Except I totally trust a section of her dorm maze by accident. Or rather, Samuel did, and she blames me for it. I don't really know. That's why I'm counting on Ono. I'm not making- Look, I- You- I clench my fist and think of home. I have to speak slowly and try not to yell or think about turning nasty lawn axe inside out with my mind. I'm not asking you to fight for me, Mr. Lawn axe, but do you really want to sit around here? If I die, Hecate or someone will eventually find you and put you back in a cage or something. If I beat Hecate, I don't plan to come back this way or anyway, and you'll be sitting around here forever while the maze falls apart around you. But if you come with me, and I win, maybe we can figure something out for you guys. Nasty Lonax doesn't look the least bit impressed. He holds up his index finger. I look up, thinking he's pointing at the ceiling. Oh, there's nothing there. 
I should probably be careful not to fall for people pointing at the ceiling just to make me look that way, because that's a good way to get stabbed. Or, he says calmly, we can just do this. And then he straightens up, adjusts his diaper, walks over to the plain-looking door with a glass knob and brass hinges, turns the knob, opens the door, looks back at me, makes a gesture with a different finger, then steps through and shuts the door behind him. Did he really just do that? I ask. I can't believe he just did that. Who even knows where the door goes? He could be in China or Australia right now. I hear they have spiders as big as your head and poison frogs in Australia. I used to think it would be cool to go see Australia because apparently the toilets flush backwards or something there, but then I found out that it's over one with stuff that can kill you. Only Crocodile Dundee can survive Australia. I walk over to the door and open it to talk to him. The room on the other side is dark. <laughs> I walk over to the door and open it to talk to him. The door on the other side is dark. It must be nighttime here. I can just make out his silhouette crossing what appears to be a child's room. He keeps stepping on the toys that squeak. Hey, I whisper at him. Hey, you can't be in here. He ignores me. Something growls. It sounds like a dog. But not one of those nice dogs like you see people walking with and you ask, Can I pet your dog? And they say, Okay. Because they don't know that pretty much every animal you touch dies and then you pet the dog and it licks your hand and your face and you just want to hit the person with a rock and steal the dog because you love it so much. No, this is more like one of those dogs that you see in the backyard with a fence and a sign that reads, No Trespassing. And the dog starts barking before you even realize it's there and someone tells you later about a kid who accidentally lost a frisbee over the fence and they climbed into the person's yard and the dog bit their legs off. The growl gets louder. Nasty Lonax pauses for a second. I think he hears it too. How could you not? It sounds like a motor on a very old motorcycle. And then he puts his foot down slowly and a long, agonizing squeak of air being let out of a rubber duck fills the quiet. The growl turns into a sharp bark and something big and dark launches across the shadowy room. Nasty Lonax shouts and throws his arms up. I can only barely make him out from the light coming in through the closet door behind me, but what I see is the top of his head seems to flip backward at his mouth and blood red silly string comes gushing out. Except it's not silly string, it's worms. Hundreds of crazy long worms. Oh my god, he's got a flip flop head that lets him turn into a worm flail. It's the most awful thing I've seen in a long time and I instantly regret being here to see it. The dog, very furry, maybe a German Shepherd, I can't tell, lands in Nasty Lonax's arms and is immediately tangled in the worms coming out of the top of his head. It seems to try to bite him, but then it starts yelling like one does when you step on its paw. The worms are all over it, wrapping it like a cocoon. I could hear the sound of them sliding over its body. I want a gag, so I do. Ugh. Stop! I managed to yell. Somewhere else in the house that we're now standing in, I hear shouts of grown-ups in some foreign language and doors being slammed. Uh-oh. What do I do? I can't be here. I look back through the closet door and the rest of the book club watches. Their faces are a mixture of indifference and disgust. I guess some of them have seen worse. The half-faced woman isn't even looking. She's just staring at the floor. I want to apologize to her for thinking she was ugly because this worm flail head thing, it, it's so much worse. A door gets thrown open on the other side of the room and the lights come on. I can now see Nasty Lonax in all of his horrible glory. He's looking at me with the eyes on the upper half of his head which is flipped towards me as the red worms fountaining out of his skull hold up pieces of the dog and throw them toward the man with the black hair who stormed into the room with a shotgun in his hands. Somebody screams. I can't blame them. I'd scream too, but I'm all out of screams at the moment. The shotgun goes off. I can feel something wet spray all over me. Hipsaw suddenly reaches through the closet door, grabs my arm and pulls me back through. I get a glimpse of Nasty Lonax and his flip top head striding toward the poor homeowner angrily. There's blood all over the floor and walls, along with bits of the poor dog and wriggling worms. The homeowner screams again as Nasty reaches him and more worms erupt from his neck. I can see the barrel of the shotgun sticking up between the two. It's pointed directly at me. Shut the door! I yell. Hipsauce throws the door shut in the same moment that I hear the thunder of the gun go off. 
The entire door cracks and a giant hole explodes in the middle of it, throwing splinters at everyone. But no shotgun pellets are with it, just wood bits. I can see through the hole and there's nothing but smooth stone on the other side. It's like the door is just glued to the wall. Oh God, I whisper. It's all I can think to say considering what just happened. Nasty Lonex is out there somewhere now, and I have no idea where. I wipe my face. There's blood drops all over me and bits of wood in my hair. The rest of the book club seem lost and confused. Murmuring starts again, and a couple of people get up and just walk off before I can say anything more. Hipsauce walks over to the half-faced woman and helps her back up, letting her lean on him. Let's go, he says with a nod. But... I'm a little shell-shocked. Door is gone. You can't go there. We go to Hecate. We walk down the hall for another 15 minutes, following the string left, then left, then right, then left. There's more lefts and rights in there, but you get the idea. There was a moment during it where I wondered if the stupid string was playing a trick on me and I was just going in circles, but I picked out a door each stretch of hallway and memorized it to see if I spotted it again later and didn't. I, I can't stop trembling. I can't stop thinking about Nasty Lonax or that poor man and his dog. I keep seeing the shotgun in my head pointed directly at me. Finally, we reach an intersection where the string turns a corner, and I recognize it. Not because we did go in circles after all, but because it's the intersection in my vision. Around this corner is Hecate. I face the book club and hold both hands up. Around this corner, I say, trying to sound dramatic, but I'm no good at acting, is Hecate. I can't promise you'll be safe, so maybe the best idea for you all is to wait right here. If anything goes wrong, just do like Mr. Lonax and head through a door. Just look before you go in. Because there might be a dog on the other side, and not one of those nice dogs like you see people walking and you ask to pet it and they let you and you pet the dog and it licks you and you want to hit them with a rock and take it home. Everyone looks at each other. I'm really bad at pep talks. What I'm trying to say is, watch out for dogs that will bite your legs off. Unless you don't have any legs. Somebody without legs grunts. In which case, protect your other parts. Hipsauce talks to a man with eyes all over his head, then hands the half-faced lady to him. He walks over to me, smiles in a way that says, I'm probably going to die, but I want to do this anyway, and then nods quietly. Maxitar runs his big fingers along the edge of his axe. Everyone else looks at the three of us and then shuffle back into the darkness a bit. I really hope they don't do anything stupid while I'm getting myself killed. All right, I say. Let's get this over with. I haven't heard a single word from Ono. I don't know if she failed to get the surprise or betrayed me entirely or is still off in my world doing who knows what. I gotta remember that time works different here in the Vale. Mom, Dad, how long have I been gone? Is my photo on milk cartons? Do you think Jamal will tell everyone that I died from a lack of sleep? Do you think if I get back, I can have one of those milk cartons with my picture on it and keep it as a souvenir? I close my eyes and try to see the future. All I see are the veins in my eyelids. Whatever. I turn the corner. Hecate's living room is as big and fancy as it was when she dragged me out of it and tossed me in the void. Tall pillars all over the place, fancy chandelier, all that jazz. My mom has a word for places like it. I just can't remember what the word is right now because I'm standing in the door with hip sauce and Maxitar facing the crowd of followers and Hecate herself sitting on her throne with her big black dog beside it. The worst part is that she was staring straight at me the moment I entered, like she'd been waiting for me to come around the corner the whole time I was giving my good dog, bad dog pep talk to the book club. So you returned, she says. She smiles at me, but it's not a friendly smile. It's like when you have to play dodgeball in gym class and one of the boys with a cannon arm gets you in his sights and he smiles like that. So you returned is Hecate's way of saying, I'm going to replace your head with this dodgeball. I step forward and raise my fist at her. 
I, I just want to go home. I had something better planned to say, but I forgot it in the last second. I think it was something like how I was going to chew her up and spit her out, but now that I think about it, I'm not really one for talking tough. You're never going home, Hecate says. She stands up. The big black dog continues to sit there by her chair. That's a, that's a good dog, I think. It still might be a leg biter. Maybe I can turn it into a mouse? Or a frog. I need to remember that I can do anything here. I'm just as strong as Hecate. I don't want to fight you. Hecate holds her hands up in front of her. You will fight me or... She claps twice. I half expect the lights to go out, but then I remember that the lights are candles and you can't hook up a clapper to candles. I butcher your little friend. Oh no. Oh no, 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 no. Not Simone, please. Not Jamal. The sea of people around her chuckle, and then a bunch move aside and a man wearing a black potato sack on his head and no shirt steps forward. He reminds me of the men on the cover of Mom's book club books. Only they didn't wear potato sacks on their heads because they actually had really amazing, beautiful hair. This guy probably doesn't have any hair, and he's embarrassed because he got so fed up with the shirt having no buttons that he just stopped wearing it completely. He's got someone by the arm. It's a girl. She struggles against him, but he's a grown-up and she's barefoot in blue pajamas with cartoon kittens on them. It's... It's Lisa Welch. She looks at me and stops thrashing against the shirtless man wearing a potato sack on his head. Lily? She says. She looks as confused as I am. Lily effing Mad Whip? Are you kidding me? <laughs> she actually says effing. <laughs> Lisa yanks her arm hard and manages to pull free from the potato sack man. What the F, Lily? What the F, Lisa? I say back. I look at Hecate. Are you kidding me? She's not my friend. I hate Lisa Welch. What the F? Lisa shouts, throwing her hands in the air in the classic Lisa Welch annoyance. She looks around at the crowd, and I think it starts to dawn on her that the people she's surrounded by are not exactly normal looking. She turns slowly and finally looks up at the shirtless man with the black potato sack hat. I can see the horror in her eyes when she looks back at me. She starts babbling. B -b 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 Hecate's grin falters. She looks at Lisa and narrows her eyes. If she's not your friend, then you won't care if I just rip her little head off. I hold up a finger like Mr. Lonax did to me earlier. Okay, I would pay all my allowances for a year to watch Lisa Welch get picked clean by ants, but... I gotta think of a but. I never actually want anybody to get hurt. When I imagine pushing Lisa into the Grand Canyon, that's just a thought. I would never follow through with any of them. Lisa finally stops stuttering and seems to regain a bit of her composure. Oh, baloney! She shouts, turning to Hecate. Do you know what she did to me? She flails her arms in my direction like she's trying to slap at me from across the room. She made me trip and break my teeth and then her and her psycho friend nearly burned me alive. That's... I was going to say it wasn't true, but it's kind of true. I didn't mean to make Lisa trip and break her teeth. And she was picking on my third best friend, Meredith, when her backpack caught fire, which wouldn't have happened if I hadn't been nearby. Hecate falls back into her chair and crosses one leg over the other. She puts her chin in her hand. Maybe I should make you both fight to the death. Lisa and I look at each other. The victor gets to be my pet. I thought you wanted me to fight you, not her. Hecate waves her hand. Oh, you'll still have to contend with me after. But you bore me. Killing you will be easy. I want some entertainment. Kill your little not-a-friend, and then I will dispense with putting you out of your misery. Lisa clenches her fists and glares at me. She grits her pretty new perfect teeth that her daddy paid for. What the F, Lily? What have you gotten me into? Hecate stands back up and slowly glides down the stairs from her stone chair. I can't even see her legs moving under her long dress. 
It really looks like she's floating. She float walks through the followers at the bottom of the steps and glides over to Lisa. Lisa looks up at her and Hecate takes Lisa's chin in her hand, locking eyes. What do you say, my pretty little one? Hecate reaches into the folds of her dress and slowly pulls a shiny silver blade out. It's much fancier looking than the one I made when I was practicing with Ono. Hecate's really got the hang of making things out of nothing. Would you like to stab Lillian over and over until you see the life leave her eyes? Would you like to feel her warm blood flow over your hands? Yes, I want to feel her warm blood flow over my hands. Lisa repeats the words in a slow, trance-like voice. No, you don't, Lisa! I yell. Yes, I do. Lisa's right arm stops twitching. She reaches up with it and takes the dagger from Hecate's hand. In response, Hecate lets go of her chin and Lisa's entire body seems to relax. I can see the knuckles on her hand turning white as she squeezes the hilt of the dagger. I don't know what she's thinking, if anything, anymore. Lisa Welch and I are the complete opposite of friends. I don't want to say we're enemies. We're not at war or anything. We just don't ever talk and we kind of hate each other. I think I have more right to hate her than she has to hate me. But I don't know what she thinks or if she's got some secret reason that she hates me. That's the problem here. I don't know if she hates me enough to actually try to kill me. It seems like Hecate has taken choice off of the table, though. Lisa seems to be under a spell. I reach out and think about a massive sword, shiny and sharp. It's Excalibur, the sword that runty kid Arthur pulled out of stone in the Disney movie. I'm pulling it forth from the stone, but the stone is the air, and it's a rusty-looking butterfly knife. <sighs> I don't want to do this. Lisa turns to face me with her blade. Her eyes are glossy and glazed over. Okay, she might be under a spell, or she might just be really tired. After all, it looks like Hecate's goons grabbed her in the middle of the night. I like her kitty pajamas. If it wasn't Lisa, I'd compliment her on them. But she's a big jerk and she's gonna stab me, so she gets nothing. Lisa steps forward, brushing past Hecate, the dagger at her side. Maxitar snorts and lifts his axe, gripping the handle with both hands. No! I yell at him. Don't hurt her. I... I got this. Oh, Lisa. Don't make me kill you. I'm Lily Madwip, and this is a nightmare. This is a nightmare. In fact, I'm pretty sure I've had this exact nightmare before. Me in a knife fight with Lisa Welch, surrounded by bloodthirsty onlookers cheering for my death. Although in my dream, we're usually on the school playground and I'm in my underwear. I'm going to cut you from taint to tongue. Lisa Welch hisses at me. I'm not entirely sure what that means. It's not her talking, though. That's Hecate. I know it. She's gotten inside Lisa Welch's brain somehow and is controlling her. Honestly, I'm impressed she had a brain to control. Lisa Welch couldn't find her butt with both hands. She paces around me, murder written on her face. Not really the word murder, like tattooed on her skin, but I could see it in her eyes that she's not worried she's going to barf at the sight of blood like she did back in second grade when we weren't enemies and we played together on the playground and I was skipping rope and tripped and skinned my knees. That time, Lisa saw the flappy bits hanging off my legs with all the blood and gravel and she upchucked right there in front of me. Like right in front of me. Like the barf splashed right on my legs. And if you thought I was crying from skinning my knees, well, I was. But I cried even more when Lisa Welch barfed on those skinned knees because that burned even worse than the original injury, which was still fresh, just like the mac and cheese she'd had for lunch. It was totally gross. I think that was the day Lisa stopped playing with me. Maybe she did it out of embarrassment. Like seeing me reminded her of that day, so she never wanted to see me again. And when she realized that she couldn't make that happen, she grew to despise me. I don't know. I'm not a psychologist. Are they going to start soon? Someone in the crowd says. I keep my eyes on Lisa. I can't let her stab me while I'm not looking. Can you stay out of this? 
The only knife fight I've ever actually witnessed was on TV, and it was between two rival gang leaders. I thought they were just going to go in stabbing, but instead they held hands and circled each other while taking turns slashing each other until Michael Jackson broke it up, and they all danced to the power of friendship. I don't think that's going to happen here. No one wants to be defeated, I whisper. I hold my hand out to Lisa. She pauses from circling me like a vulture and stares at my offering with empty eyes. Hecate's done something to her, but maybe she remembers the Michael Jackson video too. Her head twitches, and then she lashes out with her hand holding the dagger and slashes me on the palm. I can't help but squeal and jerk my hand back. Several people gasp. Someone claps, but then realizes nobody else is joining in and stops. Lisa looks me in the eyes with her dead ones and smirks at me. It's the same face I'm used to seeing when she and her jerk crew of friends circle me on the playground. I've always wanted to punch that face, but I know I would just get in trouble for it and she'd get an expensive new dress from her daddy. The cut doesn't hurt at first, but then a deep slice opens up like a little toothless mouth in my hand and blood wells up from it. That's about the time... That's about the time the pain starts. I clench it shut. Some of the blood runs between my fingers. Lisa sees it start to run down my arm and blink several times. Is the blood snapping her out of her trance? I hold my hand up toward her. Maybe I can make her barf like in second grade. Look, Lisa, I'm bleeding. Her eyes go dead again. Yes, she says. That's how this works. I cut you and you bleed. Okay, no getting through to her, apparently. Lisa is a puppet, with Hecate's hand firmly lodged up her butt, flapping her mouth, making her arms move. I've got to cut her strings. I guess it's a different type of puppet, but it was amusing me to think of Lisa like Hecate's hand puppet. <sighs> I glance over at Hecate. She's watching Lisa, not me. Or is she focused on Lisa because she's linked to her mind? Maybe I just have to distract Hecate to get Lisa. I wasn't watching Lisa. She moves in quick, lips curl back in a snarl. She punches me in the stomach hard, making me double over. My ribs have always been kind of tender ever since I got a few broke last year in a car crash. This time there's a sharp stabbing pain and it burns right where she hit me. I swing at her with my butter knife, but she dances away, grinning like that cat from Alice in Wonderland. The crowd cheers. My Maxitar roars in anger. I hold up my hand to keep him from charging in and trampling Lisa. Lisa waves the dagger at me. Aren't you going to do something? She says in that annoying way. She says other stuff like, Oh, that's a really nice backpack. Did your mommy buy it for you? To which I once replied, Well, yeah, I didn't dig it out of the trash like you. <laughs> that was a good day. She comes at me again, her free hand balled up in a fist. I swing down and slap it with the flat of my butter knife. But it was a trick! Her other hand, the other one with the dagger, it's coming at me from the other side. It's only through luck and the fact that I threw her off with my slap that she doesn't drive it straight into my eye. Instead, I pull my head back and it opens my cheek. I can feel hot blood immediately running down the side of my face and I stumble back, holding my face. It hurts so much, tears sting my eyes but I'm not going to make a sound. I'm not going to give her the satisfaction of hearing me scream. Lisa leans toward me and sticks her tongue out. Aw, what's the matter, Lily? You going to cry? <laughs> Lisa Welch. Lisa stupid Welch. That annoying, perfect, punchable face. I feel all the years of her and her jerk friends harassing me that's been sitting in my guts, just stewing and waiting to pour out, start to bubble and rise up toward my throat. I want to vomit it all over her like she did with her mac and cheese to my legs back in second grade. I want to puke the mac and cheese of all my anger right in her stupid face! My whole body shakes. That's the rage I feel about to explode. I normally keep it in, but I can't. I just can't! Thinking my mom was dead, seeing Roger, being tossed in the void, Felix, Snakebutt. I look down. 
One of my tears falls off the tip of my nose and splashes on the ground to mix with the drops of my blood that have spattered on the floor. That's it! I grit my teeth. I need to end this. I need to stop this before one of us gets killed. Lisa has to go down. Get her out of the way, then deal with Hecate. I take one step back, take a breath, clear my head. Uh, this cut on my cheek feels really deep. No, 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 focus, focus. Lisa? Yes? I look up. I hate you! I charge her, throwing my butter knife ahead of me. Lisa smirks as it twirls past her, but I wasn't aiming for her. It spins towards Hecate, my true target. Hecate is so focused on controlling Lisa that she doesn't even see it coming. The butter knife glints in the torchlight and falls apart and falls short about ten feet, clattering to the stone floor. I'm not really good at throwing things. That's why I play infield when they make us play kickball in PE. Infielders don't have to throw very far. Even then, I tend to just roll the ball rather than toss it because my aim isn't too good either. I'm one of the last picked for teams usually. I make sure that if I see where the ball is going to go before it goes there, I just move somewhere else so someone else gets it. Oh yeah, I was charging at Lisa Welch. Lisa's elbow comes up and catches me in the throat. My feet keep going forward. So do my legs. My upper body decides to stay with Lisa's arm, though, and gravity does the rest, sending me to the floor. There's a sharp crack as I feel my head connect with the stones, and my vision goes blurry for a moment. The crowd makes a collective ooh as they watch me go down. Lisa's immediately on top of me, knees on my arms, pinning me to the ground. She grins down at me, dangling the dagger over my face. Maybe I'll make her wear your face. I can hear Hecate's voice inside her, coming out of her mouth. Then send her back to your world, wearing you like a suit. She doesn't have a future anyway. We both know that. Hey! Somebody shouts. Lisa looks up. Get off her! I recognize the voice. How could I not? It's my own. I tilt my head back. The entire room turns to look at the new girl who just walked in through the chamber. She looks exactly like me, right down to my tiger t-shirt, only fiercer. Her, not the tiger. She got all the anger written on her face that I feel in my heart. Just in time, oh no. Lisa blinks and her eyes go normal. Hecate must not be paying attention anymore. She grips the dagger handle firmly, which is good because the alternative was that she was just going to let go of it and it plunges into my face. She stares at the other me, who just walked in, and I can almost hear the gears in her head screeching to a halt. It's like one of those fancy salt shakers they have at restaurants that grinds the salt up. Wait, what? She says, looking back and forth between me in the doorway and the me she's currently sitting on. That's... Just a trick. Hecate says, You're not fooling me with your petty illusions, daughter. She waves her hand dismissively at my clone. Someone else steps out from behind Ono. A few people crane their necks to see who it is. I'm one of those neck craners. Everything's upside down from here on the floor. But I still recognize her black hair that she uses to cover the side of her face, where the fire burned her. Meredith! I shout. Meredith clutches her melted Barbie Nathaniel and looks at me pinned on the floor, with an expression of confusion on her face about on par with Lisa's. She's got on green jeans with overalls and a black long sleeve shirt, but she's wearing furry bunny slippers on her feet. I wonder what she was up to before she came here. Lily? She asks, then quickly looks at Ono disguised as me and squeezes Nathaniel tighter. She looks just like you. I don't understand. It's, it's a long, long story, story, Ono and I say in unison. Hecate remains unconcerned. And who is this child? She asks. The crowd of her followers start to murmur. That's Meredith, Lisa says casually, sniffling and wiping her nose with her dagger hand. If she weren't sitting on my arms, I'd have half a mind to reach up and help her stab herself in the face with it. But she isn't paying attention to me, and Hecate has lost control over it, it seems. And that's all I need. 
I jerk my arms out from under her knees, throwing her off balance. Then I reach up and shove her backward. Lisa topples over with a squeal. The dagger flies out of her hands and clatters across the stones by some random guy's sandal-clad feet. He stoops down and picks it up. The rest of the followers look at him. He just shrugs. In the meantime, I'm on my feet. Or rather, I've pulled myself out from under Lisa Welch, who is flat on her back with her feet in the air like some sort of possum. She's not saying anything, just looking rather stunned. While she sits there like a lump, I scurry over to Ono and Meredith, who look similarly baffled. I scramble to my feet. Meredith! I hug her. She tenses up, but doesn't resist. She feels warm. Maybe a little too warm. Meredith has a thing with fire. Like, she burns things, just by thinking about it. That's thanks to her melted Barbie, who's actually a totem for her angel, Nathaniel. I look at Ono. It's like looking in a mirror. You were just supposed to bring the doll. Well, she was with the doll, and she wasn't willing to give it up. Ono shrugs. I ended up telling her I needed her help to stop a bad person. Would you rather I return empty-handed? If one of us gets the totem of another, we borrow the powers with it. And when there's two or more of us, those powers get amplified. Like through a bullhorn. I didn't want to get Meredith mixed up in this, but I needed her doll so I could surprise Hecate with some fireworks. Time to improvise, I guess. Hold up! Meredith grabs my shoulders and moves me arm's length away from her. Can we talk about the part where there's two of you? What is going on here? Is this a new power? Ono and I look at each other. Ono nods, then takes a step back. One quick change coming up. You might want to look away, Meredith, I say. Ono is about to do her melting routine. It's very disturbing to see, and Meredith doesn't need any more nightmares about people melting, I imagine. Meredith covers her eyes. Ono starts to melt and reform into her normal self. What the F? Lisa Welch shouts. Oh, right, I almost forgot about Lisa. She's still sitting on the floor with her eyes bugging out of her head and her mouth hanging open. She starts making a gagging sound as she witnesses Ono transform, and then she covers her mouth and looks away. A moment later, she barfs through her fingers. <laughs> it's brown and it splashes on the stones, causing everyone near her to groan and step back, covering their own mouths as if the act of puking is contagious and they're all going to start doing it. At least I know she's no longer Hecate's control. And that she didn't eat mac and cheese recently. It takes me a moment to realize that Hecate is not standing behind Lisa. In fact, I don't see her at all. What did she do, run away? Oh, come on! I had this whole big bad showdown planned, and of course the big bad you would have to run away again. This is just like last year when I tried to face Felix Weaselman, and instead of letting me kick his butt, he threw his totem at me and fled. Ahem. <clears throat> ono coughs. I turn back to her and Meredith. Ono has transformed back into her thin, scrawny, pale-looking self. She smiles at me. It's probably because she doesn't realize Hecate has somehow gotten behind us and is standing over her with a long metal spear. And Hecate is not smiling. Oh no! I scream. I try to move, but my legs are so heavy. So very, very heavy. I can see the murderous rage in Hecate's eyes. The same rage was in Lisa's eyes when Hecate was controlling her. Just a dead, purposeful anger and one thing to focus it on. Okay, okay, you can do anything, Lily. You can make and remake the world here. I hear it in my head. So I make a thing. I hold my hand up, my arm feeling as heavy as my legs, and make a shield. It's round and metal and shiny. So shiny, it's like a mirror. I see it in my head, so perfect, a hard, protective shield, like they wear in movies with gladiators. And there it is, formed between Hecate and Ono, just as Hecate drives her spear down towards her adopted, stolen daughter. The spear meets the shield, and they slam into Ono's back, throwing her forward. For a moment, I think, I did it. I'm a hero. I saved somebody. But then the tip of the spear tears through the front of Ono's ragged shirt, 
already red and wet with her blood, and Ona looks as shocked and confused as I feel. My shield... It failed. Hecate grits her teeth and just keeps pushing, shoving more of the spear through the broken shield and through Ono's body. You ungrateful little wretch! She snarls. Do you think I didn't know you would betray me? There is nothing you can hide from me here. Ono is driven to the floor, retching up blood. She doesn't cry out or scream. Or maybe she does. I just can't hear it over my own scream. Meredith uncovers her eyes just in time to see Ono crumple over, blood spilling out underneath her. She opens her mouth in a scream as well. We're both screaming. I think Lisa is screaming too because the whole chamber is filling with screams. Hecate thrusts her spear away from herself, letting Ono roll all over the floor, blood gushing out of her. I hurry to her side to get help, but Hecate's hand comes out of nowhere and slaps me aside like a rag doll. I fall to the floor beside Ono. She looks at me, reaching out a hand weakly. Her eyes are filled with sadness. There's blood coming out of her mouth and nose. Lily, she says softly. Her eyes look past me like she can't see me anymore. I twist my head and glare at Hecate. You evil bitch! You are going to die in a fire! I yell. My voice echoes through the chamber. Yes, yes, I'll pay the swear jar when I get home. Hecate starts to laugh. <laughs> oh, am I? Yes, Meredith says calmly as she wipes the tears from her eyes. Yes, you are. Heat comes off of Meredith so fast I see the air ripple like water in a pond when you've thrown a big rock in it. My dad used to take me to this pond in town and try to teach me how to skip stones, but I just didn't have the wrists for it. I always ended up trying to sploosh big rocks instead. He would help me dig up the biggest rocks we could find nearby, and then he'd let me toss them overhead into the water, and we'd cheer whenever one made a splash so big it got us wet. Fire isn't like water. Nobody cheers when fire pours over you. If you sat in the bathtub filled with fire, you might get clean, but not the sort of clean you really want. The fire Meredith makes comes up from the floor like a wave. I see it like the world has fallen into slow motion, rising up, curling over itself, slapping Hecate like a tsunami. That's a really big wave made by earthquakes. We learned about all the natural disasters in school, even though there's never any danger of a tsunami hitting us. Hecate and her clothes catch fire easily. Everything on a person burns pretty easily, I've learned, even people themselves. But it's not enough. Meredith clenches her fists, holding her melted Barbie tight, and the fire just keeps coming off her. The heat is so intense I actually need to crawl back a bit because it's starting to make the stones too hot to be laying on. I try to grab Ono's arm and pull her away, but she's too heavy. Her skin is already blistering from it. Meredith? I yell. Stop! Meredith doesn't stop. Hecate gets smashed by another wall of fire. She's completely engulfed in it. All I can make out of her is a black silhouette. Or maybe that's her flesh. I don't know. She raises her arms and rain starts coming down from out of nowhere. Everybody else in the chamber starts yelling. I don't know why they weren't yelling already. Blood and fire don't phase you people, but a little water falling from the sky does? <laughs> okay. The rain hisses as it hits stones around us, the flames covering Hecate's sizzle. Meredith roars. She brings her hands up in front of her, palms up. Hecate literally erupts into a fireball, like Ono before her. She doesn't shriek or make a sound. She just crumples down, curling up into a ball of charredness that reminds me of Officer Flowers, the poor lady cop who Meredith murdered last year. Lisa Welch is still screaming. I think she's going to be checking into Happy Vale Sanitarium when this is over. There's no way she's going home unscathed. The rain turns into a thin drizzle and then stops. Hecate continues to burn, then smolders for a bit until she's just a black, unrecognizable lump. Ono's body lies red and blistered beside her. <laughs> I'm ready to cry now. This is not how it was supposed to happen. 
Ona was supposed to bring me Meredith's totem, and then I would set Hecate on fire. Meredith already has the guilt of killing Officer Flowers to suffer with. This was supposed to be my burden. Nobody in Hecate's group of followers seems the least bit bothered by what just happened. One of them nudges another and points at Lisa sitting in her pool of vomit, and they both chuckle. <laughs> it's not exactly the reaction I was expecting them to have from seeing their queen of countless eons dying at the hands of two little girls. Meredith drops to her knees, gasping for breath. The air around us immediately feels cooler, and I'm grateful. There's some red marks on my hands and knees from crawling on the hot stones, and they're probably going to turn into welts later. My Maxitar snorts and bangs his big axe on the floor. I think that's his way of showing his approval, but I'm not entirely familiar with the ins and outs of Maxitars. Hipsos just looks bewildered. I imagine he'd like to go back home now. And then it occurs to me. I have no idea how to get home. Ono was supposed to lead me out once I dealt with Hecate, and, and she'd take over ruling the veil in her fake mother's place. But now Ono is dead. Hecate, too. And there's only one person left who can rule her place, and that's... Hecate's burned corpse stirs. It rustles a bit, some of the black ash and crackling bits of burnt cloth and skin crumpling off. And then it sits up. The small black lump atop the rest of it makes a horrible grinding sound as it rotates around, and then two burnt, crispy eyelids open and white eyes stare at us. A mouth appears beneath them, and she begins to speak. Did you really think that this would end me? Her voice sounds hoarse. Meredith and I give each other the side eye. That's the look you give someone when you're both experiencing the weirdest thing you've ever seen. Well, yes, I admit. Hecate's charred remains start gathering into a human shape. Or maybe she's just standing back up. It's really hard to tell when she's a big black charcoal. Little girl, I've been alive for thousands of years. I fought hundreds like you. Fire starters, ice makers, poison breathers, men who could rip you into pieces with a thought. Women who could burst your heart with a wail from their lips. You fought an ice maker? I ask. I imagine Hecate in mortal combat with my Uncle George's refrigerator. It had an ice maker that was always on the fritz. Hecate could pound her fist into that thing until another thousand years passed and she'd still never get any ice out of it. But I am the god of this realm, and reality here bends to my will. Hecate stiffens, then reaches up and brushes her face, wiping the appearance of burnt flesh and hair away like an eraser on a drawing. She runs her fingers back through her hair, and it's as if the last few minutes have... never happened. Well, that's bullshit, Meredith quips. I look down at Ono's body, pathetic and small by Hecate's feet feeling a momentary twinge of hope that she's going to stand up too and pull the spear out and laugh and say April Fools! But I don't think she knows what April Fools is. And she doesn't stand up. She just lays there. Dead. What is the point of all this? I ask, sniffling. Hecate cocks her head. Hmm? Frustrated. I wave my arms at everything in the room. What's the point of bringing me here? You can rebuild yourself from death in seconds, but you get all pissy that a section of your big stupid maze got wrecked? And that wasn't even by me. That was some jerk angel who did that. But what does it matter? You can snap your own fingers and remake it. This was a test. Hecate stretches her arms over her head. Something inside of her pops to see if you were the one to take my place here. I've been trying to find someone as gifted in the art of pure creation as me to take over. So I passed your stupid test, I mutter, clenching my fists. And now you just expect me to willingly stay here forever? Hecate clicks her tongue at me. You didn't pass, you idiot. You haven't created a thing. 
You got Anakoli to betray me, but I knew she would do it someday. And as for your little friend, well, you've only doomed her with you. The air starts to warm up. Meredith is going into defense mode. I created the butter knife, I point out. Hecate snorts. And the Maxotar. I point at my Maxotar. He hefts his axe and bellows loudly to show off. Hecate raises her eyebrows and shrugs slightly. Paltry conjurations. Things you've seen before. Do you even understand what is available here? Anything. Not just some half-man you read about in a book. What are you going to do to us? Meredith shouts. I notice her hands are glowing red. I can see the bones and veins in them. Oh, please don't go off again, Meredith. I'm right next to you. Hecate strokes her chin and looks Meredith up and down. You. I like your spirit. I look forward to breaking you. Then she turns to me. But you, you're useless. You were supposed to be the knife that cuts the veil. But you can't even save yourself. How many times do you have to rely on others to come to your rescue, hmm? Just once more. Comes a familiar voice from behind me. A man walks into the room. At least I think it's a man. He's wearing a shiny yellow suit like Doc Brown wore in Back to the Future, with black gloves and boots on. I can't see his face because it's covered in some sort of gray rubber mask with a canister hanging off of the front like a big metal nose and large dark goggles concealing his eyes. It's strapped on his face with only his ears and neatly cut white hair sticking out. A long braided tube winds down to a box at his side that's slung over his shoulder on a strap. You can't be here! Hecate yells. She starts to chant and waves her hands in some sort of spell casting motion. Another being enters from behind the first, dressed exactly the same, but with a black suit instead of the yellow one. He raises a single finger. Be silent. Hecate's voice cuts out like someone pulled the wires on her microphone. She clutches her throat and for the first time ever she looks panicked. She turns to her group of followers who have all taken several steps back from these new intruders. They all look at her with uncertainty, but she makes a gesture that I can only interpret as do something. And suddenly, they start to yell and move forward. I notice Lisa Welch crawl out of their way. Two more beings enter behind the first two, one dressed in orange. He raises both hands out in front of him like he's clutching a pair of doorknobs. Take one step more and I will tear this entire place down and every one of you with it, he says through the mask. The other new being is in a shiny gold suit. He moves quickly, striding across the room toward the crowd of angry followers. But he's not going for them. He stoops next to Lisa Welch, pathetic Lisa Welch, and reaches out to her. She cringes away from him. My name is Jophiel, he says. I've come to take you home. Let me carry you. Lisa doesn't respond. I don't know, maybe she's too far gone. But the man kneels down and picks her up in his arms. As swiftly as he crossed the room before, he moves now for the door again, disappearing behind the other three. I look at the person in the yellow suit. I can't tell if he's looking at me or not, what with the dark goggles in his mask. I wish I could see his face and know if he was smiling down at me. Lily, he says softly, I'm sorry. <gasps> I run to him and hug him, not caring that his big plastic suit makes a sound like I'm hugging the tarp my father uses to carry leaves with when he rakes the yard in the fall. I want to cry. I also want him to pick me up like that other guy did for Lisa and carry me home. He pats my hair and hugs me back. Pasher. I'm Lily Madwhip, and I might have doomed us all. Hecate fumes with rage. Fume is an action word that means be really, really angry. I used that once while playing Scrabble with my parents. It was worth nine points. But it's also a thing word, a noun, that means a smell. I think it's kind of appropriate that it's both words because Hecate's anger is like a smell kind of fume that's wafting off of her so thick that you can almost see the haze around her. I thought I'd seen her angry before, but I guess that time she was just mildly annoyed. 
That time, she only wrinkled her forehead and made stabby eyes. This time, her entire face is scrunched up and her eyes are like Death Stars that shoot lasers made of fire and atomic bombs. She's gritting her teeth so hard, I think they might just crack in her mouth, and her hands are balled up into fists. The knuckles on them are white. She's like a stinky, red-faced rage balloon ready to burst, but at the same time seems completely powerless, which probably just makes her angrier. The being, the angel, in the black protective gear stands in front of her, still holding his finger out, as if to say, Hold up a minute there, lady. Hecate glares at it like she's thinking about lunging forward and biting it right off of his hand. I'm sure she would do it. I'm so relieved to see Hecate powerless for once, and yet I'm still torn up inside. And a bit outside, too, come to think of it. I try to swallow, but there's a lump in my throat and I can't seem to make it go down. Maybe it's my tongue. I hear you can do that. So much has happened. Roger, my mom, Felix, that awful dungeon, Lisa Welch cutting me. I touched the wound on my face where she managed to slice me. If she'd been any closer with the knife, she might have left me with a scar like the one Ono has. Oh no. I'm so sorry, Ono. I tried. I just wasn't good enough. I'm never good enough. But Pasher is. Pasher came for me when everything else seemed lost. Just in time, my guardian angel. Whenever I've lost him, he's always found his way back to me. Now I was the one who was lost, and still he found me. My knees feel like jelly that you spread on bread and eat with peanut butter. Grape jelly. I like it when there's just enough peanut butter and jelly to cover the bread and soak into it a tiny bit. If it squishes out the sides, that's too much. I blink away a few tears. That's a neat trick, I tell the black-suited angel. He turns his head in my direction but says nothing, even though he's wearing that mask with goggles and I can see his face. Even though he's wearing that mask with goggles and I can't see his face, I can feel his eyes. You know when you're sitting there watching a rerun of Gilligan's Island on TV and then you get this prickly sensation down your neck and you look out the window that faces the backyard and there's a feral calico kitty on the windowsill and it's just staring at you like it thinks it can hypnotize you into bringing it food, which you gladly do anyway because you love kitties and wish that you had one, but every pet that you keep ends up dying mysteriously? Well, it feels like that. The cat part. Prickly. Pasher sees me looking at his buddy like I'm expecting him to respond. He speaks up for the silent angel. Duma's gift of silence is an invaluable asset here. He leans toward my ear. He has to focus, though, and can't respond to you, despite her limitations. In this place, Hecate is still quite dangerous. You cannot see the battle of wills that is being fought between them. I narrow my eyes. Oh, Duma. Of course it's Duma. Duma. I'll bet he's narrowing his eyes back at me, too. Duma, who tried to burst Meredith's heart in her chest in a hotel room last year. Meredith doesn't know that, though, which is probably why she's looking at all the angels with curiosity and interest, rather than peeing her pants in fear. I would have considered peeing my pants in fear if the angel who tried to crush my heart as a shadow showed up in the flesh. Especially if he showed up in a rubber suit like he didn't want to get anything on him. Peeing yourself is a defensive tactic. People are less likely to kidnap a kid with stinky, wet pants. Also, it can drive away less hungry animals. I know this because I was the less hungry animal once, and a feral calico kitty I saw on my sill one day while watching Skipper and Gilligan was the kid with stinky, wet pants. Except it peed on me rather than itself. That's an entirely different story, though. Why are you dressed all funny? I asked Pasher. I want to hug him again. But it would probably get too weird if I do it too much. Is that one of those radiation containment suits like the old guy wore in Back to the Future? Or are you afraid of me seeing what you really look like? Do you look like bugs under those masks? Pasher puts a hand on my shoulder. No, we do not look like insects. These suits hide our presence. The angel in the orange suit still has his arms out toward the angry crowd like he's trying to play an invisible piano. 
I didn't think one could twitch their fingers in a threatening manner, but the way he does it, even I feel nervous. He must really hate the piano. Hecate's eyes blink momentarily toward her followers. It's nothing more than a look, but even I can tell there's some sort of unspoken communication in that second's glance, and so does someone in the group. A man wearing the top of a wolf's head like some sort of gross hat suddenly roars and bursts through the rest of the crowd, knocking over a woman in a yellow dress that looks like a dandelion. His arms hang down to his knees and seem unusually swollen, like a weightlifter's, but they don't match the rest of his body. He starts swinging his crazy big arms and pinwheels and charges straight at the orange suited angel. Orange suit doesn't seem the least bit phased by this. He flicks his right wrist and a huge stone spike erupts out of the ground in front of where the muscle armed man is running. The angry man doesn't even have time to react. He just straight up impales himself on the spike, falling to his knees on it. I guess it's a stalagmite, because those are what you call spikes that come out of the ground. The man's wolf hat slides off of his head and falls to the ground next to him. Blood runs down the stalagmite and gets all over the hat and his knees. I flinch and look away immediately, having already witnessed somebody get run through with a pointy thing earlier. Meredith gasps and covers her mouth. The rest of the people in the crowd shriek and someone in the back starts sobbing loudly. Oh, maybe it's the angry man's mother. I like to think that my mom's crying for me like that right now. You never think about it when someone dies violently, but they had a mother who spent years raising them and molding them to be somebody and then someone in an orange rubber suit waves his hand and all those years are lost to a stalagmite through the chest. The orange suit angel cocks his head to look at the less angry, more dead man with the Hulk arm slumped onto the spike he made. He doesn't seem the least bit concerned about taking a life. I guess killing people is pretty normal for angels. They've wiped out entire cities before, after all. With another flick of the same wrist, a spike flattens back into the floor, leaving a dead body with a huge, bloody hole through it. Just like, oh no. I look over to where her body lays with the spear still stuck through it. I want to run over and pull it out and hug her, but there's probably all sorts of inside stuff leaking out of her and it'd get all over me and I just couldn't stomach that. Maybe we can take her with us. Pasher, we don't have time for this, barks the angel in orange. Pasher nods to his friend. I am aware, Abaddon. He squeezes my shoulder with his rubber glove. I wish I could see his eyes. I just want to see his eyes. We need to get you out of here. But first, I must deal with Hecate, okay? What are you going to do to her? I ask. Pasher doesn't answer. He just ruffles my hair. It gets staticky because of his rubber gloves and sticks up straight on my head. Then he walks over to Hecate. She glares at him. But I notice her lip is kind of curling up in a smirk. Dumma stiffens his finger in response and she ends up biting down on her lip. I know how much that can hurt. I do it all the time, especially when I'm eating gummy bears for some reason. Hecate, Pasher says loudly so everyone can hear. I am Pasher, watcher of Arabeth, steward of Cassiel, and executor of the seven pot estates. I speak on behalf of our creator. Observing with me are Duma, the vindicator, and Abaddon, the destroyer. I can't help but think how badass their names are. I want a title like them, but if I became an angel, it'd probably be Lily in the Awkward. Hecate manages to move her lips just enough to spit at Pasher. I can see her hands fighting whatever power Dumma has over her, twisting to try to make some gesture or reach out or do something. Duma's gloved hand creaks as he tenses up and holds her back with just a finger. You have fallen far. Queen Hecate, I barely recognized your kingdom. It grieves me to see you like this, but your transgressions can no longer be tolerated. Pasher's voice cracks a bit. It sounds like it hurts him to say those words. Of course, he's never been one for punishment. Whenever I got in trouble at home, he'd comfort me. Once when my dad spanked me for drawing on the glass coffee table in the living room with the rock from the stream down in the woods, 
Pasher sang me a song about where the water goes when it reaches the ocean while I cried in my bedroom. Looking back, I should have used the washable marker instead, but I was only six at the time. Pasher sighs. <sighs> Hecate, mother of witches. She who sits. He pauses. She who sat at the crossroads and bore witness to the gates of the seventh heaven. For your continued interface in the mortal plane, you are hereby sentenced to seek penitence from the darkness of the oubliette. What's going on? Meredith asks. I squeak because I didn't notice her sneak up next to me. She watches Pasher talk to Hecate and hugs her melted Barbie close to her. It makes me wish I had my doll of Pasher with me to hug, but I guess I got to hug the real thing, so that's pretty good, actually. Angel stuff, I say. That lady with the crazy eyes is in trouble for hurting me and some other people. She's been kidnapping kids like us for years. They're gonna do something newer. I have no idea what, though. Oh... She squeezes her doll Nathaniel again, and together we watch Pasher say more stuff, but I don't hear most of it because I'm actually thinking about how long it's been since things felt normal. I've missed you, says Meredith quietly. I turn and half smile at her. I've missed you too. Except for the whole burning people to death thing. I regret that I asked Ono to go get Nathaniel from her. Meredith needs him for protection. Felix, the real Felix, is still out there somewhere in the world, and he wants revenge on her for his son's death. I guess it's good Ono brought Meredith as well, since she's got more experience burning things anyways, and she did an awesome job at burning Hecate, even if it didn't really work out as well as I'd planned. Nothing ever does. My plans stink. I'm like the Scooby-Doo gang always coming up with plans and everything just falls apart. I actually already told you that I missed you, but it wasn't you I was telling it to. When that other girl showed up in my bedroom, she looked just like you. I thought I was dreaming. She pauses, looking around at the weird people like Hip Sauce with his bat wings. At the sight of him, she hugs her doll Nathaniel closer. This isn't a dream, right? This is really happening? That's a good question. Maybe I'm going crazy. Maybe I'm sitting in Happy Vale Sanitarium, rolling around in one of those jackets that zip up in the back in a room where every surface is a pillow. Mom and Dad might even be visiting me, sadly looking through a window at me as I roll around and mumble stuff about angels and maxitars. This is really happening. I say it just as much to convince myself as to reassure her. Why are angels wearing rubber suits? I throw my hands up. So many questions, oh my god. I'm not exactly sure what to tell her, either. It's an angel thing. The suits make them stealthy. I guess so they could sneak up on Hecate. Oh. One nice thing about Meredith is she can tell when I've had enough follow-up questions. Pasher steps back from Hecate, wiping her spit off his goggles. I completely missed everything he was saying to her. I wonder how long Hecate's got to look for penance and how many she has to collect. If she's doing it in the dark, they could be hard to find. Abaddon, he says to the orange suit. Send her to the pit. Gladly, Abaddon remarks. He moves away from the crowd of Hecate's followers, points at them once like don't even think about it, and then walks over to Hecate. He moves like someone with a lot of confidence, or anger, maybe both. It can be hard to tell the difference sometimes. I didn't used to think angels got angry, but in the past couple years, I've learned that they kind of act like us a lot of the time, including lying and keeping secrets. Abaddon steps between Duma and Hecate, holds up a single hand, then clenches it into a fist with a squeak of his rubber glove. The ground under Hecate rumbles and fat iron bars shoot up in a circle around her with a heavy clang as they meet above her head. It looks like a big bird cage, by which I mean a bird cage that's big, not a cage for Big Bird. Although I guess Big Bird could fit in there, kind of hunched over, 
Big Bird's just a normal person in a suit anyways, according to Pasher. I thought he was a puppet they brought to life in the workshop. Honestly, Pasher ruins some things. Duma finally lowers his finger and Hecate gasps like she was underwater and finally came up for air. She clutches at her throat, racking her nails down her skin and leaving marks. Her eyes snap towards Abaddon. You were fools to come here, she snarls, grabbing the bars like some sort of cartoon villain. Then her snarl turns into a big grin full of nasty yellow teeth. She turns and looks at me with her angry, stabby eyes. I'll see you again soon, you little... Abaddon swings his fist down like he's a carpenter with an invisible hammer, and the entire cage with Hecate in it collapses into the floor like an express elevator, kicking up a huge cloud of dust. Smash! Someone in the crowd of onlookers shrieks. Hipsaw starts coughing on the dust and tries to clear his throat. Oh, I wonder what she was going to call me. I'm sure it wasn't nice. All right. That was delightful, but we have to leave. Duma says, turning and walking quickly over to Meredith and grabbing her by the arm. Now! Meredith looks up at him with confusion in her eyes, and the air around her starts to waver with heat. You don't want to scare or anger Meredith. I'm pretty sure Duma knows what she can do, but he doesn't seem the least bit worried about it. Pasher takes my hand gently. Let's get you home, Lily. Most of Hecate's people just stand there tearing their hair out and wailing. A few are hugging pillars and smacking their heads against them, leaving bloody marks on the stone. One old man is writhing on the floor and clawing at the air next to where the dead guy with the weirdly huge arms is lying with some gross stuff squishing out from underneath him. Abaddon moves over to them and puts his hands up again in that threatening gesture. He's less menacing the more he wiggles his fingers, though. Suddenly, I remembered something important. Wait, I say, there's... We can't wait. Duma snaps angrily. No, not angrily. He sounds scared. I tug on Pasher's hand. But there's another kid. A boy named Ambrose. He's here too. He doesn't belong here. He said he knows you. And there's some people I rescued from a dungeon and promised I'd come back for. And my brother. Ambrose Vickers. Pasher seems to let the name roll around in his mouth for a bit. We don't have time to find him, I'm afraid. He pulls my hand lightly, like he's trying to guide me away from hip sauce and my Maxitar. Maybe in time we can return, but not now. As for those others, they've been warped by Hecate and Lamia. To take them back to Earth with us would surely kill them. They're actually safer here now. How can they be safer? I ask. The veil will collapse if it doesn't have someone with the ability to keep it together. Pasher! Dulma shouts. Bring her! Pasher pulls again on my hand. He manages to continue to seem calm even though Duma is clearly starting to panic. I don't understand why they seem so scared. But if an angel like Duma seems frightened of something, I shouldn't question it. Oh god, but Roger knows where my Charizard is. We need to rescue Roger or I'm never finding that thing! Roger, I start to say. Roger is safe here, too. Lily, Meredith calls. Come on! But my Charizard... Lily, please, we need to go. I am going. I'm just thinking while I go. I'm allowed to think. If you didn't think while you ran, you'd probably find yourself running into stuff or getting to the end of the run and having no idea where you were. Also, Pasher moves fast, but I got little legs and it takes twice as many steps to make one of his. I feel like I'm going to trip. I try to tell him my legs aren't as long as his. My- The Charizard is glued to the bottom of a shoebox in the back of your closet. What? All this time? I look back. Abaddon is still standing by Hecate's followers, who have stopped their wailing and shouting. They're just standing there watching us quietly. Two of them step away from each other, leaving a gap in between them. Through it, I see a familiar face with a long scar running from her ear to her mouth. Just like one Lisa Welch almost gave me. She raises a hand as if to wave goodbye. It can't be Ono. My mind is playing tricks on me. It must be because I forgot to ask to take her with us. 
I glance over at where she lay in a pool of her own blood with a spear shoved through her by Hecate. The spear's still there, but the blood and Ono are gone. Wait, what? My feet decide to go in the opposite direction as I trip over them, falling on my knees. Pasher drags me a little before pausing and pulling me back up to my feet. Ahead of us, Duma and Meredith are just about to go through the door when the sound bellows out from the corridor like the howling of a thousand angry trumpets. Duma hesitates right in front of the arch and then a massive wind blasts through from the hall. Meredith squeals and covers her head with her hands as she and Duma are knocked off their feet. It reminds me of this one time I went to the ocean and while I was playing near the water, this giant wave came out of nowhere and bowled me over. They spin like tumbleweeds back toward us. Oh no, Pasher says. Why is his voice trembling? Abaddon yells, but he doesn't finish his thought. The door is gone. There's nothing but a wall there. Just smooth stones. It's not even like it shut or anything. It's like it's always been a wall. If I blinked, I'd probably have thought we got turned around or something. No door. I look back at the other side of the room where there is another exit to Hecate's chamber. It's across the room, past the crowd of her followers. Ono is standing there among them, watching me with her arms crossed. She's got a smile on her face that makes me nervous. It's not a friendly smile. It's a Lisa Welch standing next to Mr. Longbow, my old elementary school principal kind of smile. The one that says, You're in trouble now, Lily. I let go of Pasher's hand and look at Ono in her mummy wrappings, standing quietly among Hecate's crew. Ono, oh what's going on? How are you still alive? Abaddon grabs my shoulder. We'll get you out of here, child. Don't panic. It seems to me you angels are the ones panicking. I snap. Abaddon lets go of my shoulder and stiffens. I hope I didn't offend him. After all, he just smashed a woman into the floor with one fist, and I kind of don't want to get smashed into the floor like that. I turn back to Ono. You can come with us. Pasher says the veil won't collapse with Hecate gone. Hecate's followers move back behind Ono. You really are clueless, aren't you? She says in a nasty voice. I feel a hand on my shoulder again. Abaddon pulls me back from Ono and steps between us. He raises his fist, the rubber glove creaking with how tightly he clenches it. I think he's going to impale Ono on a spike or drop a cage on her, but nothing happens. He looks at his fist, shakes it, and nothing happens. And then he turns to look back at Pasher. The wind howls again. It almost sounds like a person howling. I can't help but grit my teeth when I hear it. Ono smirks at us. Daddy's home, she says, baring her pointy teeth in a snarl. Daddy? I whispered to Abaddon. He doesn't respond. Lily, Pasher moves in front of me to stand next to Abaddon. The veil isn't Hecate's domain. Duma is here now too, holding Meredith's arm. He pushes her over next to me and stands beside Pasher and Abaddon. All three angels form a wall between us and Ono. It's Samuel's, says Duma. Samuel. I shiver at the mention of his name. Of course the veil belongs to him. A place out of time. He told me that himself when I met him last year. I had just gotten Felix's totem, giving me four and all. And Samuel pulled me out of reality like it was nothing. He tried to trick me into changing the past for some reason. And then took one of the totems as a toll for allowing me to return home. He never touched me, but I had nightmares for months after meeting him. Why didn't I realize the veil belonged to him? But then all this crazy business with Hecate. Why did she act like she was... Oh God, I whisper. This was never about me. I look at Pasher. This was about getting you to come save me. Ono's mouth curls up into a nasty smile. It all makes awful sense to me at last. Bring me into the veil torture me for the amusement of Hecate, get me to think I'm there to fight Hecate, bring Lisa Welch, make the angels have to come get me themselves. And I played right along, even asking Ono to bring me Nathaniel. 
Instead, she brought Meredith twice as much bait. Or three times as much if you count Lisa. Personally, I'd have been okay if they left her. Someone in the back of the crowd starts clapping. Just one person, clapping slowly. No one else claps with them. I feel kind of bad for whoever it is, but at the same time, it's not really an appropriate time to start clapping. The clapping stops, and then a pair of hands appear on Onu's shoulders and a hush falls over everyone in the room. Samuel appears from out of the darkness directly behind Ono, like there was a shadow he was standing in, but there wasn't. He was simply not there a moment ago, and now he is. He smiles at us, looking exactly like he did a year ago and every day and night in my nightmares since then. Everything he's wearing is white. He really stands out compared to the rest of the room. All of Hecate's followers are grimy and gray or yellowish or just kind of a gross green color. Samuel looks like he just got run through a car wash. He'd probably sparkle if he were outside in the sun. The angels cluster tighter together in their rubber suits. Meredith peeks out from around Duma's butt. Oh, who's he? Samuel, I say. Is that good or bad? Bad, says Abaddon. It's so good to see you, brothers. Samuel says softly. He rubs his chin. Maybe he's used to having a beard, I don't know. Why not take those ridiculous suits off and let's do things face to face? Abaddon brings his hands up threateningly. Foul father of demons, I'll... Samuel shakes his head. No. That's all he says. Just no. Immediately, Abaddon's wrist bent backwards with a loud snap. He grunts in pain but doesn't cry out. Me? I'd probably have screamed if my wrists bent that way. Abaddon's a tough guy, I guess. Still, his wrists are bent nearly half off, and he brings his arms back quickly, hugging them to his chest. Pasher steps forward. I hold my breath. Please don't kill Pasher. Brother, this was an unnecessary plot. Did you think I didn't foresee your trap before you set it? Samuel pets Ono's hair like a loving father. And yet you came anyway. Was I not supposed to detect you in those suits? I am he of a million eyes, little brother. Why, I could smell, Duma, the moment you all set foot within these walls. Duma stiffens. Meredith sniffs the air and then looks at me and shrugs. I don't think she quite appreciates the predicament we're in. I mouth, we are going to die, at her. She smiles back. No, Meredith, no. I said we're going to die. She nods. I can't believe we're seeing angels. She whispers. What is wrong with you, girl? Seriously. Samuel looks around the chamber. He sees the dead man with the giant arms and the grisly hole through his body and makes a face like my dad does when he's finally satisfied with one of his dirges he always writes. It's his not bad if I say so myself face. My dad writes a lot of dirges. They're not my cup of tea, but I don't drink tea, so even tea isn't my cup of tea. He points with both hands at the body. I think in part to mock Abaddon. Your work, little Abby? Abaddon doesn't say anything. And what did you do with my queen in a box? Samuel asks with amusement. He must be talking about Hecate. We put her in a smaller box, says Pasher matter-of-factly. Indeed. Samuel laughs. It sounds like a human mixed with a hyena. The oubliette? I'll bet she's clawing her way out of your bottomless pit as we speak. She's old, but she's spry. What do you want, Samuel? Duma snaps. Samuel looks at him and licks his lips. I can see Duma tense up inside his suit. His whole body goes rigid like a statue. Maybe he thinks Samuel is going to eat him right in front of us. I wonder if he could do anything about it if Samuel tried. I just want to know why three of my brothers came to visit and didn't even bother to let me know in advance that they were coming. 
He shrugs and rolls his eyes with that same sarcastic smile. Abaddon is standing beside me with his hands hanging off the ends of his arms like wet noodles. He's been staring at them for a minute or two now, ever since Pasher moved ahead of him. I can hear him breathing inside his suit. He seems to be breathing kind of raggedly. He takes a deep breath and then tenses up and both hands snap back into normal place with a loud crack from each. Ooh. Meredith is watching with me and we both flinch at the sight of it. Holy sh... Meredith doesn't finish. You insult us with your false pride, Pasher says. His voice sounds irritated, like when he's had to explain something to me for the tenth or umpteenth time. I'm not sure what number umpteen comes after, but it's clearly in the teens. You set Hecate on my charge in order to bring me here. What is it you want with me? No more games. Samuel lets go of Ono and brushes past her. She smiles up at him like advertisements want you to believe babies do in the presence of Santa. They don't, okay? They don't. Any baby you see smiling at Santa Claus is either a robot baby or blind. Babies cry when they see Santa. He's big and hairy and red-faced and really kind of scary. I don't know why they keep inviting him to the local mall every year. Even he seems to not want to be there half of the time. Admiration. That's the word I'm looking for. She admires him. I regret shedding a single tear for you, Ono. Pasher steps toward his brother. He unfastens something on the side of his neck, and there's a hiss of air from the hose attached to the tank at his side. It quiets down after a second, and he reaches up and pulls the gas mask off. All I can see is the side of his head, a bit of a pale cheekbone and hair so white it matches Samuel's. I want him to turn around so I can see his face, but he doesn't. It's nice to see your face, brother. Samuel grins. It actually looks like a sincere smile, not one of his dangerous smiles where you get the feeling he's thinking about taking your face off with his teeth. Then he looks at me and winks. I scowl back. You want to know why I brought you here? It's simple. You won't speak to me otherwise. This seemed to be the only way to have an audience. You've put multiple lives in danger. You exaggerate. I put one in danger. He holds up his finger, wiggles it at Duma tauntingly, and then points it at me. And her? She's a speck. He spits when he says it. You just find another in a heartbeat. Oh. Pasher shakes his head. I still don't get a view of his face. It's agonizing to be so close and not be able to see it. Why the games? Why Hecate? Samuel looks back at Ono. She beams at him with her crooked smile. Why? Because I was bored. At worst, I thought I'd be mopping little Lily off the stones while you wept yet for another lost charge. At best, I'd have twisted your precious knife into my own personal sword that cuts the veil. Imagine having her at my beck and call. I'd be able to tear down the walls of all the heavens. Oh my gosh, Meredith whispers, tugging at my sleeve. Are they talking about you? I'm glad you're keeping up with all this, I mutter. Duma looks back at us both. I expect him to shush us just like grown-ups always do when they're having an adult conversation and kids try to have one of their own, but he doesn't. He looks at Meredith, then at me, then at Meredith again. Finally, he puts a finger to the side of his head, pressing on his ear and very slightly with his free hand points at Meredith. No, he's not pointing at Meredith, he's pointing at her doll. He's pointing at Nathaniel, and then he nods at me. I can see his eyes through the goggles. He's trying to tell me something. Well, I'm here now, Pasher is saying. What did you want to discuss? Samuel claps his hands happily. This is wonderful! I don't know how he's able to do it, but he's even scarier when he's genuinely happy. I guess it's like seeing a clown smile. You just know that if it's smiling, bad things are going to happen. Meredith? I whisper twice as quietly as before. May I see Barbie? 
I swear I'll give it back. What? What are you going to do? She looks down at her doll, then narrows her eyes at me. I don't say anything more, I just stare at her. After a second of thought, she holds her doll out cautiously. Thank you. The moment I wrap my fingers around Nathaniel's plastic form, I feel my body temperature rise. It's like I'm sitting out in the sun on a warm day and there's no breeze. I almost immediately hear Nathaniel shouting inside my head. Lily, listen to me. Tear a hole. Samuel is looking over his shoulder at the group of nasties Hecate had left behind. I look down at Nathaniel. He's made of plastic and doesn't have any seams. Samuel keeps talking. Let's go somewhere more private. When did you last get to see my personal chambers? What? I think to Nathaniel. Tear a hole in you? There's silence. I look up. Samuel is staring at me. His eyes are bottomless black like the pit they put Hecate in. What do you think you're doing, you little flea? He snarls at me. What fleas do, I guess? I say. Fleeing? Pasher turns to look at me. I don't think to look back at him and finally get to see his face, though. Because Nathaniel's screaming inside of my head. Tear a hole in the veil! So, I do. I think about the whole room ripping in half like pages of a book. I imagine one of those big, jagged cracks like an earthquake makes in the ground. And it's as simple as thinking about it. More so because I'm double-charged from holding Nathaniel. The doll erupts into a fireball in my hand and the room splits with a roar, one half lurching away like a moving sidewalk and throwing almost everyone off their feet. When it's over, only the four angels remain standing, with a divide between Pasher and Samuel as long as five bathtubs. Big bathtubs. It's a large divide is what I'm saying, and inside it is the black void. Samuel roars from across the split. I blink, and within that instant, he's standing on our side, looming over me. His eyes are fire. His mouth is full of teeth. His fingers are scissor blades. Give me that toy! He reaches down for Nathaniel, but just as he does, Pasher grabs his shoulder and throws him back. He tumbles backward. I only have a second to think, and I used to give a nonsense shout and think of the tear again. I clench Nathaniel and make a motion like I can just rip the world in two just with my hands. The doll flares up and this time the entire room in front of us rips with a scream, cutting across Samuel himself and all of his followers on the other side of the crack. It looks like someone tearing a movie screen in half. Samuel's top half wings toward the ceiling while his bottom half goes down towards the floor, but neither half bleeds. Nor do any of the people cut in half across the room. It's more like just a flat painting of them being torn apart. Samuel flails his arms and howls with rage. Duma grabs Meredith while I feel hands under my armpits and realize I'm being hoisted up by Abaddon. What was that? Meredith starts, and then the three angels in their rubber suits jump into the void while all I can hear is the sound of Samuel above us screaming in fury and my own screaming as I fall once again through the empty black of nothingness. This time with two strong hands gripping me tight and a voice in my head saying, Hold on, Lily, and don't look back. I don't know which way is back to not look, so I close my eyes instead. I hear Samuel. He's coming for us. And now he's pissed. I'm Lily Madwhip, and my life's a beach. We're falling through space. I've fallen through space before, but from the wild look in Meredith's eyes, this is her first time. Dumma is holding her in his arms, but she flails around like a floppy fish and he struggles to keep a grip on her. They're too far away for me to hear, but it looks like he's shouting at her, probably to hold still. The wind is shrieking past us. I don't remember there being wind before. Honestly, my last time falling through space felt much quicker than this, but I didn't really have anyone else around me for it, and it's hard to keep track of how long you've been falling when there's nothing around you. I should get a watch. I used to have one. It came in the mail after I sent in a bunch of box tops from my favorite cereal, Lucky Charms. The hands of the watch were leprechaun arms. 
Pasher holds me tight to his chest, crushed against his rubber suit. I grip him like a little monkey, although one hand still holds Nathaniel. I'm afraid if Pasher and I let go of each other, we'll fall away and never see each other again. He's telling me to just hold on. There's a light at the end of the tunnel. We just have to reach the other side. I don't argue with him. Something screams past us, and this time it's not the wind. It's an angry scream. And with it comes a white streak that wallops Duma and Meredith, sending them spinning like tops. I get a brief glimpse of Meredith's face, her hair whipping about her head and her mouth a perfect O. Duma's mask and satchel are torn off and fly straight at me and Pasher, narrowly missing us. I feel the hose and pack brush through my hair that's billowing out behind me. What was that? I yell against the wind. Pasher and I watch Duma try to reel Meredith in by the arm. With his goggles and breather off, I see his face and it's a grim mask. His eyes are empty holes, as black as the space we're falling through. His nose is little more than just the bridge, and he hasn't got any lips on his mouth. Just the gums and teeth. He reminds me of Skeletor from the Masters of the Universe cartoons. Meredith sees his face too, and she starts screaming loud enough to challenge the wind. She kicks at Duma, possibly confused as to whether it's the same person he was holding her just a moment ago. I can see Duma trying to say something to her, probably calm down or it's just me, but I don't think calming people is one of Duma's gifts. I wonder if they have an angel for that. Abaddon appears nearby. His body is stiff, arms at his side, but as he starts to pass us, he spreads his arms out and it slows him enough to fall at the same speed we are. Are we even falling? Falling suggests there's an up and a down, and I don't know that there really is here. Maybe we're just in a big wind tunnel. Abaddon shouts something to Pasher, and Pasher nods. Samuel, he whispers to me. I see it first, a dot of fire hurtling straight in our direction. The white streak burns through an empty void around us, this time aiming for Pasher and me. Pasher grips me in his arms and twists, rolling away from it. It screams past us, and in doing so, I see what it is. It's Samuel, his face twisted in anger, his white suit shredded, and a massive pair of shiny metallic feathered wings come out of his back. We look at each other for that one second I can see him before Pasher's body moves between us, and then Samuel is gone, screeching into the blackness like one of those harpies I made back at the library. Maybe harpies are just female angels. Pasher pushes me from his chest, and I squeal in confusion. But just as his hands let go of me, I feel another pair grab me from behind. Abaddon, he's got me now. Pasher rolls away, and I see the back of his outfit has about seven or eight ragged tears going up it. Exposing his back, some dark liquid is running out of him. I don't know if angels can bleed, but it definitely looks like he's bleeding some sort of oil or something. Pasher! I reach out for him, but Abaddon clenches me tightly against him and tucks his chin into the top of my head. Be still. He'll be fine. But he can't protect you and himself at the same time. I see Duma and Meredith still struggling off in the distance. She's trying to kick him in his skeletal face. I don't blame her. If I saw that pulling me toward it, I'd try to kick it in the face too. She gets some good solid heel bashes in, but he doesn't react to any of it. He just keeps trying to pull her close and clack his teeth at her. Samuel comes again, moving so fast he's just an angry blur of white claws again. I don't know how we're going to get away from him when he can move like this. Pasha rips his goggles and mask off, tossing them away and where they quickly get sucked up by the void. He looks at me. I'm happy to say that he looks nothing like Duma with his creepy Skeletor face. Pasher looks like a normal person, but his skin is like a marble statue. His eyes burn with light like diamonds catching in the sun. When he looks at me, I have to shield my eyes. Things are kind of intense though, and I end up punching myself in the face. It probably looks pretty stupid to him. Why is Lily punching herself in the face? I'm sure Roger would laugh. He used to make me punch myself in the face pretty regularly, and he'd go, why are you hitting yourself? Stop hitting yourself. A pair of golden wings rip out of Pasher's suit. 
They spread out wide behind him, slowing him like a parachute, and then Samuel slams into him, and the two of them become a flurry of arms and wings, like a rubber band ball made out of people. I watch helplessly as they disappear into the darkness together. He's going to be okay, Abaddon says. I don't know if he actually believes that, though. This is what Pasher does. It may not happen but once every few millennia, but the veil is his to defend. His and his alone. No matter how many times Samuel tries to tear it down from the inside. Skeletor finally gets Meredith back in his arms and leans in close, talking to her. I wish I knew what he was saying. From the look in Meredith's eyes, he's not exactly telling her anything comforting. Knowing Duma, I'll bet he's singing her one of those crazy stupid angel songs he knows. The ones that almost put me to sleep once. But I imagine if I were falling through an empty void being gripped by a man with a skull for a face, no amount of boring singing would get me to shut my eyes. How long are we going to keep falling? I ask Abaddon. Not long, he says. In fact, get ready for a hard... And then he's letting go of me and I slam into the earth at probably a gazillion miles per hour. Funny thing is, it only feels like hitting the ground when I fall out of bed. I mean, my bed is pretty high, but still. I had to have been going pretty fast, and yet I'm not the least bit dead. There's just a puff sound, and loose sand sprays up around me, landing in my face. Ugh. This must be what meteors feel like when they don't burn up on entry. A second later, I hear another puff as Meredith makes her own small crater just off to my left. We lay there for a moment, utterly confused as to what just happened. Overhead, the sky is blue and there's a sound of water and birds. I lift my head. We're lying on the beach by the ocean. At least it looks like the ocean, Ugh, and smells like the ocean. I think the ocean stinks so bad because it's like 50% whale pee. You know, whales must have to pee all the time. There's no way they don't. They're constantly drinking water. I have a glass of water before a car trip and we're hitting every rest stop between home and Nana's house. Whales are drinking water like it's going out of style. They gotta be peeing constantly. That's one of the reasons I don't like going in the ocean. Whale pee. Well, sharks and whale pee. Angry sharks, because they're swimming in whale pee, getting it all in their eyes, and they can't even blink. My head hurts, Meredith says. At least it's still attached to your neck, I point out. I shake the sand out of my face, but there's sand up the back of my shirt, too. I hate that. It'd be fine if it stayed up there, but it doesn't stay up there. It always falls down the back of my pants. Ugh. I reach up and brush it out before sitting up, but I can still feel some in my butt crack. Meredith is laying flat on her back, making a sand angel with her arms and legs. Where are we? She asks. Is this heaven? Heaven doesn't leave you with sand in your butt crack. I mean, maybe it does, but that doesn't seem like my idea of heaven. It's a beach. Oh, Meredith points up. Look, there's a hole up in the sky. She's right. There's a big, crooked hole in the sky. It looks like a jagged wound. I'm pretty sure we just fell out of it. Inside it is the emptiness of the veil. Outside it, clouds drift lazily by as clouds do. Sometimes I wish I was a cloud just floating around in the sky and looking down at everything and everybody. If I saw Lisa Welch, I'd rain on her. Then I'd go to sleep up in the mountains where clouds go when they're tired. Sometimes clouds don't make it to the mountains, especially out west where there aren't many mountains, and then they go to sleep on the ground and that's when you get fog. I sit up and look around. The beach has lots of driftwood and seagulls. There's one seagull in particular who's eyeing us and doing some sort of seagull dance on the sand. It's leaving seagull footy prints all over the place. I wonder if it's tapping its feet in Morse code or trying to spell something with its footy prints, but I'm probably giving it more credit than it deserves. It's just a seagull. I'll probably learn someday that it was spelling hello. Meredith rolls over and tries to brush off her back. Ugh, I got sand all over me. That's what happens when you lay on a beach. She gets up and tries to shake it off like a dog. Ah, uh, I look away to keep some of it from getting in my eyes and mouth. Abaddon and Duma are nowhere to be seen. Did they just drop us by the ocean and leave? 
Well, that kind of seems like something Duma might do. But it's hard to believe Pasture would just leave me with someone who just drops me and leaves. Abaddon? I call. A seagull answers. I don't think it's Abaddon, though. I look at it for a moment to see if it does anything angelic. But it just starts pecking at some white goop on the ground. I don't know Abaddon that well, but I don't think he would eat goop. They went back to help Pasher, Nathaniel says through his totem. I look at it. It stares at me with its melted face. They're inside the veil. The tear needs to be mended from there. They can't patch it from your side. That's like trying to sew a bullet wound shut from inside the hole. Can't I fix it? I ask. I'm the one who tore it. I can hear him chuckle. <laughs> You're a knife, not a stapler. <laughs> right. Just wait where you are. Jophiel is on the way to fetch you both. He goes quiet. I shake him to see if he's got more to say, but I don't think he actually feels it wherever he is. Meredith crawls over to me, shivering a little. Can I have Barbie back? Oh yeah, of course. I hand her her dolly and feel immediately colder. I haven't noticed how cold it was on the beach before. Meredith stops shivering and sighs. The big, ragged hole in the sky overhead looks a little smaller now. I can't tell if it actually is smaller or just further away. It's a bit dizzying to look at since it kind of overlaps everything like a rip in a movie screen. One of the nearby clouds gets sucked up into the tear like dust bunnies into a vacuum cleaner as it drifts over the water. Where are we? Meredith asks. I have no idea, so I just shrug. If I had Pasher... If I had his totem on me, and he was at his station instead of inside the veil, he could tell me exactly where we were. Meredith puts a hand over her eyes. Oh, look! Maybe that's one of the angels! I turn and see something dark and human-looking tumble out of the sky hole. It doesn't make a sound, just falls into the water with a splash. Seconds later, another dark something falls out of the sky hole with an even larger splash into the ocean. Then the hole seems to just zip up like a pair of pants and the sky is empty. Minus one cloud. Poor cloud. Something in my tummy feels like when you find a pile of stinky garbage behind the grocery store and pick up a candy bar wrapper only to have a gazillion cockroaches scuttle out. I don't think those were angels, I say. Meredith gets up and brushes herself off just as one of the things breaches the surface of the water. It's shiny and wet, which is kind of obvious since it's in the ocean. I can't make out much beyond that, but the bad feeling in my stomach grows by about five pounds. Meredith takes a step back. No, that is not an angel. That's good enough for me. Hide. I don't know if these things have seen us yet, but there isn't a whole lot of use for hiding here on the beach. I almost consider just digging a hole in the sand and crawling in it, but my Uncle George has this cabin in the woods by a lake, and we used to go up and stay with him and my aunt and cousin Susie. Whenever we visited before Susie got run over by a boat, I would play on the beach and dig huts in the sand and put my little toy Yodas and Jawas in the huts, but then I'd get called in for lunch and the water would wash the huts flat and I'd never find the Jawas and Yodas again. I spent way too many days digging for Jawas and Yodas. The last thing I want is to dig a Jawa hole for myself and get buried alive at this beach. Meredith runs off and squats in the tall grass at the edge of the beach. I can see the heads of her furry bunny slippers sticking out. The things from the veil might see them and munch on them thinking they're real bunnies. That would be bad. I run over and drop to my tummy beside her. Your bunnies are showing, I hiss. Get down like me. We lie in the tall grass together just as the first thing comes lumbering out of the water. It looks like a person who is trapped in a house fire with crispy black skin. It almost reminds me of Officer Flowers, after Meredith burned her alive, or when my aunt left the turkey in the oven on the wrong setting one Thanksgiving. Thinking about turkey makes me kind of hungry, but at the same time, looking at this crispy guy with his turkey-like skin makes my cockroaches in my tummy scamper even harder. The crispy shambles up the beach like a zombie in a bad horror movie. Its body is lean and bony, and I wonder if it's just as hungry as I am. I don't think it would like any turkey, though. I bet its diet consists of little girls. 
Behind it, the second rises up out of the water, equally charred and black. Their faces are blank like Halloween masks, no eyes that I can see, just smooth, crispy turkey skin. And mouths, of course, because if it's going to be frightening, it's got to have a mouth it can eat you with. What are they? Meredith whispers. I put a finger to my mouth, but don't say shh, because I'm hoping the finger signal is enough. For all we know, these things might have super sensitive hearing and even our whispers will give us away. Meredith sees my finger gesture and nods. I'm relieved she understands. Suddenly, I hear crunching and shuffling nearby, followed by someone's voice. Whoa, dude, what happened to that guy? A couple of young men are standing just off to the side of where Meredith and I are hiding on our tummies. They're wearing wetsuits and carrying surfboards. One is a surfboard with a crazy cartoon of a shark eating a guy. That seems like a bad omen if you're a surfer. Kind of like painting flames on the wings of a plane. I already don't like to fly, but if you had told me I had to ride on a plane with flames on its wings, I'd tell you to go jump in the lake. Look, dude, there's two of them, says the other surfer, pulling his sunglasses off. The crisps turn in their direction. I don't need Pasher to tell me something bad is about to happen. But it'd be nice if he were here. I hope he's able to get out of the veil now that they had to put a band-aid on the hole I made in it. Do they see these things fall through before they closed it? Are they aware that something got through? Are they on their way as we lay here hiding in the tall grass? The first surfer moves toward the Crispies. Can't he see they're not human? I mean, they look human-ish, but humans got eyes and the Crisps don't got eyes. Are you two okay? He asks. Maybe he just genuinely can't see because his brown hair is so shaggy and it hangs down in his eyes. <sighs> They're gonna write it on his tombstone. Died of shagginess. Rip shaggy. The crispy shamble forward. One of them raises its burnt blackened hand and points at its face like it's trying to communicate. The other hunches over and starts to act like it's in pain, clutching its side and shuffling awkwardly. If Pasher was here, he'd tell me it was a trick, or rather a ruse, as he calls them. Magicians perform tricks. Monsters do ruses. That's how I remember what the difference is. If you're ever unsure whether you're dealing with a magician or a monster, just ask yourself if it pulls rabbits out of its hat, that's a magician, or it acts like it's harmless when it's actually not, that's probably a monster. Of course, I know a certain magician who is also a monster. I want to yell at the two guys to run, but the crisps don't know Meredith and I are here, and I'm keeping it that way. I'm pretty sure they came after us. Meredith looks at me with her one good eye and makes a gesture I don't recognize with her shoulders. Kind of a shrug mixed with a head roll. I have no idea who taught her silent gestures. She needs to retake that class, I think. I respond with another finger shush. She turns back to the crisps and shakes her head. The first surfer is within arm's reach of the front crispy. He drops his board and puts his arms out to offer help. Hey man, we've got a truck if you can make it. I don't know where the nearest hospital is, but... He doesn't get to finish that sentence. Meredith? I whisper, risking detection. Put your head down. Don't look. She does. The crispy grabs the surfer's head with both its hands and twists it around on his neck. I can hear the bones crunching and popping. The man's arms flap out of the sides violently before quickly going limp. I can't see his face, but I imagine it's probably got a look of shock on it under all that shaggy hair. His body hangs from his broken neck like a big, useless sack, the crispy keeping a tight grip on the sides of his head, apparently strong enough to hold him up by just the ears. My Uncle George used to tease Roger and me by threatening to pick us up by the ears. He'd grab our ears in his hands and start to pull and tell us, you better hang on or I'm going to rip them off. And then we'd grab his wrists and hold on and he'd pick us up. I think really we were holding ourselves up, but for the longest time, I was convinced he would carry us around by the ears. Holy shoot! The second surfer yells. He drops his surfboard and stumbles backward, tripping over loose sand and falling onto his butt. The second crispy that was hunched over quickly drops to its hands and feet and moves with a sudden frightening speed, dashing at him like a Rottweiler doggy. It pounces on him with long fingers and an open mouth full of teeth. 
I can't see him anymore in the tall grass, but, but I can hear him screaming and the sound of the crispy using its teeth and nails on him. Have you ever heard someone who was really, really hungry eat a turkey leg? It's like that. Yes, I'm still hungry for turkey. I can't help it. But the more I think about it while all this is going on, the more I think I might swear off turkey forever. Within seconds, the surfer's screams sound like he's just really passionate about gargling. I look at Meredith. She's got her face buried in the ground and her hands over her ears. I'm glad she's not seeing this. I see this sort of awfulness so regularly that if I could just keep a therapist, they'd be able to write a book about me. Meredith, I think, still has a chance to just make for a short paper in a medical journal. I pat her on the back gently, but when she starts to lift her head, I press down as firmly as I can. Don't look. Not yet. Crispy number one lowers the dead surfer to the ground gently. I can barely make out the back of it as it's hunched over. A moment later, I hear an awful, wet, ripping sound and more bone crunching, and then it stands back up holding just its head. The head happens to be turned in our direction. And the surfer's eyes look like he's just really sleepy if it weren't for the fact that his neck ends in... Well, I don't want to go into detail, but let's just say it's a really upsetting sight. I cover my eyes with one hand and peek through my fingers while pressing down harder on Meredith's back, afraid she'll look up and see it. Then something unexpected happens. I want to say something weird happens, but I think the word weird has kind of lost all meaning at this point. Did anything weird happen while you were away, Lily? I went for a car ride with my dead brother, summoned a butter knife, watched a maxitar cut the head off of a woman with a snake's butt, fell through the hole in the sky, and watched a turkey eat a surfer. Define weird. The second surfer gets back up. So yeah, that was something unexpected. Did he fend off the crispy that pounced on him like a puma? There's some blood dripping out of his nose, and he's got the same sleepy look in his eyes as the surfer whose head is no longer attached to his body. But other than that, he seems... Well, okay, his body is strangely a burnt black color like the Crispy's bodies, and then I realized that it is the Crispy's body. The second surfer's eyes roll around in their sockets for a moment before blinking and snapping forward like magnets. He looks at the first crispy with his friend's head in its hands and grabs the first crispy by its own ears, pulling back hard. The first crispy's head comes off like a hand puppet, complete with the hand underneath. You heard that right. There's a hand sticking up out of its neck stump. Just a big old crispy hand which gives a thumbs up to its buddy before placing the first surface decapitated head on itself with the hand sliding up into its neck and disappearing somewhere inside. Ugh. I want to take a moment to say that I do not say anything through all of this, but I really, really want to because as Lisa Welch would say, what the F? The first surfer's sleepy eyes similarly roll around in their sockets for a moment. I imagine the hand inside the head is tugging at the cords and things like a puppeteer or something, getting everything adjusted until snap, the eyes spring forward, blink, and then turn to look at his buddy and nods. Both Crispies drop down out of sight, leaving me really tense for a moment as all I can hear is them moving about in the grass. The first one stands up finally after a couple minutes, now wearing the dead surfer's wetsuit, which it zips up. The second Crispy reappears a moment later, also dressed in its surfer's clothes. I try not to think about the two naked, headless corpses lying somewhere very close to where Meredith and I are. Ralvi, says Crispy number one, now fully disguised as the surfer. It seems to have trouble working the surfer's tongue and lips, just moving the jaw up and down. Crispy number two seems to understand it nonetheless, and bends over, gathering up the remains of the surfer it's wearing and throwing them over its shoulder. I make the mistake of continuing to watch this horror show and get a good view of what's left of the second surfer's neck. I stop covering my eyes and cover my mouth instead, quickly looking away. I can feel the cockroaches in my tummy trying to work their way up and out. Uree. Is the last thing I hear the crispy say as they shuffle away. I don't know where they're going, but I am pretty sure they're on the hunt for Meredith and me.
After two minutes of just the ocean waves and wind blowing through the grass, I finally take my hand off Meredith's back. She uncovers her ears and looks up. Are, are they gone? She whispers. I don't know, I admit. Stay here and I'll take a look. She hugs her knees to her chest and curls into a ball like a pill bug. I sit up and peek over the top of the grass. No monsters in sight. I feel like at any moment they're going to suddenly leap out of somewhere and yell, Gotcha! Or at least as close to that as they can without using their tongues. And the next thing I know, I'll be looking at Meredith from atop a new burnt turkey body. I don't want to have a hand up inside my head. I don't want to be dead. Considering what Pasher says being dead is like, I wonder which part of you your soul stays in if someone dismembers you. Jeez, I can't stop my own hands from shaking. Pasher, where are you? I crouch back down. Meredith has the same expression I imagine is on my face. I don't see anything, I tell her. But we need to wait here and just be quiet. Someone is coming. Who? An angel. I forgot his name. The one who took Lisa Welch. I wish he'd left Lisa and taken Meredith and me instead. Lisa seemed happy surrounded by Hecate's weirdos. She could stay there in the veil annoying Samuel until he twisted her head off and let her crispy wear her like a hat. We sit there together in the high grass, huddled close and waiting to either be found or murdered or found and rescued. I hug Meredith because she's warm. Extra warm since she's got her totem on her. Something tells me, though, that even her gift wouldn't have been any use against the Crispies. So, Meredith says softly, this has been quite an adventure. I nod. Welcome back to my life. You wouldn't believe what's been happening in it. Oh? She cocks her head. What? Well, it all started when I noticed I was getting followed by this big black dog. I'm Lily Madwip, and I just want to go home. And then my Maxitar chopped her head clean off like swoosh. Whoa, gross. That's Meredith. She's one of my best friends. We escaped from some pretty messed up stuff together. First, it was a crazy magician who wanted to kill her, but then not kill her, and then tricked her into killing other people. That's a long and totally different story. And then we escaped from this place called The Veil vale that's like the labyrinth in that movie with the Goblin King I can never remember the name of, but it's got tons of puppets. And now we're waiting by a beach for an angel to show up and take us home. You have the coolest adventures. Uh, no, I almost died. Like, seven or eight times. So many times I've lost count. Meredith shrugs. I don't think she understands the gravity of it. I'm honestly not sure what gravity has to do with things either, but my mom always says that. I don't think you understand the gravity of your actions, Lily. Usually followed by something like, money doesn't grow on trees, or that turtle was a living creature. Gravity wasn't what killed my turtle. That was poor habitat planning. We sit in the tall grass by the beach. Little bugs bite our feet and ankles, leaving itchy red bites. Meredith and I squish them to pass the time while we sit hiding in the tall grass by the beach. I feel a little bad, killing something that's alive. I wonder if bugs have tiny souls that wait in their squished bodies like my brother Roger when he got squished by a truck. Do bugs go to bug heaven? Bug hell? There's zillions of bugs in the world, I've been told. I imagine bug hell would fill up pretty quickly. Angels probably look at people like bugs. Just billions of us waiting to be squished and fill our people hell. Somewhere in the grass with us is a pair of decapitated surfer heads, but I'm not about to go looking for them. I can hear heavy fly buzzing activity nearby. That's probably where they are. Meredith and I play rock, paper, scissors. Normally I'm really good at it because I can see things before they happen, but without Pasher to help me, it's really difficult. Meredith wins most of the time. She says it's psychology. You gotta play the other person. I thought that's what we were doing. She also tells me about the new town she's living in. It sounds really nice. I'm happy where I am because I know everything about almost everybody. 
If we had to move, I'd have to learn everything all over again. Like how Greg from the bus doesn't know he's adopted even though he's got orange hair and doesn't look like either of his black-haired parents. Or the secret to why my old school principal, Mr. Longbow, is so obsessed with eagles. Seriously, if you've ever been in his office, there's eagles everywhere. He probably even has eagles on his underwear. What cartoons do you watch? Meredith asks me. I'm not allowed to watch TV. Mom and Dad thinks it gives me nightmares. Nightmares? I got sick with the chicken pox a few years ago and stayed home and had to take lots of baths and sleep wrapped in a sheet. My mom let me watch PBS. There was this show called The Letter People that had these freaky looking puppets. And the letter T puppet had really long teeth. And I had a dream that night that he was under my bed and tried to eat my feet. Oh. Thinking about the puppet in that show makes me think of Snap and Pop, the two monsters we witnessed murder the two surfers a few hours ago. I call them Crispies because their bodies looked burned up. I can still see that one guy's head getting ripped off in my brain. Ugh, stupid brain remembering all the worst stuff. I wish I could tape over things like that instead of rewind and play them back over and over again. I tug at my ear. Yeah, educational shows are weird and scary. I like the Smurfs. I don't know what Smurfs is. She starts to describe it. I just nod and bite my lip and watch the sky getting darker overhead and pinch another buggy that was crawling over my foot looking for a spot to nibble. It feels like forever. Meredith and I sit in the tall grass, waiting for the angel Nathaniel said was coming. We're too scared that the Crispies are nearby to come out of hiding. I peek my head out every now and then to see if anyone's there. I'm afraid the angel's going to show up and not be able to find us. I'm more afraid that I'm going to see a pair of familiar-looking surfers in wetsuits. I hear the sound of a car coming. It sounds like it's not a very happy car. I peek over the top of the grass and see headlights. All I can think is that it's Felix coming for me again. I have to remind myself that he doesn't know where we are. Well, then again, I don't know where we are either, so maybe that makes us even. A patch of grass nearby bursts into flames. Oh, declares Meredith. Oh my goodness. She tries to pat out the fire with her bare hands. That was me. Sorry. The car screeches to a halt right in front of us. There's a man behind the steering wheel. It's not Felix. He's much older, like in his 60s or hundreds, I'm not sure. All his hair is white and he's got a big beard. He almost resembles Santa Claus if Santa was on a diet and drove around in an unhappy-sounding car. I sigh in relief. There's a dog sitting in the passenger seat beside him. One of those big, blonde ones with cute eyes and a pointy snout. I think they're called Golden Retrievers. It's got a chain with a set of tags soldiers wear around its neck. The man and the dog look out the window in our direction. I hope it's too dark to see the top of my head, but I hold perfectly still in case they do see it but think I'm just a weird plant. Hey, the old man says at the weird plant. I blink. He takes my blink for a hello. Are you Meredith? I'm Meredith, says Meredith, poking her head up out of the grass. Her hands are covered with soot from putting out the fire. Oh my goodness, he says at the side of her face. Poor Meredith. Then you must be Lizzie Magnet. <sighs> Something like that. I say, giving up my disguise. Fair enough. He looks at his dog. The dog looks back at him and seems to nod. The old man turns back to Meredith and me sitting in the high grass. Listen, this dog sent me to get you two girls and take you both home. I don't know what to say to that. Part of me is a little excited at the idea of going home, but the other part of me is hesitant to get in a car with the man who takes orders from a dog. I look at Meredith. She's just as silent as me. Of course, Meredith being Meredith, she may not quite be so suspicious and more excited at the idea of a talking dog. Mr. Santa notices that neither of us are getting in his car. Look, I know it's weird, but so is two little girls sitting alone on a beach in the middle of nowhere this late in the day, and- It's not so weird, Meredith says. We fell out of a hole in the sky. Oh. He looks at his dog again. It looks back at him. The two of them seem to be communicating, but neither one of them is talking. 
Finally, he turns back to us. The dog says you can tell me all about it on the way home, but right now you really need to get in the car. The dog said all that? I ask. Yup. Just now? Yup. Meredith and I sit there a while in the grass, silently communicating with our eyes like the man and the dog seem to do. Finally, we agree, also silently. Meredith stands up and crosses her arms. I want to hear it from the dog. The dog leans across the old man's lap and opens its mouth. Get in the car. Good enough for me, I say, hopping to my feet. Meredith looks confused. Wait, what? I get in the unhappy-sounding car, climbing in the back behind the dog while Meredith gets in behind Santa. My first instinct is to pet the golden retriever, but I remember you're not supposed to pet strange dogs without letting them sniff your hand first, so I hold a hand out. The old man leans around to check on us, sees me holding out my hand, and shakes it. Name's Mortimer, he says. I would have been here sooner, but the dog isn't the best at giving directions. The dog stares at him with its dark eyes. I half expect it to defend itself, but it just sits there like a dog normally does when it's not talking, which is normally all the time. Mortimer drives off and we leave the beach behind us. I'm excited to get home and give my parents a hug. I hope they remember me. Maybe they aren't even there anymore? What if it's like that movie Flight of the Navigator and I've come back years later and my family all moved to Florida? I don't want to live in Florida. The humidity makes my already crinkly hair curl right up. Just being by the ocean has already started that. Maybe I'll get home and they won't even recognize me because my hair's curly. I wish I had a hairbrush. Maybe they put my photo on a milk carton, I say. I realize I said it aloud. Whoops. Hmm? Asks Mortimer. Nothing. I look out the window as we turn down a long road towards houses. I wonder if Snap and Pop are out there somewhere, twisting the heads off of people while trying to find us. I don't know what they were, and it scares me that they're out there in the world right now. It makes me wish I'd never ripped a hole in the veil to begin with. But it was what Nathaniel told me to do. The inside of the car smells like oranges and cough syrup. There's a Rand McNally Road Atlas on the floor. My dad always uses one when he's planning trips. I like to look at them and see how far away places are from other places. It's crazy to think that the length of your finger can be like a hundred miles. I pick up the atlas and flip to Massachusetts. Do you know where we're going? Meredith asks. Mortimer nods. This dog here gave me both your addresses. It's a bit of a hike. You girls sure are far from home. Does your dog have a name? I ask. I stuff the atlas in the back of the doggy's passenger seat. The dog looks out the windshield like it's monitoring the horizon or something. <laughs> it's, uh, it's not my dog. I'm just chauffeuring the thing. Hell, this isn't even my car. He notices us looking at him funny in the rear view. Look, when a dog runs up to you and starts talking, you don't ask questions. You just do what it says. Borrow this car from someone who will probably notice tomorrow. So let's get you home quick, okay? That sounds like something a serial killer would say, Meredith mumbles. The golden retriever leans around in its seat and looks at me with its dark eyes. It hasn't spoken since telling us to get in the car, and I'm starting to worry that we've been tricked by this Santa-looking guy. Maybe he's one of those ventriloquists who can make animals and puppets talk. I saw one once at a birthday party, and he made all the kids cry. Not me, though, because I saw scarier puppets on TV. Lily says the doggy. Doggy? I say back. Meredith watches me with her standard look of confusion. It's kind of a half look because only half of her face really works right. The other half just sort of looks sad and red and a bit saggy because she got burned long ago. Am I the only one in the car who can't hear the dog talking? My name is Jophiel, says the dog. It speaks without moving its mouth. Come to think of it, dogs don't have lips, and it speaks pretty clearly for something without lips. We met briefly in the veil. This is my totem. Oh, of course it's not the actual dog talking. Your totem is a dog? The tag around her neck, actually. The dog is the holder. 
Okay, that's a new one. The angels are recruiting dogs as well as people. That opens up all kinds of possibilities. Angel totems being held by octopuses, angel totems, snail shells. Nathaniel could have been given to a groundhog that sets forest fires. Raziel might be out there somewhere telling a monkey with a big red butt everyone's secrets. Actually, that would be pretty funny. <laughs> Why a doggy? I ask. The dog cocks her head. Her tongue hangs out like she's a happy girl. It wasn't my choice, Jophiel says. It originally was in the possession of a young man in the army, but things went wrong. Thankfully, steps were taken to get it away from him, and it's been on this canine ever since. A lot of work went into it. It's regrettable, but eventually everything will get sorted out. It always does. Angels are so optimistic. Except Dumma. I could take you off the dog, I offer, and give you to someone worthy. No, no, don't touch it. Thank you, though. Nathaniel is right there with Meredith. You wouldn't be able to control it. Believe me, the dog is the best place for it right now. Well, now I'm curious. What does your totem do? I glance at Mortimer. He seems to be listening intently, too. Every now and then, he strokes his Santa beard and side-eyes the dog. That's when you look like you're looking forward, but turn just your eyes to look sharp to the side. People usually do it when they don't want someone else knowing that they're actually looking at them. I hope he watches where he's driving. It's getting dark out and cars and me have a bad history. I... I, I can't say. Jophiel says. You're not the only one who can hear me. Mortimer snorts and looks forward again. Let's just say that in the wrong hands, it would be bad. Incredibly bad. I had to be very careful to get this ride. Mr. Leech here is slightly unstable. Which is why he can hear us, but he's harmless. Trust me, Raziel vetted him carefully. Mortimer frowns. He fiddles with the knobs on the dashboard a bit. Maybe he doesn't know where the button for the headlights are because we're driving dark. Are we safe? I ask. Jophiel is silent. The dog flops its tongue around and pants a bit. I can appreciate how it must feel. The car is getting hot. I wonder if it can hear Jophiel too. Mortimer obviously can. Now I wonder if other unstable people can hear the angels like I can. And animals. Meredith nudges me. What's it saying? I hold up a finger. Jophiel, are we safe? No. I was hoping for a better answer. Let's try yes for once. Yes, Lily, you're safe. You never have to worry again. Samuel is dead and the veil is closed and all the other nasties that were in it are stuck there and you can now grow up and be a normal adult. There's nothing to worry about anymore, except gym class because they always play dodgeball and everybody enjoys trying to take your head off with those big red balls. Things are a bit chaotic here, Lily. I can't tell you everything. What you need to know is that two fae escaped before the veil was repaired. They're called Dulahan, and they are not something you can deal with. Not you, and not Meredith. I think we saw them. The crisps snap and pop. They killed these two guys on the beach. Nathaniel told us. They were apparently just waiting patiently in the void for something like this to happen. These things are bad news. Where they go, people die. You can't stop them, not you and not Meredith. Now, there's a good chance they're not here for you. They don't answer to Samuel, so we're just going to have to pray. Do angels pray? Who do they pray to? It's gotten seriously dark out now. I peek around the front seat. The road is really hard to see. I realize Mortimer is driving with his headlights off, and that's not how you're supposed to drive at night. It seems like his eyesight isn't very good either because he keeps leaning over the steering wheel and I see him squinting in the rearview mirror. Please don't crash, Mortimer. If you do, I'm going to think I just can't get in a car without getting in an accident anymore. Mortimer tugs at his collar with a finger. I think the heat in this old jalopy is busted. I realize it's not the car that's heating up. 
Meredith has been sitting there this whole time, anxiously twisting her Barbie's head around and around, watching me talk to this dog and asking it ominous questions about whether we're safe or not. The air around her is wavy with the heat she's giving off. She's right next to this other totem and literally turning the car into an oven, slowly cooking us all. I grab her wrist and stop her twisting Nathaniel's head off. We are going to be okay, I say. She's been holding her breath, but she finally lets it out in sighs, trembling. Her mouth turns up in a half smile. We are going to be okay, she repeats. The air cools slightly. That's not what the dog just said. Mortimer remarks, glancing at us in the mirror. The air instantly goes hot again. Meredith's arm becomes too hot to touch, and I yank my hand back with a small shriek. Stupid Mortimer! No, 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 no! I wave my hands at Meredith, and she sets the oven to broil. Who's your best friend? Meredith grits her teeth and squeezes her dolly. You are! And who's just some random nut who picked you up in a stolen car with a talking dog? He is, she whispers, having to think about it. The oven dial winds down. Hey, hold up a second there, Lizzie, Mortimer says from the front seat. The car weaves into the other lane briefly. He clenches the steering wheel and steadies the car, but is clearly upset. Jophiel intervenes. Stay on the road, Mr. Leach, and be quiet. Mortimer mutters to himself. I don't need to take that from no girl or no dog. Remember our agreement, Mortimer, Jophiel says. It seems to put him at ease, and he gives me one last grumpy-looking glance in the mirror before going back to focusing on the road. We drive on in silence. There's clearly an air of discomfort now. I don't think the Santa Claus lookalike appreciated being called a nut, but I had to keep Meredith from roasting us all alive. Meredith and I hold hands in the back seat. She's only medium well done at the moment, warm to the touch and redder than usual. Kind of like she's waiting for something to happen to switch into full-on fireball mode. I'm just trying to constantly keep her calm so being near the dog doesn't blow us all up. I never thought I'd have to say anything like that. I lose track of time. I need to find my Lucky Charms watch when I get home. Out the window, I keep thinking I see dark shapes looking back at us from passing buildings. Are the Krispies hunting me? Is Pasher okay? Is he waiting for me to get home to tell me everything that's happened? After what seems like days to me, we turn onto a street I recognize. I feel my tummy doing somersaults at the thought of finally getting home after everything that's happened. There's the corner where I wait for the school bus. I wonder if I'll have to go to school tomorrow. I don't even know what day it is. I have no idea how long I've been gone. Oh God, I'm gonna barf, I'm so excited. I squeeze Meredith's hand. Hmm? She asks. This is my street, I say eagerly. It's that one on the left with the rooster-shaped mailbox, Mr. Leach. We pull up in front of my house. It's dark. All the lights are off inside. Are mom and dad asleep? I hope they're home. I don't have my house key. I think I left it in the nurse's office back at school. Jeez, that feels so long ago. Like months. What now? Mortimer asks, looking at the dark house. Stay here with Meredith, Jophiel tells him. I need to talk to Lily privately. Lily, say goodbye to Meredith, and don't worry, she'll be okay. Mortimer, pull around the corner so nobody sees you. I look at Meredith. It's been so long since I've seen her. She and I went through so much together over a year ago, and she's been gone ever since. Hey, I'm happy I got to see you again, I tell her. But next time, let's get together and play on Earth. Meredith giggles. Is there going to be a next time? We both stop smiling. There probably isn't going to be a next time. It isn't safe for us to be together. At least, not with our totems. Together, we burn down houses, set jerk girls' backpacks on fire, kill police officers, almost cook each other in cars. We don't have the best record when it comes to hanging out. I don't say it, but I hug her and I think she understands that the answer to her question is no. I hop out of the car. 
The dog paws at its doors until I let it out. Then we walk around to the front of my house. Mortimer drives off slowly like he thinks the car has a sneak mode. My dad's a heavy sleeper, Mortimer. I think you'll be okay. Mom says he can outsnore any noise. At the front door, I pet the dog finally. She likes it and sticks her nose into my hand. I want a doggy so bad. If it wouldn't be disastrous, I'd try to keep this dog, but there's no way angels would allow it. Lily, Jophiel says. What do you think of Samuel? Pfft, I nearly spit. He's evil, of course. Everyone has a purpose, you know. I can think of some people who don't really have a purpose. Lisa Welch, for example. I wonder where she is right now. Sleeping in her stupid giant bed covered with pound puppies, probably. What's his purpose? Being evil? The veil is not just another realm, he says. It's also a wall, protecting something incredibly valuable. I shrug. So what? If you build a wall to protect your most valuable item, how would you know that wall worked? You wouldn't. So you need someone to test it and make sure it's strong enough to protect what it's surrounding. Okay. I think this is an analogy. And I hate analogies. I always want to take them literally and it never makes sense when I do. Samuel resides in the veil, but he also tests the veil. He constantly tries to find ways to crack it or tear it down completely. And when he does, we simply rebuild it stronger. It's vital that he does this, even though his methods may seem evil, in order to ensure that the item it protects is safe. It sure seems like he wants out of there. I hear Jophiel sigh. <sighs> Long ago, he volunteered for this task because he was the strongest of us all. But we soon realized that he wasn't putting everything into it, because he wanted to believe the veil was perfect. It was decided by our creator that the only way to make him try everything he possibly could was to lock him in. When he realized what he had done, sure enough, his efforts to tear it down tripled. Essentially, the veil became his prison. Doesn't it matter that he's ruining other people's lives? I ask. He almost killed me, and there's a boy in there named Ambrose who's been trapped for years. Does God think we're less important than testing your stupid wall? He doesn't answer. He doesn't have to. I already know the answer. It's yes. I said earlier I wished someone would say yes rather than no. But now I want no back. Lily, there's something else you need to know. Pasher and Duma are still unaccounted for. I don't like the sound of that. What do you mean? They haven't returned from the Vale. Abaddon came back alone. He said he lost track of the others after stitching the rip shut. He doesn't know where Pasher and Duma went with Samuel, and it wasn't safe to stay alone, so he returned. Don't worry, they can't die like mortals can. That's not how things work. And as long as Duma and Pasher are together, they should be okay. They make a formidable team. It would have been better if Abaddon had stayed with them, but don't worry. Okay? Don't worry. So I'm going to be stuck here not knowing if Pasher will ever be back? The dog woofs. I pet it some more. You'll just have to have faith. I have faith. Pasher always finds his way back to me. He's done it a hundred times before. He'll do it a hundred more. Take care, Lily. It's so weird saying goodbye to a dog. But I hug it around its neck. It puts its paw up on my shoulder. I want to squeal, it's so cute, but I don't because I'm really tired and want to see my mom and hug her and go to bed and sleep for a hundred years like that guy Rip Van Winkle. Jophiel and his holder dog walk down the front steps and wait near the bushes. I try the door, but it's locked, so I ring the doorbell. I can hear it ding-donging inside. I never thought I'd feel butterflies in my stomach from the sound of my own doorbell. After a minute of nothing, I ring it again. Through the door, I see the upstairs light come on and my dad's legs in his fuzzy pajamas heading towards the stairs. I knock on the door to make sure he keeps coming. That's my cue, Jophiel says. I can't be seen here. And remember, don't tell them about any of this. 
The dog scampers off in the direction of Mortimer and Meredith in their stolen car. I watch them disappear around the corner. Something inside me makes me want to yell for them to come back. Come back, let's go on a road trip together, all four of us. Let's go somewhere the Krispies can never find us and fight crime or something. Someone fiddles with the lock on the door behind me. Don't tell them about any of this? Are you kidding me? Mom, Dad, it's me, Lily. I'm home. I've missed you. I'm not dead. I was abducted by Greek monsters and kept in a labyrinth and forced to fight my arch enemy, stupid Lisa Welch, in a knife fight. I fell through a hole in the sky and a crazy hobo with a talking dog drove me home. That's definitely not how I want to go about this. They just cart me off to the Happy Vale Sanitarium and let me roll around in a padded room until all my hair fell out. I hold my breath. The front door opens. It's... it's not my dad. It's someone else, tall and thin and familiar, a silhouette in the doorway. He's wearing my dad's pajamas, but they hang loose off of him. My heart sinks in my chest. I should have run after the dog after all. Hello there. He holds up Pasher's totem, my old doll with the black vest and pants and drawn-on tie that Nana made for me. We've been waiting for you, says Astyanax. I'm Lily Madwip, and there's a monster wearing my dad's pajamas. We wager you did not foresee our paths crossing again, little oracle, says the monster. His name is Astyanax. I remember the last time I saw him. He had just gone through a door into someone's bedroom, and then worms came out of his head, and then there was a dog. Not a dog coming out of his head, but just a dog in the room. And a shotgun. The dog didn't have the shotgun. There was a man with a shotgun. It's a long story. I barely remember most of it as it is. I'll have to write it all down in my journal before I forget everything. Why are you in my dad's pajamas? I put up my fists for a fight. They're small fists. I'm a small person. I wish I had my knife on me. Even a butter knife would be nice. He tugs the pajama pants up because he's so thin that they keep threatening to fall down. I don't want to see that. Nobody would. I really hope he's still wearing that diaper underneath. I don't think he or anyone else from Snakebutt's dungeon got to bathe regularly. Adults need to bathe like ten times more than kids do, because once you hit a certain age, you just sweat all the time and it smells like rotten eggs. My dad is going to have a fit when he sees this guy in his pajamas, especially since he's full of worms. Maybe that's all he is. Just a pile of worms in a human suit. We were freezing. He replies, like, that's it. You just show up at someone's door wearing their dad's pajamas and shrug it off because you were cold? I could understand if my dad gave him the pajamas, but my dad would never give this guy his pajamas. What did you do with my mommy and daddy? How did you even get here? It feels like he walked off on our little group of survivors just a few hours ago. Let me think. Face Tecate got in a knife fight with the school bully. Angel showed up. More Angel showed up. Everything fell apart and we fell through space, landed on a beach. Surfers got decapitated. Then a car ride home. I'm like 95% sure that the door he went through didn't lead to my house. That one had a dog and a guy with a shotgun, and we have neither a dog nor a guy with a shotgun in ours. At least I hope we don't have a guy with a shotgun. I wouldn't mind the dog, except that a Styanex tore that dog to pieces. I hope my bedroom isn't full of dog parts. We came to repay the life debt we owe to you. His mouth moves open and shut. Is it him talking or the worms inside him talking? We did not think you would survive your encounter with the Witch Queen. He pauses to spit after mentioning her. So we came to tell your potter and mother of your deeds and your fate. He glances around at the empty neighborhood. We would be curious to know what befell her. Why are you talking in plural? I ask. He turns to look at me. His jaw creaks open just a little. Is he going to do his worm trick and tear me apart? 
Please don't tear me apart. I just got home. You saw what we really are. We thought it was safe to speak as we normally do in your presence. Only Lamia knew before you. After her mother twisted us into these... These dirt eaters. Lamia stitched together this suit from bone and flesh with which to imprison and torture us. Imagine having your humanity stolen from you, then forced back upon you in a cruel jest just so they can enact more suffering upon you. We acted as one because... Would you have spared us if you'd seen us as we are? I didn't really follow everything he said. I mean, as long as you didn't ask me to carry them in my hands, I would save a bunch of worms. Worms are wiggly and gross, but they make dirt good for farming. At least that's what I'm told. They must be pretty miserable, though, because they always seem to commit suicide during rain showers, coming out to lay on the sidewalk and then shrivel up in the sun whenever the rain stops. You are more noble than most. He tugs up my dad's pajamas again. If it confuses you, we... I... can speak as you would. Your parents are tied up at the moment. They misunderstood our... my... intentions. What are your intentions? I ask. Make me freeze to death out here on my porch after saving your wormy lives? He still hasn't explained how he even got here. A Cyanax makes a sad face. I wonder how the worms are able to control the body. Do they tug on his brain like puppet strings? Is there a brain? Do they wiggle around under the skin and just give the appearance of emotions? It's too many questions and I'm still out here in the chilly night air. I'm sorry. He says, they say, whatever. Please come inside and get warm. We walk inside. My house is toasty and I've missed it more than I realize. I want to cry and hug the couch, but that'd probably come off as weird. Upstairs is my bed. I'm ready to just go collapse in it. Somewhere, my parents are tied up too. I need to hug them as well. After untying them, but maybe before untying them too. So many emotions, I don't know what to do. So I just go limp and fall to my knees in the entryway. Stianax steps toward me with concern. Are you wounded? I'm exhausted, I tell him. We will fetch a pair of your father's pajamas for you. I have my own pajamas. He nods and starts towards the stairs. No, I don't want my pajamas either. I just want my mom and dad. A Stianax comes back and stands near the kitchen door. I can smell coffee coming from inside. Normally, I don't like the smell of coffee, but smelling it now reminds me that I'm home. Inside the veil, everything smelled old and musty, like a bookstore or under Nana's bed. I hid there once, under Nana's bed, not the bookstore. You can't hide in a bookstore unless you're a book. I almost forgot what home smells like. Kind of a mix of mom's executive perfume and dad's Irish soap. And coffee, of course. My room smells like pomander. That's this thing where you take an orange and stick cloves in it and then hang it somewhere like a little pine tree in a car. I like to make pomanders, but mom said it's a waste of oranges, so I had to stop. The one in my room has been hanging there since I was six. All the cloves fell out and the orange is just this shriveled little gray lump. We are... No, I am sorry that I had to tie them up. Your mother and potter. Stianax rubs his arms nervously, a strange tick for worms to have since they don't got arms. When I told them of your battle with the Witch Queen, they accused us, me, of abducting you. Your potter threatened us. Our first instinct was survival, but that would have been a poor showing of our gratitude slaying your parents. So we tied them up. I get up and lug myself over to the couch. Sweet, soft couch. I pet its arm and hug it, and then flop down on the cushions and look at a Stianax. He seems confused. 
Shoot, I knew hugging the couch would look weird. Maybe now he's thinking hugging the furniture's a ritual in my house. So you tied up my parents, then borrowed my dad's pajamas, and... What? Waited for me to return? You thought I was dead. How did you get here? And how long have you been wearing my dad's pajamas? Time works differently in the veil. Ono told me that. At the time, I thought she meant that we could be gone for hours and it would only appear like minutes. Maybe it meant minutes in the veil would be like days out here. She never bothered to clarify. Ambrose has been in the veil for years and he seemed to think it was still whenever he came from. Astyanax seems to go limp. His jaw hangs open and there's darkness inside. His eyes stare off at nothing. I can see the worms inside him wriggling around in his throat. Maybe they're having a meeting. A worm meeting. After a minute, the wriggling stops and his eyes swivel back toward me and his mouth clamps shut briefly. Knowing your name was enough. Everything that lives and wriggles beneath the dirt is our own kin. We spoke to them and through them we found you. Your home is well known among those of us who feast on the dead. What's that supposed to mean? It took us a long time to get here. We did things that are best left unspoken. We would say that it took days to get here. And then within hours, you show up. It would seem that Clotho smiled upon us when she spun the thread that is our fates. Something feels wrong about this. I try not to give it away to the worms with my face, but I'm pretty expressive, so I think about it while studying my feet. When I first saw Astyanax, I thought he came to murder me, but he says he came to repay me for freeing him from Snakebutt's dungeon, even though when he ran out of my book club, he seemed pretty angry. He comes to my house and ties up my parents. I don't see how this counts as payback. So, I wiggle my toes in my shoes. Now that you said thank you, I guess you're going to go find a place to live? Astyanex makes a face like my mom did when I showed her I had learned how to mix her a rum and coke just by watching my Uncle George at every family gathering. There is no true place for us among men anymore. If you are here, then the Witch Queen must be gone. With her finally brought down... He turns and spits again. I wish he'd stop spitting on the floor in my house. There is no way for us to be restored. We've thought about it, and will likely shed this final prison and join our brethren under the dirt. I feel bad for him. For them. I don't know what they were or who they were before Hecate turned them into a pile of worms. What if they were another one of many like me who she just brought into the veil and used in her weird plan to... I don't even know what her plan was. Make me fight her to control the veil, only there's no way to win and Samuel was behind it all the entire time or something. It makes my head hurt just thinking about it. Well, I guess this is goodbye. Thanks for not killing my parents. He smiles. It's a little gross looking because I can see things move beneath the surface of his face as he does it. I have expect a worm to poke out of his nose and in a tiny voice like somebody sucking on a party balloon say, Adios, Lily! And then wave a tiny how with a tiny arm. That doesn't happen, though. Instead, he turns to the little table where my parents keep their car keys, opens the drawer where Dad sticks the mail he doesn't like, and pulls out Pasher. Or at least pulls out Pasher's totem. The doll that I've always known as Pasher. Only at that moment, it's just a doll, because Pasher the Angel is somewhere in the veil. At least I, I hope he is. Last time I saw him, he was fighting Samuel in the void before Meredith and I got dumped on a beach. Pasher! I almost squeal. I feel the strength return to my legs, and I hop to my feet and run over to hug him. More than a couch. More than a bed. More than my dad, but not my mom. I want to hug Pasher. But Astyanax holds him up over his head like Roger used to do. It's called keep away, and I hate it when tall people play it with me. The worm bag puts a hand on my shoulder. Like I said, I came to repay my debt to you. I hop and reach for Pasher, 
Please give me my dolly. He looks worriedly at me. Are you mad, child? We need to destroy this. I freeze and stare at him. I beg your pardon? A Cyanex examines the doll in his fancy black vest and drawn-on tie and nice slacks that my Nana made for him. He seems upset. Maybe he thought the doll was something else. This is one of the instruments of the Seraphim. He says, Your captors and tormentors. I can sense the connection between it and the other side. Like the trail of a dove carrying messages between the living and the dead. No, that's an angel's totem. Angel, yes. He doesn't seem phased by this. Another name for the same cruel beings. They toy with us like playthings. Make us fight amongst ourselves. Treat us like experiments to do their whims. The worst of them is the lord of that wretched underworld we both escaped. He means Samuel. I agree with that part. Samuel is super stinky. I hope he gets stuck in that void and never gets out. I don't care what the dog angel said about him being important to things. The veil can be his grave for all I care. The worm man grips Pasher's head in his other hand, and he twists it, apparently thinking it would rip off, but it's plastic and not fully attached to his neck, so it just squeaks and twists around. Roger once twisted his head off completely. Mom put it back on, but she's never been one for toy repair, so it's been crooked ever since. Oh! I cry. Please don't do that. His head is a sore spot. A Cyanax clutches Pasher by the torso and legs and tries to snap him in half, but his legs just bend at the sockets. He's clearly getting frustrated. Accursed thing! He hisses, then glares at me. I'm freeing you from them. Don't you understand? Nothing good ever comes to anyone who messes with Pasher. Roger threw him out a car window, and seconds later, he was tasting the metal of a truck grill in his face. My dad hid Pasher from me, and he ended up getting stuffed in a trunk and getting put in a coma. I don't know if the doll is cursed like a mummy's tomb or just weird luck, but it's happened enough that I just take it for granted now. Mr. Xanax, please. I don't want to sound like I'm threatening you, but you're going to have a real bad time if you don't give me back my dolly. His eyes bulge in their sockets and his mouth drops open. Are you threatening us? I throw my hands up in exasperation. I just said I wasn't doing that. His jaw goes real loose, and then his eyes roll up behind the lids, and the top of his head flips back. I can hear the sound like someone pouring out a giant bucket of wet spaghetti. It's the worms. Whoa, I yell. Whoa, let's not do that. Everything gets still for like half a minute. I know because I started counting my last seconds in my head. One, two, three, and I got all the way up to 32. I count kind of slow, though, because... I gotta think the word 24 over and over, and that takes time. All I can hear is the worms in his head slithering about, maybe discussing whether to leap out and rip me to pieces. Are they having a worm mutiny? Maybe not all of them were grateful I freed them. Maybe some of them think gratitude only goes so far. I don't think any of them are thinking about my warning, because the worms in his hands are straining to snap the plastic doll in half. I know the best they can hope for is pulling his arms and legs and head out, but... I can just put all that back in once he's gone. I hope that's all he does. Worm friends? I swallow the lump in my throat. That dolly is the totem of Pasher. He's, uh, the Watcher of Elizabeth. I try to remember everything Pasher said to Hecate. It all seemed very important at the time. I should have paid attention. Stewmaker of the casserole... And one of the seven potatoes. I'm pretty sure I got everything wrong there. The top of a Styanex's head flips back over with a nasty snap. His eyes roll back down and blinks at me. What does any of that mean? I have no idea, but he's very important among the angels. And that doll is his totem. He's put a, a, a curse on it. The grip on Pasher loosens, and he looks down at the toy. One of the legs of Pasher's pants has ripped at the seam. Dad's going to have to sew that back up. Uh, curse? 
I nod and move slowly towards him, holding out my hands. Anyone who tries to destroy it suffers terribly. Believe me, I've seen it happen. He looks at me, and then at the doll. Do you trust me? I ask, moving another step closer. I can almost feel the soft felt of Pasher's clothes on my fingertips. A Steinex turns toward the sliding door to the backyard. He looks out at the trees and bushes and grass like something's distracted him. After a moment, he turns back to me, his skin wriggling all over with the worms inside him. The dirt eaters that reside on your land spoke well of you. He says calmly. See? They- wait, the worms talk about me? I stop. The worms in my backyard talk about me? Like, gossipy talk? What do they say? He holds out Pasher to me. They say you are a friend to us, that you have kept them well fed. The worms said that? Oh, cripes, they are talking about all my dead pets. I can't believe the worms are happy they get to eat all my poor babies that we buried in the backyard. That's so wrong. This bizarre conversation is interrupted by the sound of shattering glass. It's the sliding door to the backyard, because something super big just got thrown through it. The big thing is like a giant sack of potatoes. It hits the ground with a wet splat and what looks like one of those tumbleweeds you see in a western movie and wildy e. coyote cartoons rolls across the floor and stops between a styanax and me. The tumbleweed has a face. I recognize it because I just got done taking a car trip with it and a talking dog. Its name was Mortimer, or as I like to think, Santa? I scream. I hear Meredith's voice from outside. Lily, run! Run and we'll peel your little friend like a grape, comes a voice. Only it's got a funny accent because it sounds like Rune and whale pale your little friend like a grape. Two dark forms step through the broken glass door. It's the Crispies, Snap and Pop. They're still wearing the wetsuits they stripped off the surfers. And one of them has Meredith under his arm like she's a piece of luggage, only she's kicking and slapping at him angrily and suitcases don't do that. They don't bite either, like she's doing to his arm while snarling like a wild animal. He doesn't seem to care in the least. People don't peel grapes! That's what I want to say, but I'm too busy staring at Mortimer's lifeless eyes. If his head were still attached to his neck, I, I, I just think he was sleepy. Instead, I just say, banana, quietly. Because you peel bananas. Who peels grapes? Maybe headless ghouls like these two do. Snap brushes his hands off on his hands. They're wet with blood. We come bearing gifts, he says. But his funny accent makes it sound like we come boring gaffs. I'm frozen in fear. Jophiel said the Crispies were too powerful for me to deal with, and now they're standing in my living room, and I don't even have Pasher to help me. Who are you? Shouts a Steinax. He's still holding Pasher, but not trying to tear the doll apart anymore. He's got it raised like some sort of weapon instead. Get out of here. Yeah, that'll... That'll drive him off. Snap looks around the living room. Noise host. He looks at me. Onokoli sends her regards. I can almost understand him. Give us the totem. A Cyanax and I look at each other. Are we having one of those moments where two people share a thought and make a plan without speaking? Because I got nothing. I'm just trying not to pee my pants. Maybe he is too. That can be a shared thought. Let's not pee our pants. They took my Barbie! Meredith shrieks. And they killed Mortimer! Yeah, I can see that. But where's Jophiel and the doggy? Did they get away? Did the Crispies grab Meredith and Mortimer before Jophiel got back to the car? I hope the dog is okay. Snap crunches across the broken glass stepping past the huge sack of potatoes that was Mortimer's body. I can hear the carpet squish wetly beneath his feet, probably with Mortimer's blood. We're going to have to get that shampooed out, or more likely Mom will just get it all recarpeted. I mean, if we don't all die. 
Someone will get it shampooed, I guess. He walks up to his Styanax. You are a fooler, he asks, jabbing a thumb my way. He grins. There's blood on his teeth. It's probably the surfer's blood. He puts his hand out. Hunted over. Steinex casts me one last look, then turns and glares at him. Over our dead bodies. Snap smirks. Far enough? Wanna see what I can do with me hand? Steinex lowers his chin. Want to see what I can do with mine? Snap reaches up to grab a Styanax by the neck. I've seen him do it before, twisting a surfer's head right off of his body so he could wear it like a hat. The head he's wearing right now, in fact, because Snap doesn't have a head of his own. He's got a hand where his head should be, but a Styanax's head doesn't twist off like he planned. Instead, the top of it flops back on the jaw like a hinge. Snap looks genuinely surprised by this. He gets three and a half words out. What the bloody f- and then a thick tentacle shoots up out of Astyanax's neck. Not a tentacle. Worms. Worms wrapped around each other so tightly they look like a muscle. They glisten in the moonlight coming from outside, reflected off the broken glass all over the floor. The worm wormicle pops straight up out of the lower half of Astyanax's head like one of those stalagmites you see in a cave. Not to be confused with stalactites, which are just stalagmites that prefer the ceiling to the floor. C for ceiling, G for ground. That's how I was taught to remember. The massive worm stalagmite arcs down at the top like a fountain of water and plunges into the top of Snap's head with a sick cracking sound. If it had been Snap's head, he'd probably be dead. But it's not, so instead the head just comes right off, sliding down the front of his wetsuit, revealing the weird blackened hand beneath it, all covered with gross stuff. Pop drops Meredith to the floor like a sack of garbage and drops to his hands and knees behind the couch, probably poised like a tiger about to pounce. A second later, he shoots across the room like a missile. A tiger missile, I guess. Minus the head he was wearing as a disguise. The hand in its place clenched up like a fat fist. He hits a Styanax like a battering ram. A Styanax flies backward and tumbles over the coat rack by the door to the entryway. His body crumbles into a pile while the worms inside him flail out of his neck like an army of angry spaghetti noodles. I can see them latching onto the crispies, wrapping around them like slimy bandages. And just when I think it couldn't get weirder, that's when the dog bounds into the room through the broken glass door. I mean, a dog coming inside isn't weird, but it feels so out of place with the head hands and the worms and all the blood that it seems kind of surreal to see it running in. It trots over to me and rubs against my leg. I... I pet it numbly. Lily, it's Jophiel. Take the collar. I stare at the two crispies writhing on the floor covered in worms that seem to be trying to squeeze them to death. They tear the little wriggling bodies by the tens or hundreds, but more just keep coming out of a Styanex. Why me? Why is it always gotta be me? He could have had Meredith take the collar. He could have had anyone take the collar. Why is it gotta be me? It's always me. It's always Lily. I hear Pasher in my head. Lily. Take the collar. He's home. It's such a relief to hear his voice. Just makes all the horrors going on across the room seem to fade away. I reach down and unhook the dog's collar. Almost immediately, everything around me looks brighter, clearer, more colorful. It's night still, but I can see in the dark as if it's the sunniest day of summer. The glass on the door glitters like diamonds. Even Mortimer, poor Mortimer, Looks less like a sack of potatoes and more like one of those paintings they have in the Museum of Fine Art in Boston. It's like he was painted with acrylics. Everything is awash in color. The worms are a beautiful pink. The red of Mortimer's blood is so vibrant it makes me want to cry. Take the others, says Pasher. My legs don't want to move, so instead I reach out with my hand and my mind. I can't see them, but I sense them. Two angels, compacted into plastic and molded into the shape of dolls. They feel me calling to them and come to me, flying across the room from their individual locations and snapping into my hands like a pair of magnets. The world is alive. I can see the nasty, shriveled hearts beating in the crispy's chests. 
I can hear the furious beating of ten thousand little worms' hearts. I feel the heartbeat of a doggy at my side, and my friend Meredith lying behind the couch. Upstairs in their bedroom, my mom and dad's hearts are beating fast, frightened by the noises from downstairs. I can even see the last rhythm of Mortimer's heart in his chest. He has already been judged. The time of judgment has come. I can hear myself speaking, but it's not me. I don't think I'm saying this. It's my voice. But I'm busy thinking about how it's not even me as I'm speaking. It feels like my hair is on fire. Maybe it is. I hope I'm not burning the whole house down. It's like I'm outside my body, watching, but I'm not. I'm trapped behind my eyes. As if in response, the piles of still-living worms squirm away from the two silently struggling Dullahan. I don't know why I remember that word now. That's what they are. Dullahan. Ugly servants of death. Snap flounders on the floor, and the hand coming out of his neck grabs the decapitated surfer's head and puts it back on, then turns and looks at me. Half its face covered in blood from the wound the worms made. Woe unto you. Chian and Donaka, I say. That's their names. I don't know their names. My voice sounds like thunder. My own heart feels like it's going to explode in my chest. It hurts. My whole body is on fire. I raise my arms. No! roars Donaka. Behold his wrath, I whisper and then the whole world goes completely silent, even as the ceiling over our heads disintegrates and the entire room is filled with a pillar of white-hot fire that floods all my senses, blinding me. I'm Lily Madwit, and you can keep this. I'm sitting at a desk, like the kind you sit at in school. Oh, I... I am at school. I don't remember going to school. Actually, I don't remember going to bed for that matter. I just remember being home and everything getting bright. Very bright. It's bright here in school, too. There's some light coming from outside pouring in like the sun exploded. What if the sun did explode? Maybe I shouldn't have just used Jophiel's gift after all. Maybe I blew up the sun and the earth is hurtling into it. Hello, Lily. It's Mr. Longbow, my elementary school principal. He's standing at the front of the classroom holding an eagle. He's got a weird obsession with eagles. His office is stuffed eagle central. None of them are real, of course, because you're not supposed to kill or stuff eagles. The ones he has in his office, though, are really realistic, though. He also has motivational posters with eagles in them saying stuff about soaring for excellence. Most motivational posters use kittens. I think kittens are easier to relate to than eagles. Kittens don't get caught in plane propellers. Hi, Mr. Longbow. He smiles. I frown. Mr. Longbow never smiles. I don't think his mouth can even curve in that direction. You know, up. And his smile doesn't look creepy, either. I was always sure if he smiled, it would look super creepy. Like there'd be another face inside his mouth. You're not Mr. Longbow, I say. I look around. The other desks are all spotless. Nobody drew or wrote their names on any of them. I feel around under my desk. There's no lumps of chewed gum that have turned to stone. Every desk in my school is chewed gum that has turned into stone on the bottoms. The school looks like mine, but it's too clean. Where am I? This isn't my school. I reach for my backpack out of instinct, but it's not there. No pasture either. He usually tells me the answers to stuff if I'm not sure what the answer is supposed to be. I look around again. A cloud drifts by outside the window. That's... Uh... I start to point at the cloud, but it disappears out of sight. Are we flying? Mr. Longbow glances out the window and chuckles. I didn't think I'd ever hear Mr. Longbow laugh, and now I'm going to have to live with the fact that I have. He takes a deep breath closes his eyes, and then turns and opens them to look at me. Lily, he says. I am the Archangel Megatron. Megatron? Megatron. 
I'm slightly disappointed. Megatron is a transforming robot who turns into a gun. On the other hand, Megatron is also evil. He steals energy from Earth. Maybe Megatron was named after this angel. Does that mean the other Transformers are named after angels? Archangel Starscream. That actually sounds possible. I don't know all the angels there are. Metatron watches me quietly. I wonder what his gift is. Maybe it's transforming into a gun like Megatron, and maybe that's where they got the idea. None of the other robots turn into guns. They have guns on them. I've never understood why Megatron turns into a gun while everybody else turns into cars and trucks and planes and dinosaurs. Of course, an angel turning into a gun would be silly. They didn't have guns back when angels were born, whenever that was. Long before guns, I'm sure. Back when they only had, like, rocks and tree branches to whack each other with. Maybe he transformed into a rock back then. Or a slingshot to throw the rock with. You're still thinking about Megatron, aren't you? He asks with amusement. Maybe, I say, then realize it's stupid to try and lie to an angel. Yes? He smiles in that pleasant way that makes me wish the real Mr. Longbow smiled more. Lily, you are currently asleep. What you are seeing is a creation of your mind, except for my voice. I am the mediator of creation. Do you know what that means? Nope. I'm like the operator on your phone if your phone was a direct line to the heavens. I'm not supposed to play with that phone. I did once when I was four, and I called a nice lady who chatted with me for an hour, even though she spoke a different language and neither of us understood the other. My mom almost had a conniption fit when she saw the telephone bill that month. Still, I can't understand, so I blink at him. In less than a minute, you're going to wake up. I'm here to give you a message. I am sorry. It's okay, I nod. I've had weird dreams before. I once dreamed I was a beaver building a dam out of logs, but then other beavers were building dams out of cement, and a wolf came along and blew my dam down because it was made out of logs, and then the wolf ate me. I didn't even wake up then. I was stuck in the wolf's tummy for several hours before I woke up. What's the message? I ask. That's the message, Lily. Says Metatron. I am sorry. I wake up. I'm lying down. I can feel a pillow behind my head. It's overly soft. It can't be one of ours. My mom only buys pillows that can knock a kid out if you whack one with them. Trust me, I know. Roger confirmed this. I don't know why my mom likes such hard, heavy pillows. The ceiling is covered in those off-white cardboard tiles with all the little pinholes in them that look like a reverse star map. Black dots on coffee-stained white. This must be a hospital. I think all hospitals buy ceiling tiles from the same ceiling tile store. There's like some guy out there churning out off-white ceiling tiles by the hundreds and making a fortune off of it. Can we talk to her? I hear my mom's voice nearby. My vision immediately goes blurry because tears get in my eyes. I've missed her voice. I've missed it so much. I sob. Yes, someone else says. Mommy? My throat hurts trying to talk. I kind of sound like a frog when I say her name. Yes, Lily. Her voice cracks. She's crying too. Can you hear me? We're here, sweetie. We were so worried. We lost you. I can hear her, but I I don't see her. I try to move my head to look, but there's something holding my neck in place. Twisting my head makes my neck scream in pain. Well, my mouth screams in pain, but it's because of the pain in my neck. There's something tickling the inside of my nose. I can see a tube thing coming up from out of it. Mommy? I cry. Daddy! I'm here! She cries back. Daddy and I are both here, Lily. It's okay, baby. I hear somebody just outside the room say, Call Dr. Montgomery. She's awake. Someone takes my hand and squeezes it. I squeeze back and clench my eyes shut, forcing out more tears. I'm not crying because it's expected of me. I'm really just so happy to have my mom back (laughs) that they come out naturally. 
Lily, it's going to be all right. I hear my dad say. I hear my dad. He sounds sad. He often sounds sad these days, ever since Roger got smashed. We love you, honey. Your mother and I. We won't leave you. Daddy? Is that his hand? Whose hand is holding mine? I can't tell. Whoever it is, they squeeze my hand again. I wish I could look at them. I can't move my head. My mom answers. You need to hold still, baby. You were hurt, but, but it's over now. What happened back at the house? The Krispies were there. And the worms. And the dog gave me Joe Field's totem. And then everything exploded in light. I remember the ceiling got vaporized over our heads. And that's it. That's all I remember. That and my dream with Metatron where he said he was sorry. The doctor is coming. Someone else says. They sound familiar, but I, I can't place it. I can't think at all. There's this high-pitched whistling in my ears that keeps cutting everything else out. We need to go for now. Can we see her again? My mom asks. Soon? We'll see what can be done. I feel the hand pull away from mine. I reach for it, trying to grab it and pull her to me and never let go. But she's gone. Something stings in my arm. I realize there's one of those needles in it connected to a plastic bag full of some sort of juice or fluid or something. It's probably medicine. They always connect people to bags of medicine in the hospital, and then they take it everywhere with them. I pull back and feel something digging into my armpit. It's uncomfortable, so I grope around with my other hand and pull it away. I recognize the hard plastic and soft felt. It's Pasher. Pasher? I mumble. I feel groggy, sleepy. So I close my eyes and wonder if I'll see Metatron again. Lily, he says softly. Have I told you how strong you are? Mm, maybe. Tell me again. You're the strongest person I've ever known. As strong as Wonder Woman? Stronger. I hug him against my chest. That's pretty strong. We lay there quietly together for a bit. I can hear a monitor or something going blip blip every now and then. And there's people walking by outside in the hallway, talking about things. I can't see any of this, though. Just those boring ceiling tiles. Finally, I ask, Pasher, what happened to you? Well, he says, and then pauses. That means he's trying to choose exactly what to tell me and what not to tell me. This bothers me because it means there's stuff he doesn't want me to know. Without going into too much detail, you will no longer have to worry about Samuel. He has been... dealt with. Dealt with? Does that mean he's dead? Can angels even die? No, if Samuel was dead, Pasher would just tell me. He doesn't avoid stuff like that. If he's not explaining what dealt with means, it probably means some sort of secret angel torture or something that I'm not supposed to know about. Maybe he's in H-E double hockey sticks. They never liked talking about that place. And the veil? I ask. Is the veil repaired? I don't want any more nasties getting out like snap and pop. The veil is whole again, Pasher says. There's a hint of sadness in his voice. Duma has taken over as regent. Unlike Samuel before him, Duma volunteered. From now on, he will be the warden of the Pantheons. Already, another angel by the name of Habib has taken his place as a watcher. Wow, that's... I can't think straight. That's a big change. This isn't the first time one's duties have been reassigned. Over the millennia, we've made many such changes, trying to find the perfect setup, building and rebuilding the design. But Duma was a powerful ally, and his presence will be missed. Okay. If you say so. I saw Duma's face. It was like Skeletor. I don't even want to see it again. And he sings weird songs. And he's bossy. 
Jeez, he's probably going to love it in the Vale, bossing people around all the time. Will you ever see him again? There's a long silence. I think there's a machine beeping somewhere, but it's so faint it sounds like a baby bird cheeping. Cheep, cheep, cheep. Yes, Hasher finally says. That's it. Just, yes. Like that's all there is to say. He doesn't need to say the rest. I understand. You'll see him again, but it'll be a long time from now. I probably won't even be around when it happens. Just a story someone tells someone else. Like one of Aesop's fables, a Lily Madwip fable. Let me tell you the story of Lily Madwip, and the moral will probably be, learn to knife fight because you never know when you're gonna need it. I'm just glad it's over, I whisper. Pasher is quiet. I hug him and go back to sleep. I dream again, only this time I see my parents. We're on a beach like the one Meredith and I landed on, except instead of being boarded by tall grass, there's nothing but huge cliffs that reach up to the sky. The sun is setting and the ocean seems to be churning slightly. Mom and Dad run up to me and we have a group hug. I'm so happy. They're warm. I don't let go. The ocean keeps getting angry and the sky darkens. The wind is howling. It sounds like a mob of angry villagers in a Frankenstein movie. Mom and Dad turn away to look at something down the beach. When they turn back to me, they look frightened. Run, Lily, my mom says, pulling me to my feet. I look past her. There are strange looking people coming down the beach. They move slowly and their arms are reaching out toward us like zombies. As they get closer, I, I realize they look strange because they seem to be made completely out of wet sand. Their clothes, their hair, their skin, it's all the same dark, crusty color. Their faces are expressionless. You can barely make out any features. We run. I don't know what these things want with us. I just know that I don't want them touching me with their wet, sandy hands. I feel like if they grab me, they'll smother me and bury me in a pile of sand people. But as hard as I try to run, we don't seem to be getting ourselves anywhere. Mom and Dad look like they're moving sluggishly. Even Mom's hair blows in the wind like it's in slow motion. The creatures get closer. They keep coming, more of them behind the others. They move normal, we move slow. They gain on us as the dusk turns into night and the ocean roars with glee. My dad is the first to be reached. A sand monster grabs his wrist and he looks back. His eyes do pinwheels in their sockets and he turns to us, mouth open as if he's about to speak, but instead nothing comes out. His body just slowly turns into the same sandy color, all features disappearing from his face save the bump of his nose and the hole of his mouth. He becomes one of them and joins them in the chase for me and Mom. I scream. Mom screams too. Don't look back, Lily. Run. You can make it. Make it where? There's nowhere to go. This stupid beach is endless. I look back despite Mom's words. She's gone. Where she was is just another monster, wearing a sand-textured business suit like she had been wearing when I saw her last. He reaches out towards me, fingers wiggling, gaping mouth hanging open, and I hear my mom screaming my name like she's five rooms away, but it's coming out of this monster. Mommy! I shout, waking myself up again. There's a blonde-haired lady's face in front of me. She's got on red lipstick, and there's a big mole on her cheek. Her hair is up in a bun. I almost shriek at the sight of her because she's so close I can feel her breath on me and my brain is still thinking about the face of my mom as a sand monster and superimposes it over this lady's. Hello, I say after a moment. I try to sink into the hospital bed, but I can't. I'm stuck this close to her. Her breath smells like winto green lifesavers. I have a nose for lifesaver flavors and this is definitely winto green. She smiles at me. Good afternoon, dear. Do you know where you are? I'm in the hospital. Please back up, Miss Nurse. You're invading my personal bubble. That's right, she says. Do you know why you're here? Do you remember anything? Well, actually, I do remember a lot of things. 
So I tell her about the power of Jophiel combined with the power of Nathaniel and Pasher and how it vaporized part of the house. But then I realize I should explain why I was using the power, so I tell her about the Crispies, Pop and Snap, and how they were probably going to kill everybody. But then I realize I should probably explain where they came from, so I explain the tear in the veil and falling out of it onto the beach. But then I realize I should explain the veil and what it is and why I was in it to begin with, so I start to explain Hecate. She listens for the whole thing, just giving me big eyes every now and then, nodding along and doing that, looking off to other things to try to hide the fact that she's slowly becoming convinced that I belong in Sunnyvale Sanitarium. Eventually, she stops me with a sharp ahem. She's not smiling anymore. She turns to someone else in the room. She might be suffering from shock, or it could be the concussion. She looks back at me and gives me a fake grin. Or you've got a wonderful imagination. Don't patronize me, lady. I've killed people. Does she need the neck brace? The other someone asks. It's a man's voice. He sounds like he smokes lots of cigarettes. He's got a raspy kind of voice like he gargles rocks or someone ran over his throat with a bicycle. We can sit her up in a wheelchair, but Dr. McDaniels wants to keep her neck in place. The nurse tells him, we need to evaluate her before removing the brace. Fine. I hold my arms up and the blonde lady helps me slowly into a sitting position. It's tough because my neck is so stiff with this thing holding it in place. There go the off-white ceiling tiles. Bye-bye, tiles. I can now see the rest of the room I'm in. It's much smaller than I thought it was. There's machines around me with lots of buttons and knobs. There's a window, too, but the curtains are drawn in and I can't see outside. A small fold-out table is in the corner and there's a man in a brown jacket sitting at it. Hello, Mr. Man in a brown jacket. His chin has one of those clefts in it and sticks out past his nose. He's got hard eyes and slightly big ears. He looks like a detective. Detective Andrew Guthrie. I know who he is because it's part of Pasher's gifts being able to tell things about other people. Nurse Smiley Blonde Lady helps me into a wheelchair. I try to push it, but can't because I'm not strong enough. I wish I had remote controls. That'd be cool. I could zoom around in my motorized wheelchair. The blonde nurse, whose name is Mary, wheels over to Detective Guthrie at the table. He's got some sort of folder and papers out, but he shuffles them and tucks them away. Nurse Mary walks out of the room, shutting the door behind her. Hello, Lillian. He starts. My name is Detective Guthrie. He stops and looks at me like he forgot how to blink. His bushy eyebrows slowly drift up like they're attached to balloons. How did you know that? He asks. I know things. Like what? So I tell him that his first name is Andrew and that he's married to Joanne who he met in college and they have a son named Bartholomew who just turned 13. And then I tell him his middle name is the same as Pasher's brother, Michael, and that he should quit smoking because he's going to die of lung cancer. As I tell him this, he just stares at me and his bushy eyebrows crawl higher and higher up his forehead. Can I see my mom and dad now? I ask when I'm done. Detective Guthrie sits there silently. These sort of things can be hard for some people to hear. He reminds me of a Styanax when the worms were about to pop up out of his head. Eventually, he shakes like he has to reboot his brain, blinks several times, and then pats the stack of papers. You are interesting, little girl, he says. Where did you pick all that up? Have you memorized the phone book? I hold up Pasher. Pasher tells me. He reaches out. May I see, Pascal? I pull Pasher back. Pasher, I correct him. And no, you may not. You wouldn't be able to hear him anyway. Only I can. Well, me and maybe two others. And his gift can only be used by someone special like me. Detective Guthrie leans forward and puts his hands on his lap. What is his gift? We see things before they happen. Really? He nods slowly. He doesn't say it like a question, more like a thought. Like fortune-telling? And what about that other one I heard you mention just a moment ago? 
jovial. What does he do? Does he burn things? No, that's Nathaniel. He pulls a pen out of his jacket, clicks it, and starts writing down on a pad. Nathaniel. Jophiel judges people. He's writing really furiously. Not angry, but fast. I look at it, but it's upside down and just looks like scribbles. I can't make heads or tails of it. He holds a finger up at me with his free hand like just a minute and keeps writing for a good five minutes. He should have held up five fingers. You said you used Jovial and Nathaniel at your home. Against the intruders. He keeps looking down at his notepad as he talks, then finally looks up. Was one of the intruders Felix Clay? Felix Clay? No, it was the Crispies, the Doolahan, and a Styanax. I haven't seen the weasel faced Mr. Felix Clay since last year when he tried to kill me. I don't mention that I did actually see him when I was in the Vale. That was an imaginary version of Felix, and it might confuse him if I bring it up. He didn't abduct you? He pauses, mouthing something to himself, and then looks up. How do you spell those? Astyanax? Doolahams? I don't know, I admit. When can I see my mom and dad? Willie? Hasher suddenly interrupts. Listen. Detective Guthrie clears his throat and adjusts his red tie. He doesn't look up from his notes. I think you'll need to talk to the doctor after we finish. Shouldn't they be here? I ask. Why is a detective questioning me without my parents present? And that's when I realized why Metatron's message was, I am sorry. That's when I realized why I could hear and feel my parents, but never saw them. I can feel it in my heart, which just skipped a beat, and in my face, which feels puffy, and my nose that feels runny. It's like my body knows what Pasher wants to tell me before my brain does. Or maybe my brain knew and it just ignored. That's why my hands are shaking before Pasher says anything. That's why the room just got darker. My mom? I ask. Detective Guthrie looks down like he's contemplating climbing into his notepad. You are so strong, Pasher says. The strongest person I've ever known. That's all he says. Because he knows I know the truth. I think he's scared to say it. After everything I've been through, all I wanted was to see my parents. My... Dad? Detective Guthrie keeps hiding his face in his papers. But I can see that it's red. He seems to be fighting with himself, with his brain, trying to decide how to say what I've already realized. But... But they, they were right there. My eyes start watering up. They were there in the house. I was home and, and they were there. I never got to see them. Please let me see them. I'm sorry, Lily. Asher whispers. Detective Guthrie reaches across the table and takes my hand. I don't pull away. The feeling reminds me of my mom's hand holding mine as I lay in the hospital bed. Why is it so hard to breathe? It's like the air is soup. I can't inhale soup. It's hurting my lungs, so I breathe harder because I think I'm going to suffocate. Lillian, your parents... Guthrie, Guthrie doesn't finish. Why? I scream. He thinks I'm screaming at him, but I'm not. I'm screaming at Pasher. I'm screaming at all the angels who told me what to do, and I did it, and they never warned me what would happen. But especially Pasher, because he knew. He had to know. Knowing what will happen is what he does. He knew this. He had to know this. Pasher doesn't answer me. Guthrie stands up and moves around the table, dropping to his knees and hugging me. I don't think he's entirely comfortable with it. In his eyes, I'm a conundrum. That means a mystery, not an actual drum. 
I know about drums. I was going to be a drummer when I grew up. Now I don't know what I'm going to be. An orphan. I'm going to be an orphan. Now and forever. I know Guthrie's trying to be comforting, but it's not working because I'm too busy visualizing everything from that night in my head. I'm sorry, he says. I'm so sorry. They were upstairs. I could have run up the stairs and seen them. I could have untied them and together we'd have climbed out the upstairs bathroom window onto the front porch roof. Yes, that's what we did. I, I, I didn't talk to a Steinax. I didn't waste time discussing angels with him. I let him destroy that stupid toy. I didn't stand there and watch the Krispies bust their way in. I just ran up and hugged my mom and dad. We hugged and I got kisses from both of them and then we escaped and none of this is happening. I'm still in the veil. This is a trick. Hecate's playing a trick on me again. This is all a trick. Detective Guthrie keeps holding me. Listen, Lillian, they're saying it's a miracle you survived. He says, We need you to help us piece together what happened. But it can wait. He touches my chin, lifting it up so I'll look him in the eyes. And his face is a big blur because I'm busy crying silently. This is a miracle, you know that? You sitting here with little more than cuts and bruises. I saw what was left of your home and whatever hit it. Look, you may think this is the end, but it's not. You're still here. By the grace of God, you are still here. It wasn't the grace of anybody. I survived because the judgment of heaven couldn't harm me. Not while I was the one wielding it. Like Nathaniel's gift of fire, you can't be harmed by... M Meredith? I squeak. Lily. Lily. Pasher finally speaks again. Meredith is with her family. She's happy. Not Meredith. Please, not Meredith. <laughs> Detective Guthrie stumbles back into his seat. I wonder if he's as awkward at hugging his son as he is at hugging little girls who lost their entire family. He fidgets with his papers in his folder, repeatedly adjusting his tie and wiping at his forehead. There we have... There were seven. He stops for a moment. Seven others found with you. Four unidentified men, your mother and father, and Meredith Lake. He flips a page. And a dog. Oh god, I killed the dog too. I'm a seven-time murderer as well as an animal killer. I just sit there and hyperventilate while my nose runs and my hands shake and my eyes dry up. I got nothing to live for anymore. My family is all dead. My friend is dead. My house is dead. Hegarty's threat came true. She's torn my world apart. All I have is passion and... I've changed my mind. <laughs> I put Pasher on the table between me and Detective Guthrie. You can have this if you want. It's broken anyway. I'm Lily Madwhip, and this is the end of the beginning. Look who it is! I'm Lily Madwhip, and I'm an orphan! Boo-hoo! Boo-hoo-hoo! That's Lisa Welch. Lisa stinking Welch. She should be in a loony bin, but apparently the angels did something to wipe her memory of being dragged into the veil. She's as unbearable as ever. Her squad of jerk girls giggle and cover their mouths like they're trying to hide the fact that they're clearly laughing. Maybe they do because they know they'll never have teeth as perfect as Lisa's and it embarrasses them to show it. I didn't know having your parents die was something to be embarrassed about, says Simone. 
She puts her hands on her hips and glares at the jerk squad. Good old Simone. Only one of the jerk girls looks ashamed of herself. Ashlyn Peppers. She can be nice sometimes. Her face turns red and she looks away from Simone and me. Belisa just snorts with her stupid button nose and smirks with her perfect mouth. Why are you even here? Lisa says at me. Shouldn't you be off in an orphanage somewhere? She looks me up and down. Nice face, by the way. I touch my cheek. There's a bit of a scar on it from when she cut me in our knife fight. Of course, she doesn't remember that or she'd probably have bragged about it to all her friends. I'm not going to bother explaining to her that I'm currently living at a center for children with no families who are entering the foster care system and it's not called an orphanage. I'm not going to bother explaining to her that I'm currently living at a center for children with no families who are entering the foster care system and it's not called an orphanage. Sometimes I want to call it an orphanage myself. It makes me wish I was living in a trash can like Oscar the Grouch. Or the rubble of my house. I wish I could live in my house. I wish a lot of things right now. Simone pats me on the back. Just ignore her, Lily. Yeah, Lily, ignore me. Lisa thumbs her nose at Simone. But you can't ignore the fact that everything dies around you. I'll bet you're cursed. Watch out, Samantha. It's Simone, says Simone. Or you'll probably be next. She's a soul-sucking witch. Lucky for you, being a redhead means you're a vampire and don't have a soul. Simone's fists clench up tight. I don't know why people keep telling her she's a vampire. Everyone knows vampires live in Pennsylvania. I shove past her and get right in Lisa's face. She flinches ever so slightly. Her red smells like peppermint. Dang it, why can't she have nasty halitosis or something? Lisa looks a little shocked by me, but she holds her ground because nobody steps up to Lisa Welch. Get out of my face, witch. That's right, Lisa. I am a witch. I'm standing so close I can feel the heat coming off her. She's like a mini bake oven. I always wanted one of those. Mom was afraid I'd burn the house down somehow. Instead, I blew up the house. How ironic. Lily Madwitch, I can see the future. You're nuts is what you are. She starts to turn to get the approval of her jerk squad, but seems to realize I'm right up in her face and becomes afraid I'm going to punch her so she doesn't look away. Simone grabs my shoulder. Lily? I shrug it off. I see your future, Lisa. Do you want to know what's in store for you? Do you? One day, when you're older than you are now, but not any nicer or smarter, you're going to pick on the wrong person. You're going to push the wrong button. You're going to stick your dainty little hand with its pretty fingernails in the wrong tiger's mouth. And that tiger, or someone who loves it, is going to hunt you down and cut you into tiny pieces and scatter them in the forest for all the hungry animals to eat. But they'll all get tummy aches because everything about you is toxic, right down to your bones. And the best part is that nobody, not even any of your jerk squad, will shed a tear or say it was tragic and that you didn't deserve it. Because you did, Lisa. You've been deserving it for years. And when that time comes, the only people who will miss you will be your stupid rotten family. With that said, I shove Lisa Welch with both hands. She's totally not expecting it. Nobody is. Lisa's still trying to comprehend what I said at her and is kind of in a stupor. I get to watch her eyes go wide and her mouth flop open as she topples backward. It's super satisfying. She goes right down on her butt with a heavy thump and just sits there in the dirt for several seconds, looking like she just learned that hell exists, and there's a spot picked out with her name on it. Everyone else on the playground goes silent. A lone kickball bounces away. I kneel down next to Lisa. She slowly turns her head like a robot and stares at me in disbelief. You know what happens to someone like you after they die? I say quietly so only she can hear it. There's no clouds or angels or pearly gates or harp music. 
No lava and pitchforks and demons. They just lay there. Just years in a rotting corpse feeling their body melt around them. In your case, you'll get to experience being digested by raccoons and bears and coyotes. Nothing but the darkness and heat of slowly making your way through their guts until you come out their butt just a sad little poop. I stand up and look down at her. Kind of like you are now. Lisa gasps. I don't think her brain is wired to respond to something like that. Usually she's the one giving it out, not receiving it. What's going on here? Vice Principal Davis shoves past the crowd and had gathered around us. I hadn't even noticed everybody on the playground was slowly forming a circle with me and Lisa Welch in the middle. Grade school fight club. He sees Lisa on the ground and me standing over her. His eyes start darting back and forth between us. I think he was expecting to find our roles reversed with me on the ground and Lisa standing over me, and finding that it's the opposite has thrown his brain into some sort of error loop. Nobody in this school has a fully functioning brain. That's what I've learned. Everyone here is stupid. Lisa, are you alright? Mr. Davis finally asks. Lisa glances at me. I bug my eyes out at her and send her death threats with my thoughts. She turns red and quickly looks away. I... fell. Mr. Davis stares at her on the ground for a moment and then directs his attention to me. Lily, is that what happened? I shrug. I don't know. I just got here and found her on her butt. Behind him, I see Simone look down at her feet and slip backward into the crowd of kids like an orange-haired ninja. Except a ninja would be easy to spot in a crowd of elementary schoolers. I catch up with Simone later, after Mr. Davis has wandered back to staring at the trees and wishing he was a lumberjack and Lisa has gotten up off of her butt and all her jerk girlfriends have touched her like pilgrims touching a waffle that looks like Jesus. Simone is sitting on a swing and spinning in a little circle. She doesn't look at me, she just speaks. What was that? She asks as I approach. You've never pushed anyone before. It was Lisa, I say. She deserved a good push. Do you need a push? Simone looks up. She looks... scared? Is she afraid of me? Are you threatening me? She asks. What? No. I make a pushing motion with my hands. I meant to push. On the swings. I really did mean that. Didn't I? I don't know anymore. I don't think I want to push Simone. She's my second best friend after Jamal. I haven't seen Jamal in weeks. And I might never see him again. That makes me sad. I realize I'm still making little push gestures with my hands, so I stop and let my arms flop down. I don't need a push. Simone swings a bit to show she's capable of swinging herself. She keeps looking at me like she's afraid to look away because I might do something. I'm sorry about what happened to you, getting kidnapped and... She pauses because she doesn't want to bring up my parents getting... murdered. Nobody wants to mention it around me. They all think my parents were killed in a bungled ransom. But the kidnappers blew up our house with all of us in it, and only I survived by sheer luck. <laughs> Everyone except Detective Guthrie. He keeps coming by the center where I'm staying since I've got no family and no home. He asks me the same questions, and I keep giving him the same answers. I don't lie to him. I tell him everything that happens. He's just struggling to understand it. It's hard to accept the things that happen to me when you don't believe most of them are possible. After school, I don't take the bus back to the center. Instead, I hike over to the library. Sean the Librarian is there organizing books. The real Sean the Librarian, not the imaginary Sean the Librarian that was in the veil. This one doesn't talk to me as much. I didn't even notice when I was in the veil how talkative Sean the Librarian was. That should have clued me in that something was off. I was kind of distracted at the time. I spend an hour hunting for books on magic and spells. There don't seem to be any, though. 
At least, not any about real magic. It's just stuff about doing card tricks and how to make a ball disappear. Stage magic. Stage magic doesn't bring the dead back. Stage magic doesn't let you fix the past. Once upon a time, I could have maybe made a deal with Samuel. He offered to let me fix the past before, but I didn't take it. I'd like to take it now, but he's not working the veil anymore. Now they have Duma there. Can I help you find something? Sean the Librarian approaches me. I know you. Lily Maddox, right? My name is Lily Madwhip, I snap. And I'm just browsing, thanks. He goes away. Sean the Librarian watches me go. I nod to him and keep my jacket zipped up tight so he doesn't notice the book I'm taking with me. I don't have a library card. I used to, but it probably got burned up with the holy fire like the rest of my house. It's a long trek back to the center. Lily, where have you been? We were about to call the police. Again. That's Miss Steinbrenner. She's one of the people in charge here at the Center for Kids Without Families. There's actually a long name for it since they don't like the term orphanage, but I just call it the center, so they don't get on my case about it. It was Miss Steinbrenner who arranged for me to finish out my year at school rather than go to a different school closer to the center. She thought being around friends and teachers I knew would help me cope. She doesn't know that I don't have any friends except Simone and Jamal, or that Lisa Welch tried to kill me in a knife fight. That might change her perspective on the idea. Sorry, Miss Steinbrenner, I say. I had to go to the library after school to do research for a report. She looks at me like she doesn't believe me. Probably because she doesn't. My teachers tell her everything they assign me so she can be sure I'm keeping up. I lie to her even though I know she knows the truth, because I just don't care, and I don't want to tell her I was researching dark magic. Why do you lie to me, Lily? She asks in a voice like she wants to be my friend. But I know she doesn't. I'm just another kid in the system for her to deal with. She doesn't care about me more or less than any of the others, like Henry, whose dad killed his mom and went to jail, or Heather, who never knew her mom because she died in childbirth, and her dad died of a stroke because he didn't take care of his blood pressure. To her, I'm just Lily, whose parents died in an explosion. Lily, who sits in her room and doesn't play dominoes or pop -a -matic trouble or Monopoly because Monopoly sucks. Yeah, I said it. I shrug. Can I go to my room? She nods. I go up to my room, toss my backpack on the floor, and stand in front of the closet, holding my breath. I close my eyes, turn the knob, open the door, and then my eyes. It's just a closet. There's about three sets of clothes hanging on hangers, and some art stuff propped up against the wall from when I tried to paint but gave up. I just can't paint still lifes anymore. Everything is a still life. If you blink fast enough, life becomes a flipbook. I shut the door and count to ten, then open it again. It's still a closet. It's not going to change, says Pasher. Go away. I look to see where he is. They put him on my bed right on my pillow. I've thrown him out about twelve times, but he keeps coming back to me. Pasher always comes back to me. She's not there, Lily. Who? You know who. Your mother. I flinch. I don't know what you're talking about. Lily, please. He almost sounds like he means it. You know you can't lie to me. The veil is sealed as it should have always been. Well, why wasn't it? I ask angrily. Why did you allow it to be open so this could happen? Because we are not perfect either. Samuel used his pawns from other pantheons to chip away for centuries. 
We knew he was working as he was supposed to, to test the veil's strength. But we had no idea the extent of the damage he had done to it because we couldn't see what they were doing. I once thought the sound of Pasher's voice was soothing. But now it's like dragging your fingernails down a chalkboard. I don't want to hear it. There's a pause. I'm waiting for him to say it. Those words he always says. I'm sorry, Lily. There they are. Go away. I can't. I turn on him. Yes, you can. You can go be someone else's angel. That's even what you are, because I'm pretty sure angels aren't supposed to ruin people's lives. Pasher sighs. I know it seems cruel, but there's a purpose for all things, even this. I promise you, your life isn't ruined, Lily. There's a plan. Even I don't entirely know what it is. I'm only doing what I was created for. Well, then what makes you any different from Samuel's goons? He pauses. It takes him a long time to answer. But he finally does. Faith. Well, I don't have that anymore. I turn back to the closet and shut the door. I count to ten. One, two, to hell with it. Ten. I open the closet and it's still a closet. Even if you could get back to the veil, what you have wouldn't be her, Lily. Why don't you just shut up? I can feel the tears starting to come. I wipe them away on my sleeve. You knew this would happen and you let it. And they're not even in heaven, are they? I can't die and see them because they're lying there in their bodies in the ground in coffins right next to Roger, just rotting away and waiting, and you put them there. Roger's not. I said shut up! Someone knocks at my door. Is everything okay, Lily? It's Miss Steinbrenner. I'm fine, Miss Steinbrenner. I calm myself by grabbing a bunch of my hair with both hands and pulling hard on it. I'm just having a fight with the other dozen personalities in my head about whether or not to burn this building down like I did my house. Sweetie, do you want me to call Dr. Mark? She asks. Dr. Mark is the center's psychiatrist. He likes to make me look at smudgy pictures and tell him what they look like. He keeps saying that I'm suffering from some sort of post-trauma sickness that's making me angry and violent. He doesn't understand. I'm not angry and violent. I just want to make things right. I need to fix things. I need to see my mommy. I didn't even get to see her at the funeral because they kept the casket shut. There were lots of her work colleagues there, and they all came over and introduced themselves and told me how sorry they were and how strong a little girl I was. I didn't need any more people telling me I was strong, so I left and stood outside and cried instead. Pasher said even strong people cry. God, he's annoying. Don't call Dr. Mark. I'll be quiet. Talking to Dr. Mark is like a weird sort of punishment. Be good, or we'll make you look at smudge pictures and talk about your feelings with this kind of creepy guy whose mustache is too long and curls up at the ends and makes him look like a cartoon villain who ties ladies to train tracks. Be good, or we'll tie you to the train tracks. I wish someone would tie me to the train tracks and a train would run straight over me. Toot toot. Lily? Pasher starts talking. I grit my teeth. I know what you have there in your jacket. Don't do this. If I do anything, it's all part of the plan, isn't that right, Pasher? <sighs> Look. He sighs again. I know there is nothing I can say that will make you feel better, and you wish we'd never bonded, so I will be quiet. But I'll always be here for you, as I've always tried to be. When you need me, and you will need me if you do this, I'm here. Right here. I don't need you, I hiss quietly, so good riddance. He doesn't say anything. In fact, my brain feels like there was a noise, a kind of static like on the radio that was always happening in it. It's gone suddenly quiet. 
I can hear myself think better. I was so used to the static being there that I didn't know what it was like without it. And now it's gone and the room is eerily silent. I climb on my bed and toss Pasher back behind the headboard. He slides down between the bed and the wall, disappearing out of sight. And now you're not here. You're down there. <laughs> I smile at my own joke. I reach into my jacket and pull out the book I found at the library. It looks very old. The cover is a blank red slate color with some weird symbols around the border. It was almost like the book called to me when I was at the library. I'd been digging through a stupid one about a magician by the name of Blackstone when I heard something softly singing. I say something, not someone, because it almost sounded more like an animal's voice than a human's. I got up and followed it to see if maybe a chipmunk had gotten into the library and gotten trapped or something. Imagine that, a singing chipmunk. It could be the next David Seville. But instead of finding the next big musical act, I found myself in the dead end of the dark aisle of a library with nothing. No more singing. No Alvin, no Simon, no Theodore. Just as I was heading back to my table, this book fell out of the shelves in front of me and landed at my feet. I stroke the cover, feeling the markings under my fingers. The title of the book is hard to pronounce, but I try my best. Clavicle Salamis Regis. I open it and start to read. Hey there, kids, and happy Halloween. It's me, Mr. Creepypasta, and I wanted to tell you thank you so much for watching tonight's video. Or listening to tonight's episode, This October Fest, on the podcast. If you're not listening on the podcast, then you always can listen on the podcast at Spotify or just about anywhere you find a podcast. And if you're not listening on YouTube, then you can find it on YouTube or just about anywhere you find a YouTube. If any of you guys are interested in some of the audiobooks or actual books that have horror stories in them that I've worked on, you can always check out that description down below. In there, there's a couple of different links to some horror books and horror audiobooks and new things like hopefully there'll be a Tales from the Gas Station Volume 3 link down there in the next few days, which I'm referring to right now, because if you look and it's out, it'll be there. <laughs> also, I wanted to say thank you, all of you who are supporting me on Patreon. It's patreon.com slash Mr. Creepypasta. If you ever want to help support the show, keep the lights on, feed my cats and the like, you can always head over to patreon.com slash Mr. Creepypasta, and you can support the show there. Even $1 is greatly appreciated. And I have a very special thank you to these guys, such as Jordan Alexander Sanchez, Mr. Thud, Ken Lando Higuchi, Chumpinski, Nico Kayo, Tristan Pelton, Stephen Van Hus, Chance Burnett, Deanna Krauss, G. Weevil 3, The Red Oak Shield Virus, Corey Kenshin, Pothead Holmes, Rival 1, Jimbo the Hutt, Caspian, Jordan Nels, The Village Witch, Hades Nephew, Jordan Wayne Deckart, Bradley Lipe, Ann Charan, Acid System, Mike Bullock, Fooly Cooly Dude, Prozac and Pancake Appreciation, Brian Arse, Cryptic Nightmares, Shadow Morningstar, Brianna Wright, Someone You Love, Said the King 56, Bad Honey, S Man, Kiri the Sloth, Thomas Burgett, Liam Newman, Sky Harbor, Caleb Dougal, Last Blade Song, Rafael Rodriguez, The Ginger Bros, and Aaron Stormcrow. And another thank you to all you guys who are in the description down below. Thank you guys so much for watching. Thank you all for listening. And I hope you all have a wonderfully happy. Halloween. Sweet dreams.